If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 1. Peaceful New Life this ceiling is not my home. The silhouette of a man slowly sat upwards. Where am I? He looked around and all he saw is blank space. Am I dreaming or something? He pinched himself, but he didn't feel anything. You aren't. An omnipresent voice resounded and he snapped his neck at every direction. Who? He got startled. Do not be afraid. Something materialized in front of him. And it was a biblically accurate angel. A mass of eyes that had white wings that looked ethereal. W what the fuck? He was starting to freak out. The eyeballs were like gears on a clock. And they moved eerily. Lars Johansson, your time on earth was up. The terrifying construct in front of him informed him. I. I died? Wait, let me remember. He closed his eyes in focus, trying to recall what happened. Late in the night, screeching brakes, an animal that suddenly jumped on the road. Damn. I got killed by a fucking deer? Is it because I was on the way to eat a Michelin star dish made of venison? Lars got depressed. A renowned critic of nourishment. You humans have eccentric jobs. The angel seemed to be weirded out by him. You can't call me eccentric, floating eyes. Wait, it kinda looks like that cow eyeball in porridge. It was surprisingly tasty. Lars reminisced. Ha, ka ha ha ha. At first, you were terrified. But now, you even think of us as food. Humans are quite amazing. The angel seemed to talk to itself rather than him. Uh huh, so you can read minds? Sorry, I just remembered that porridge in Southeast Asia. Lars scratched his head sheepishly. Hmm. A human with such passion about nourishment. Yet you do not succumb to a deadly sin. The angel's eyes stared at him. He was reasonably fit and for someone that eats for a living he was in good shape. Unlike some certain people that have a terrible relationship with food. Uh, -huh, thanks. Lars didn't know what's next and he just stared at the scary eyes that was floating. Wait here. I will report this to the Lord. The angel disappeared. As a messenger of God, the angel was supposed to bring him towards the golden gates of heaven. The angel then viewed his life like a book. A passionate man, living and enjoying life without regrets used his influence and popularity in the mortal world to establish soup kitchens all over the world in an effort to stop hunger. Even with refined tastes, did not squander food. Thinking that starving people are all over the world. Traveling all over the realm to satisfy his hunger for good sustenance. And still had the time for a good deed for those in need. The angel reported to God. Give him a shot at another life, it was cut short. He was a positive influence in the world. God shoot away the angel. By your will. The angel returned to Lars and he almost had a heart attack. I can't get used to this angel. A floating mass of eyeballs is quite something. Rejoice, young man. The Lord has decreed that you can enjoy life once more. The angel's omnipresent voice resounded. Oh, woo. He was confused. Thinking of heaven and hell. It is something that actually made him anxious. Another chance. Lars blinked in surprise the turn of events were too shocking for the mortal. Though, isn't this kind of thing popular nowadays in stories and mangas? He read them from time to time. Especially the popular ones when he was a child. Toriko actually gave him the motivation to be a food critic. Umu, pick your choice. Let your soul rest, or go and live life once again. The angel explained patiently. Wait a minute. Do I go back to earth or something? Lars thought that there were still many things to be tasted. Not necessarily. Your soul has already been taken out of the cycle of reincarnation. The angel blinked. Ah. Uh, a parallel universe? Like in DC and Marvel? Sweet. Then there must be all kinds of ingredients right? Lars got excited. It's as you say. There are many worlds out there. Fiction can turn into reality. The angel informed him. Lars felt that something big was at play here. But he can't really comprehend it. He was just a normal mortal. Okay. I have decided, please give me another chance. Lars nodded with a smile. A parallel world, different kinds of ingredients, tastes, scents. How exciting. Lars felt like he will be an explorer of a frontier. Umu, the Lord has also given you another boon for your good deeds. No good deed goes unrewarded. The angel started glowing. 
like it was about to give him a reward in those games. Can I think it over for a moment? Lars asked and the angel blinked in affirmation. After thinking about it. He always did fancy RPGs. And what better way to progress in his adventure than to eat food and grow? Can I like have skills, stats and stuff after eating something? I want to make the ultimate full course meal and see what happens. Lars thought about the food in Toriko. I see, a world of fantasy where you can go on an adventure. It shall be done. The angel glowed. Lars felt like something was added into his very essence. But he will have to wait until he could check it out. Go on child enjoy your new life. Beware though, adventures are inherently dangerous. With that, I will give you something to save your life in case you are in danger. The angel glowed again. A ball of light went towards him and entered his chest. Wait, what is it? Lars didn't know what it was. Just like his new boon. You will see it in your so-called inventory. It's an extra from the Lord in order for you to store your ingredients. Farewell, child. The angel twirled. Its ethereal wings grew brighter and brighter. Then, he lost consciousness. Underscore underscore a whole new world underscore underscore. Lars slowly opened his eyes. He groaned, feeling his body ache. Ow, I feel like I was hit by a truck. Ah oh, yeah, I was. Lars remembered that he swerved right to the other lane where a truck was waiting for his car. Clenching his hands, he immediately felt something wrong. M my hands are smaller. Lars patted all over his body. And he can only come to a single conclusion. He was most likely a school-age child. Why though? Ugh, I guess you can't get everything. Lars groaned and he looked around. Whoa, this place is quite interesting. Lars saw that the area was a forest. This is the part where I explore and get to a town right. Lars was cooking up a plan of action. But the place was completely foreign to him. The trees are large. Too large, there's nothing like it on earth. Lars looked at the trees. The largest one on earth is about a hundred meters tall. While the one he was looking at is easily three hundred meters in height. Not to mention that it was a girthy boi. Wait, are there monsters around here? Wolves or something? That's a cliché in stories right? Lars quickly decided to find shelter. It was a no-brainer in a forest. And he quickly found an elevated tree. Right under, it was a pretty decent-sized cave that was covered by thick roots. I guess this will work for now. He then remembered the inventory that the angel told him. Uh, should I just think about it? Lars concentrated and he suddenly received a mental inventory. There was a few items in there and he didn't see a limit to the space of it. Wow, thank you very much for this. Lars nodded in satisfaction at his hammer space. Let's see, a knife, some rope, and a stainless steel bottle. Eh, good enough. He remembered the times in his Boy Scout days. A knife and some rope can go a long way. He even had a water bottle. But what's this? Lars checked the little vial. It was intricate and there's a red liquid in it. It was fortunately labeled too. Elixir? Wow. I guess I can use this for an emergency. Lars stored it back in and he roamed around again. He started foraging for some food, and he found a bush that had some berries on it. Though they were a bit weird. It was orange, not like Cape Gooseberries orange. Bright orange, looking like a neon sign. Uh, -huh, I guess I have to check if it's poisonous. Lars channeled his inner Boy Scout and picked one of them. He then rubbed some a bit on his skin, checking if he would itch or feel different. Smelling it. The berry had an interesting mix of orange and strawberries. This is a new world all right. This thing is basically a mix between an orange and a strawberry. Lars chuckled. After a few minutes, he didn't really feel different. So he grabbed a bunch of them and stored it in his inventory. He then took one and ate it, deciding to wait if it would upset his stomach. While waiting, he thought of better things to do. So he roamed around to find a water source. Straining his ears. Lars wanted to hear a stream. A lush forest like the one he is in is bound to have a huge water source. The trees and shrubbery won't grow otherwise. And after an hour, he heard it. That's a river for sure. But I need to make sure that nothing dangerous is drinking there. He hid behind a bush and scoped out the area. After a few minutes, he deemed the coast clear. I guess that berry isn't poisonous too. He didn't feel much different. And if he did he found a good water source. So he can throw up and try to get rid of the contents of his stomach. 
picking on the berries, he gathered some water as well. But something did enter his mind. What am I going to do now? Lars was stumped. He was in the middle of nowhere. Hmm, should I make a log cabin here? Make a nice little house like those videos on YouTube. He smiled at the thought. This place is so serene, surrounded by nature. I guess it will be quite fun to live here for a bit. Lars decided. After gathering some water that wasn't stagnant. He returned to his base from earlier. I should probably find some soil where I can plant some things. Lars checked the sun above him. It was still noon. He had plenty of food and water. There was also a place where he can return to. So he checked out the huge forest and gathered as many things as possible. Wood, sticks, stones. He had an inventory anyways. I'm like a real explorer. Is this how people in the past felt when they saw new flora? Lars sighed. There were a myriad of plants around. It was like a damned rainbow there. He didn't even want to try to eat the thing he has in his hands right now. It looked like lettuce. Which is fine, but it was frickaing violet. And not like radicchio either that has a peculiar color. It just looked like it was a poisonous plant that you see in fantasy or something. My ancestors had to put things in their mouths to pave a path for the future generations. Some lettuce won't defeat me. Lars stared at the vegetable. Be besides. I have that elixir right. Lars gulped audibly as his hands trembled. He already checked with the skin test. It wasn't reacting to his body. But that's just a simple test, it doesn't mean anything conclusive. Wait. Won't my skill give me some kind of resistance to poison if this was poisonous? Lars theorized. It was a stupid theory to test without safety nets. But it's the only thing he's got. The elixir is too valuable too, it can't be used because he was just poisoned for being an idiot. So he devised a plan. I'll just throw up if it gives me a weird feeling. Then maybe a little sip of the elixir will cure me. Fortune favors the bold. He started eating the weird ass lettuce. And when he bit into it, he was shocked. This is really crunchy and crisp. It has a natural sweetness to it too, not bitter at all. He started munching on it like a rabbit. But he was still vigilant, it looked evil after all. But after waiting for an hour, nothing happened. I guess this is safe? Maybe. But nothing will happen if I don't try them all. He looked at his inventory. There was a blue pear that he found. Some glowing cherries. A star-shaped fruit that has blue flesh. It was surreal, and there were many more. Ugh, I guess I gotta try them all. Lars spent the whole day trying all different kinds of vegetables and fruits. Some were similar to those that he know, but others are just plainly out of this world. Seeing as the light above him was dying down, he decided to make a fire in his base. I guess it's a pretty good haul. I'll go continue tomorrow. Lars smiled, satisfied with his findings. Though there is something weird here, there's no animals. Lars got suspicious. But he had no evidence besides not seeing any small animals or rodents. And there were no birds around. Even though the place is a gigantic forest with all kinds of flora. I guess that's a thought for later. Lars lied down on his bed of moss and started sleeping. Underscore underscore next day underscore underscore. Lars slowly opened his eyes. He wasn't exactly a morning person. But he could wake up without difficulties in the morning. The fire he lit was just smoldering embers now and Lars could see the sunlight shine through the roots. Another day I guess. He stretched, dusting his clothes off of the moss. He then started his plan of making a farm. Lars smiled as he found a good plot of land nearby the river yesterday. The soil looked suitable for crops and a water source was nearby. So he made his way towards the place and started tilling. With a makeshift hoe, he cut some wood to make a crude one. Binding it together with a stick using some rope. And mom used to say that being a boy scout is a waste of time. Lars chuckled as he started making his farm. Ah! Uh -huh. He noticed something weird. He was sure of it, his body wasn't that strong yesterday. Is this perhaps my skill? What is it anyways? Lars clicked his tongue. Shouldn't that angel at least tell me what's the specifics of my skill? Or its name? Lars grumbled. The name of skills can tell a lot about it after all. And he already has an inventory, why not add a status board or something? But he has a job to do. And that was to till the land for his crops. Phew, that was kinda satisfying. Lars looked at the roughly ploughed soil. But it was enough, 
plants aren't made of glass. He started planting some square-shaped tomatoes. They grew fast and were delicious to boot. Weird, potatoes are exactly the same as in my world. I guess the quintessential survival food has to be. Lars shrugged as he planted potatoes. After planting, he watered them and made a, a crude axe. Finding some logs, he started bashing them with his stone axe. Huffing, he was certainly having a workout as he wiped his sweat. Minecraft Steve makes this look too easy, damn. Lars kept on collecting logs. To rest a bit after hitting trees with a blunt axe. He foraged for some clay. It was pretty easy to find, and the noticeable color of clay was clear to see. He gathered clay and Lars thought of making a foundation for his cabin. I should probably build this near to my farm. Lars was thankful that he has an inventory. Hauling logs and clay with his bare hands when he's in a young body will be pure torture. Lars continued with his work until he got exhausted. Ah, that hits the spot. He drank some cold water from his flask and the temperature didn't really change. This isn't a flask that maintains temperature. So it stops time inside, cool. Lars thought that was convenient. Alone with his thought, he remembered something suspicious. Why are there no living things here besides myself? Now that he was resting, he thought about it. Should I roam around to investigate? No. That's a decision that gets people killed. I should try climbing a tree to see where I am in the forest. Lars looked at a large tree. It was so tall it was unreal. I guess I need some equipment before I can climb that. He frowned. Ha, huh, better not do it. I don't want to go splat. Lars sighed and he stretched his muscles. I guess I should get more logs. Ugh, this is going to suck. He groaned. Underscore underscore next day underscore underscore. Lars woke up in the morning once again and dusted the moss off of himself. Hmm, I don't feel sore. I also feel a bit stronger again. He clenched his hands. He stood up and started sharpening his stone axe the old-fashioned way. Grinding it against another rock. Let's get this over with. He cracked his knuckles as he started gathering logs once again. Going to the location of his log cabin, he saw something incredible. What? My farm. It looks like it's just wild plants growing. Lars observed his farm he made. The plants he planted were done growing and they were already bearing fruit and veggies. And the soil returned to how it looked like before. It was weird and amazing. Is this the infinite food glitch? Lars decided to till it again after harvesting his crops. He then planted another set of plants, experimenting. If this grows again, then I won't need to forage much. He smiled. This kind of thing would be amazing back on Earth. Lars got pensive. There are many people starving after all. And now that he has an infinite food glitch, he began eating more of his food stores. Weird. I didn't notice this, but I don't get full. Like at all. Lars looked at his stomach. He could get hungry, but he never felt full. Even though he ate a lot of his stockpile of food. And based on his body, he should be bloated right now. Is this the effect of my skill? I am getting stronger too. He looked at the weird food he was getting. Maybe they're magical in nature. Lars concentrated and he made a pose. Fireball. He shouted while pointing at a rock. But nothing happened. He then looked around. Phew, good thing no one saw that. Lars was deluded that he could use magic. But nothing happened and he didn't feel some sort of energy. Shrugging, he continued gathering logs and clay to make a house. Underscore underscore after some time underscore underscore. Lars hummed as he looked at his new log cabin. He formed clay and made a pane with it. After drying it in the sun, he stored it inside his inventory. Abusing his inventory, he took the roof and put it above his cabin. This inventory is amazing. It's a godsend, I didn't even need to make tiles or something. He was pleased with his new house. New house, new life I guess. With a smile, he entered it and looked around. Needs some furniture. But I only have a knife. There's no mines here to extract iron from. Lars rubbed his chin. I guess I can live a pretty primitive life for now. He didn't mind having a boring time. For now that is. He just continued expanding his farm for a bit and Lars also made simple things by using wood. A pickaxe, a hoe, a shovel, and an axe made of stone. He felt like he was stuck in the Stone Age. I wish it was as easy to mine metal like in Minecraft. He sighed. He then got into a comfortable routine. 
tend to his farm and gather as many crops as possible. And the most important thing. He ate everything that he could get his hands on. After some testing, he got a bit stronger after eating his crops. I'm like as strong as an average young adult. But the increases have slowed down greatly. Lars lifted up a decent-sized log instead of rolling it. And his body didn't seem to change much. Except he is getting stronger. Lars also started exploring the place and he still haven't seen a single soul or animal in the area. The place was huge, there was nothing for miles. And when he climbed a tree that is a reasonable height, he could only see forest and plains for miles. Ha, huh, I guess I should probably slowly explore this place. Lars was a bit worried that he is really far away from civilization. So Lars explored. Farmed more fruits, plants, and vegetables as much as he could. He just continued his routine and started making a plant encyclopedia. Sorting his inventory, Lars named the plants he foraged to fight off his boredom. Hmm? My hair is black. He hasn't checked his appearance yet. But his hair was supposed to be dark blonde. So he went to the river and looked at his face. His eyes were gold and the tips of his hair had brown highlights. Wow, I look pretty good. He rubbed his chin and he smiled. But I won't really get girls with this face. Because there aren't any people here. Lars sighed. While he was checking himself out, an earthquake suddenly shook the place. And it was extremely violent. What the hell? This is like a magnitude 7 earthquake. Lars quickly crouched down as the ground trembled. After a few minutes, it was over. But he frowned heavily. My house. He ran towards the direction of his home immediately. And when he got there, it was a mess. The foundation was just made out of clay and wood. So it gave in and his cabin collapsed. Ah oh man, now I have to go back to that tree. If it's still safe that is. He clicked his tongue. Lars started to make repairs to his cabin and he was annoyed as hell. What the hell is happening anyways? A sudden earthquake? Am I under a fault line? Lars sighed while repairing his hard-earned house. After some basic repairs, he suddenly saw something from above. What? Is that? He squinted his eyes. It wasn't big, but it's falling. And when it was really near, he noticed that it was a person. The terminal velocity of humans falling is approximately 56 meters per second, 125 miles per hour. So he didn't have much time to react. The person dropped down onto his house in just a couple of seconds. My house. His wails was heard for hundreds of meters away as he kneeled down in defeat. Chapter 2 is it wrong to heal neurotic girls in a dungeon? After his house got truly done in. Lars sobered up when he realized that a fucking person just fell from the sky. Running inside, he coughed as dust dominated inside. Expecting a splattered human, he winced and had a grim expression on his face. But what he saw when the dust settles was a grey-haired woman. Pick. Hello? Hey, hey, are you okay? I never thought that I'll say that crap that you learn from CPR classes. Lars tapped her face. He then noticed that she was covered in wounds and was pretty much half dead. I'm not a doctor. But people with weak pulses and pale faces are like almost dead right. Lars started sweating. Hey. Miss, wake up. He shook her, but she wasn't responding. He checked her breathing, but she wasn't doing so. So he went into action and started giving her CPR. Wah. Her sternum is like a goddamned brick. Lars tried to give chest compressions, but it was like pushing on solid steel. So he just gave rescue breaths and hoped for the best. After doing it for a couple of times, the woman started hacking and she coughed up blood. Her eyes opened up weakly and she looked at him. No isy. She complained. You're dying miss, I don't think you should be complaining about noise. Lars frowned heavily. She looked around for a second, but she got confused instead. A child in a dungeon? I must be losing my mind. The woman chuckled wryly. Dungeon? What are you talking about? Here, drink some water. Lars took out his flask from his inventory. A spatial skill. She blinked at him. He tried to give her some water. But she just stared at Lars with her mismatched eyes. And her right, green eye was starting to lose its luster. Having a child take care of me before I die. How I wish that I have taken care of your child, Meteria. She looked pensive. Hey, don't die on me damn it. I just got here, I don't want to bury a person already. 
Lars furrowed his brows. Then just leave my corpse here. The dungeon will absorb me in a few hours. The lady said morbidly. Wah! Absorb you? Hey! Don't close your eyes. Lars could feel it, she was about to croak. Her breath was hitching, and her eyes were in a daze. Damn it! Lars thought of his inventory and took out his get out of trouble card. Putting the contents of the vial in his mouth, Lars made the woman drink it forcibly. D did it work? He checked her pulse. What he didn't know though, is the woman was packing some insane strength. In a world of swords and magic. She is someone that can be called a being at the zenith. And suddenly being cured of all her wounds, ailments and her mana topping up to full all at once. It just exploded outwards. And Lars only felt an impact on his body. Everything went black immediately. After a few seconds, the woman opened her eyes and she sat up with extreme speed. Looking like a blur. Gasping for air, she looked at her hands and she patted her body all over. I was about to die. She frowned. She has never felt that good in her life. It was like she was completely reborn. A phoenix that went back to life from the ashes. And that would be true. Every cell in her body was truly rejuvenated, like it was brand new. Her body even reverted back in age to bring it to its peak. Such is the effects of a true elixir that was made by God. She saw that her magic caused devastation around her. And the little evidence of a cabin in the surroundings splintered. Then, she remembered. A boy. A boy helped me. She looked around. And being a person at the peak, her senses were as sharp as a razor. Gasping, she saw the boy was unconscious. Just below the base of a tree where he crashed earlier. She immediately ran towards him, moving at breakneck speeds, she analyzed his injuries. As someone who fought the most dangerous of beasts and monsters, she had enough experience to tell what his injuries were in a glance. He has multiple broken bones. And it is all my fault. She bit her lip. Why is a boy even here? This looks like the 39th floor. A normal kid in the deep floors. She thought it was strange. But she shook her head, that wasn't important. With her meager emergency aid, she checked if his bones turned to smithereens. Fortunately, they were just cracked. But still intact. Creating some splints, she immediately tied them to his limbs. And not knowing what to do next, she just stared at him while waiting for him to wake up. Underscore underscore few hours later underscore underscore. Groaning in pain, Lars woke up. He opened his eyes slowly. W what happened? His breath hitched as even breathing felt painful. His ribs were also fractured. But thankfully, it didn't snap and stab his lungs. You, you're finally awake. He heard a woman from the side and the crackles of a wood fire. You're that. Lady. Are you okay? He asked her and she was stunned. Are you really asking me if I'm alright? When you're like that? She grimaced. Well, yet. I used my elixir on you. It would be crap if it didn't work yet. He chuckled. But then he coughed and felt agony on his ribs. S stopped talking. She stared at him in disbelief. She felt terrible, her body was as at its best condition ever since she was born. And she hurt the one who healed her. Not to mention, some scenarios played itself in her mind. If only this was there back then. Materia. She got gloomy. He saw her expression and thought that she felt guilty. Which was correct, but not for the reason he thought of. Don't worry, you needed it. So I gave it to you. I have a condition for it though. Lars stared at her. Name it. She got broken out of her thoughts and agreed that she should repay him. Can you stay with me? I'm kind of disabled here. And what did you mean by dungeon? There's no monsters here though. Lars had a ton of questions. She went quiet for a good moment. Not really expecting to meet someone who doesn't know about the dungeon. Ah, oh, I'm Lars by the way. What's your name, miss? He asked for her name. Alfia. You can call me Alfia. She introduced herself succinctly. Alfia hey? Then, I bet you won't tell me why you were calling from the sky. Lars broke the ice as he chuckled. But she was too stiff and serious. No. Alfia replied and he wasn't really good with her type. Oh okay. The dungeon please, can you explain it? Lars was curious about it. We are in Orario, the dungeon city. 
the city is a hub where gods and goddesses descend from heaven to give their blessings to mortals and live life as a mortal. Alpha summarized. Gods. Lars was shocked. There were genuine gods walking around. Yes. And due to the threat of the dungeon and monsters roaming around. They started handing out Fauna, a blessing to unlock a mortal's potential. Alpha showed her back to him. An emblem of a woman with a crown of flowers was on her back. This is the blessing of a god. And when you unlock your fauna, you must complete tasks to gain Exilia. Something the gods use to increase your status or to level up. Alpha explained patiently. So this place is an RPG. Exilia is EXP, and levels are sort of tears. Lars went into deep thought. Alpha didn't understand some of his words, but she just listened so she could answer all his questions. Then, there must be skills too right? Lars got a bit excited upon hearing he was in an RPG. A man will definitely be excited at the prospect of adventure. That's correct, skills come from the soul. You don't learn them, you unlock them. Alfia replied. Whoa, so it's all natural talent, hey? This place is quite unfair. Lars mused. Alfia suddenly got gloomy as he said that. What's the matter Alfia? I don't want to talk about it, Lars. Alfia's emotions were in turmoil. Okay, I won't pry. Are you an explorer or something? Lars changed the topic. Yes, the Hera Familia is an exploration type familia. These are groups that the gods create to simulate having families. They can't have children, so they did this as a substitute. Alfia gave him more knowledge. I see, what about the dungeon though? Lars wanted to know everything. We're currently in the deep floors. The 37th floor and below onwards. The 1st to 12th are called the upper floors for newbies. Alfia started teaching him. The 13th to 24th are middle ones, 25th to 36th are lower floors. From there on, it's just called the deep floors. And a single monster here could kill you in a heartbeat. Alfia stated as a matter of fact. Lars gulped and it suddenly sunk in why there were no monsters in this place. So we're in a safe point, hey? He shuddered thinking of being in a place where monsters spawned. And he was in the deep floors too, where endgame adventurers are supposed to be. Not just strong ones, strong people in groups. Or they'll be overrun and killed. You are quite smart for being so young. Alfia looked at him with interest. Eh, uh, just simple logic and reasoning. Lars started sweating a bit. They then went quiet again. And Lars noticed that Alfia was brooding. Hey, Alfia. If you got here, you must be an amazing adventurer right? Lars asked her and she nodded. Then can you teach me how to be a good one? Lars requested of her. Teach you, hey. Alfia has never thought of teaching someone one-on-one. -on -one. She has taught some people, but not to the point where they'll be here protege. He is weird. He doesn't know about the dungeon, but he lives here casually. Alfia got suspicious about his origins. Was he born here? Did he got abandoned? Did his parents die? She had too many questions, not enough answers. She was a naturally anxious person behind her calm exterior. And Lars being there screams suspicious. He even has a log cabin. Though she destroyed it. Sure, I will teach you everything. Alfia accepted his request. I have nothing to lose anyway. And he is naturally durable, will he be strong? Alfia looked at his smiling face with a curious gaze. First, you will have to recover. Alfia looked at his body that was covered in splints. His clothes were also ragged, and he didn't have a spare. Yet. Yeah. I do. Lars frowned with a sigh. I. I am sorry. Alfia winced. It's fine. You just have to make up for it. I mean, I saved your life. He gave a cheeky smile at her. She snorted amused by his nonchalant attitude. Alfia, the incarnation of talent, monster of calamitous talent, silence. A heaven-defying mortal that could destroy entire cities with her magic. And she is being held back by a debilitating disease. But now. I don't feel it. That painful curse, the disease that Meteria and I were born with. Alfia clenched her hands. It was an unknown disease. Something that made her and her sister's life miserable. Every time she fought, she would be in agony. And the only thing that could keep it at bay is some branches from a sacred tree that the elves protect with their life. An absolute monster that fought while cursed. Poisoned, 
paralyzed, dysfunctional, while in battle. But she is one of the most powerful combatants of all time. It was like fighting a disabled person with polio, asthma, and cancer. And they beat the shit out of you without any problem. What exactly did he give me? Alfia looked at Lars who was stuffing his face with food from the dungeon. And she wasn't imagining it, he was recovering due to it. I don't. Deserve this. Alfia furrowed her brows. Hey, Alfia. Come on, you must be hungry. Lars took out some of the square tomatoes from his inventory. Coupled with the violet lettuce and other kinds of leafy greens. Making a dungeon salad. I'll call this, the deep dungeon salad. Pretty appropriate, right? He laughed and Alfia had a smidgen of a smile on her face. So noisy. She flicked him on the forehead as she took the food. So simple. Yet so delicious. She was wrecked by different kinds of emotions. Happy, that she was free from her accursed chains. Sad, knowing her friend is dead. Regret and longing, for her twin sister who could barely function due to their disease. And hope, that their sacrifice to strengthen the adventurers of Orario will give her nephew a life where he won't need to pick up a weapon. Where they would grow and finish what they couldn't finish. A looming threat that will release pandemonium all over the world. Lars. I have been given a second chance. Something I do not deserve. Then what should I do besides get stronger? Even more so than Captain. Alfia thought of the Captain of their Familia. The strongest adventurer that has ever lived in modern times, the Empress. Level 9. No, level 10. I will reach it with this new body and life. Wait and see. Alfia promised. Hmm? What are you mumbling about? Lars gave her a weird look. Ah, I'm thinking of how to repay you. Your elixir must be very important. Alfia knows it. That thing must be the most valuable potion in the whole world. And nothing will be able to top it. Even the Philosopher's Stone of the Great Sage centuries ago can't top it. As a top adventurer, she could feel it. She was literally reborn, leaving behind her former shell. And without her debilitating disease, she is easily a high-level 8 combatant. A world-defining person. After the fall of the two strongest familias, the Zeus and Hera familias. You can count level 6 adventurers with your hands. There are only two official level 7s in the world after Alfia's friend sacrificed himself as a stepping stone. If she steps outside the dungeon once again, nobody will be able to stop her. Ah, uh -huh, then how about we form a familia? A nice little group of adventurers. Lars thought about it. A familia hey? I'm still with that hysterical bitch Hera. Alfia definitely disliked her goddess. Ah, uh -huh, will that be a problem? Lars tilted his head and Alfia remembered that he doesn't know how this works. She needs to release me. Or I won't be able to receive another god's fauna. Alfia explained. Ah, uh -huh, but why was the mark on your back getting transparent earlier? Lars revealed. What? Alfia blinked, that's not supposed to happen. She then chanted something, her enchantment magic. Ataraxia. Magic covered her body, covering her in anti-magic armor. It confused her greatly, because when Fauna disappears, it should lock one's status. Meaning, she won't be able to use any of her magics, or skills. Unknowingly, two of her skills also changed due to the change on her soul. She then grinned. She couldn't feel it, her connection with her foul goddess. It doesn't matter, Lars. Recover quickly, I will be teaching you everything I know. Alfia was suddenly in a good mood. Okay he continued eating his veggies and fruits. Not really knowing the shit she was about to put him through. Chapter 3, A Monster Is Born While Lars was recovering, Alfia couldn't help, but test her new body. So when he got to sleep, she moved. Starting with a jog, she slowly ran towards the stairs to the next floor. Laughing, she ran with amazing speed. A superhuman that cratered the ground at every step. It was exhilarating, her body felt light. Her mana wasn't chaotic. Ha, ha ha ha. She ran towards the 40th floor of the dungeon with glee. She sensed a monster and it was a grand treant. Slow moving monsters, but capable of tanking a lot of damage. And their branches and roots can move in unexpected ways. Gospel. She used her other magic, Satana's Varian. And the air distorted as a block of sound formed. Vibrations shook the air and it hit the treant right on the middle of its trunk. The tree monster didn't even had the chance to move. It exploded into millions of splinters. 
its body rippling due to the violent vibrations before going boom. My magic is so smooth. Is this how magic is supposed to feel? Alfia couldn't believe it. It was so much easier without her damned curse. She then saw a huge bowl that was three meters tall. She backhanded its charging head and its head turned into red mist. Her slender body that was oozing femininity was packing ridiculous power. As her titles conveyed, she is an incarnation of talent. And before she leveled up, all of her stats were raised to the maximum. That's why she could compete with even her captain, the Empress. Who was a level 9 adventurer. And now, she has no restrictions on her body. I feel. Good. She had a small grin on her face. Continuing her descent to the dungeon, Alfia punched and used her magic. Everything in her way were eviscerated like ants. She then arrived at the 49th floor with blistering speed. A plane that was a dull grey in color. The floor looked like a post-apocalyptic world that lost its color. And giants roamed around the plane, farmers. Furry monsters that looked like Bigfoot with horns. They were four meters tall and can overpower level 5 adventurers with their brute strength. But Alfia just ran towards the nearest one and punched its head off. Her brain was different from most. She had an eidetic memory. Not only that, once she sees something. She can copy it with immense accuracy and precision. A nigh perfect copy. And watching the Zeus and Hera familias fight together. She has a myriad of techniques at her disposal. Showcasing her martial prowess, she killed the furry tyrants with her bare hands. Every hit, every punch, and blow. Resulted in the death of a monster. And when she finished her carnage, a farmer that was larger than the rest appeared. A monster that was ten meters tall. The monster rex of the 49th floor, a baler. With a roar, it stomped on the floor. Its strength, cratering the hard dungeon floor. Noisy. Shut up. Alfia got irritated to the highest degree. She really dislikes noise. So she cranked up her magic. Gospel. Vibrations traveled towards the baler. But with a surprising display of speed, it rolled to the side to dodge. Silence, Lugio. She was displeased with it roaring and stomping everywhere. So she sent another one, showcasing her speed with her magic that has a super short chant. Almost worthy to be called chantless. Instead of hitting the baler with a block of sound. It exploded instead. And the bomb released shockwaves that disintegrated anything in its range. The baler's body was wrecked by shockwaves and oscillatory waves. Its organs turning into mush. The monster's brains leaking from its ears. It was a gruesome death. It then turned into black mist as it died, leaving a sizable magic stone on the ground. Hmm, I guess this will be a good souvenir for Lars. She picked it up and stopped there for now. She went too deep, she could still go on. Her body was its prime. But she needed to protect Lars. Monsters can still go up or down on the floors. Safe points just didn't spawn monsters. Alfia quickly made her way back to the 39th floor and she saw that Lars was just stretching a bit. Are you fine? She asked him as his injuries weren't exactly light. I feel quite nice actually. I can't do strenuous movements, but I can walk around fine. Lars patted his body. Here, a little souvenir. Alfia put down a gem that was a meter in length. What is that? Looks expensive. Lars looked at the purple stone. It's the magic stone of a monster rex, floor bosses. Alfia gave him another piece of knowledge. Oh, wow. You must be really strong then? This doesn't look like it came from a weak monster. Lars blinked at her. You can say that. She shrugged, choosing not to tell him her prowess. Hmm. It looks kinda like rock candy. Lars went up to it and Alfia observed him. But what she didn't expect, is he took a bite out of it. What are you doing? Alfia grabbed him and he groaned due to his injuries. But she didn't care, he was trying to kill himself. Magic stones have the mana of monsters, Lars. You'll turn berserk and become a mindless beast if you eat that. Spit it out. Alfia smacked his back. Ow. Ow. I already swallowed it. Lars protested. So she grabbed his face and tried to make him puke by stimulating his gag reflex. Except, he didn't have one at all. And even if he tried doing so after she informed him of its effects, he couldn't feel it in his stomach anymore. Suddenly, Alfia could sense it. Mana started to flow in his body. But it wasn't chaotic like how she saw it happen in the past. His magic resonated with him. It was his, 
not the monsters. Ah, oh, I don't feel so good. Lars paled as his body began to hurt. You fool! Alfia shouted at him. Lars then sat down to rest and he started sweating. What do I do? Alfia bit her nails in paranoia. She wasn't able to stop him earlier. And his death will be in her mind forever. Lars' body started to ripple. His muscles were ballooning in size. His bones were cracking and their matrix reformed. Alfia broke into a cold sweat, she was horrified. Ugh, Alfia. It's painful. He couldn't think, everything hurt. Breathe. Breathe, Lars. Alfia lied him down on the ground. He was starting to release steam, his body was having an exothermic reaction. She quickly ran towards the river and gathered some water. Controlling her magic to form a container made of air pressure. Alfia then hosed him down with water as he released steam like a hot coal. Waiting anxiously, she was going to lose her mind. She couldn't do anything but bite her nails and wait. Groaning from time to time, Lars' body continued to change. His muscles that ballooned began to compress, getting as hard as steel. After a few hours, he finally stopped groaning and his scrunched up face relaxed. What happened? Alfia sighed in relief as she patted all around his body. She might not realize it, but Alfia looked at him favorably. Alfia might still be conflicted about having a chance at life and not her sister. But getting rid of her curse that plagued her since she was born made her incredibly happy. She would give her strength and talent in exchange for a normal life. In a way, being cured is like spitting on the face of their curse. Though she wanted Meteria to enjoy this instead of her. After all, she has a son. And Zeus is taking care of him in God's knows where. Ugh, I feel terrible. I need some milk. Lars groaned and she frowned at him. Are you an idiot? Why would you take a bite out of that thing? It screams inedible. Alfia chided him. Ah, you see. I have a special skill, I can get strength from eating things. Lars shrugged. Why didn't you open up with that? Alfia raised a brow and he started sweating. It just called out to me, it looked really tasty. Lars scratched his head sheepishly. TCH, do whatever you want. Alfia huffed at him. Hmm, I feel really different. He cracked his neck and he grabbed a stick. It splintered under his grip. His strength took a qualitative leap. So it's like Zald's Dias Ambrosia. But he doesn't have a fauna. Alfia observed him. Based on her estimates, he gained the strength of a level 1 adventurer that has stats in the hundreds. She then looked at the magic stone and he just took a bite out of it. But Zald can't eat magic stones. It was universally known that even those that came from goblins would drive adventurers crazy. Alfia furrowed her brows. It was taking in the essence of a monster. Even if strong adventurers like Zald who has a skill to help him get stronger by eating monster flesh will experience debilitating effects. Magic stones affect your mana and soul, unlike drop items or monster parts. And even the flesh of the behemoth that Zald ate poisoned him to death. Lars just chomped on a monster Rex's magic stone. Alfia didn't know what to think of it. It really looks tasty, Alfia. Lars drooled. And to him, it tasted amazing as well. He couldn't describe it, the magic stone was like the essence of deliciousness. He's drooling. Alfia rolled her eyes at him. Go on, take a bite again. See if I'll hose you down with water again. Alfia snorted. Oh ah, uh, thanks for that. I felt like I was in a fever dream earlier. Lars smiled at her. He then took another bite off of it. Fortune favors the bold. Alfia couldn't get used to it, she winced as the stone crunched under his maws. Lars squinted his eyes, waiting for debilitating pain. But nothing came, nothing too painful that is. He was still in agony. Like he just sprained his whole body. But at least it wasn't like earlier. Where it felt like all of his bones were shattering. Phew. I feel horrible. Lars kept on biting on the magic stone like it was a large piece of candy. You're crazy. Alfia looked at him in disbelief. She could see it, his muscles were still rippling and getting torn apart. Ha, it tastes good though. He shrugged as he sat down for a breather. Damn, this bee's going to be unpleasantly good. Lars looked at the magic stone. And he only ate 10% of it. Are you perhaps a masochist? Alfia raised a brow at him. And no. Why would you think that? Lars blinked at her. Well, that hurts right? Why would you keep doing it? Alfia snorted. 
you're one to talk, to become that strong at such a young age. You must have sweated blood. Lars huffed at her. And Althea thought that was true. Being the incarnation of talent means nothing. If you don't do anything. Inaction equals stagnation. Touché. Althea sighed and Lars continued munching on his magic stone. Hey. I have an idea. Lars' eyes shone and he had this crazy look on him. What is it? Althea raised a brow and she could feel that what he's going to request is going to be troublesome. Can you bring me with you and power level me? I'll store all the drops and magic stones, it's genius. Lars grinned. Althea wasn't a car, nor a bus, she was a goddamned plane that will carry him to the skies. That is actually a good idea. Althea thought about it and wasting magic stones isn't really efficient. She could treat him as a waste disposal system. Monsters won't be able to grow by eating the magic stones that she don't care about as well. And when they return to the surface, he could sell the magic stones and drops that they'll farm due to his inventory. Althea suddenly realized. That a monster was just born in the dungeon. And she'll be the one to protect it, mold it, raise it to perfection. Why didn't he appear sooner? Althea furrowed her brows. Lars didn't know it yet. But Althea's intuition was tingling. He'll be a true monster that would overshadow her and the Empress of the Hera Familia by a large margin. She saw it, his eyes when he ate the magic stone of the Baylor. There was a hint of insanity in it. He still continued eating it even if it hurts him. What an insane boy. Althea got scared a bit. A natural enemy of the dungeon and monsters. Someone just like them, a human, no. A being that will devour them in order to grow ever stronger. Althea gulped at the possibilities. Can he get the skills of monsters? Their traits? What is the limits of his skill? Althea wondered. I'm not sharing. Lars hugged the magic stone and she almost chortled at his antics. That's mine in the first place you brat. She flicked him on the forehead. Ow. That hurt. Be careful of your strength woman. I feel like you can take off my head with a finger. He suffered backlash from that little hit. Noisy, shut up. She pinched his cheeks and stretched them. They then quarreled a bit before they decided to start their carnage in the deeper floors. Chapter 4, Monster Slaughter Ugh, I finally finished it. Lars felt that his jaws were tired. Eating a hard stone was as exhausting as expected. This crazy kid. Althea shook her head in exasperation. The stone was definitely heavier than him, but he ate it all in one sitting. Althea, I'm hungry again. Lars gave her the puppy dog eyes, but unfortunately. It didn't work on her. Then let's go hunt for more. She picked him up through the scruff of his shirt. Hey. This shirt is all I have you know? Be careful. Lars huffed at her and she didn't care. Don't puke. She said ominously and he was about to ask why. But she suddenly ran like the wind. Ah. Slow down. Slow down. Lars cried out. His eyelids were being blown away by the wind and his mouth opened up like a windblower was aimed on his face. Althea just smirked and she smacked him. So noisy, be quiet. He lost consciousness at the hit and he would surely be crying for CPS later. With her breakneck speed, Althea arrived at the 40th floor in just a couple of seconds. The monsters then craned their necks towards her and they started charging after staring at her for a second. It was a sight to behold, hordes of poisonous plants, large ass bulls, worms that could swallow orcs whole. The myriad of monsters looked like a monster train. Anyways, she started blasting. Walls of oscillatory waves and vibrations hit them with a single word out of her mouth. Their bodies exploded and fountains of guts and blood showered everywhere. Shut up, noisy monsters. Your noise irritates me. Althea furrowed her brows. Lars then opened his eyes and was about to complain. But he suddenly saw a monster in front of them explode into red mist. Fuck. What the hell is happening? Lars shouted in shock and he was smacked once again. Stop shouting, we're farming right now. Althea huffed at him. Ugh, seeing a bull explode like a grenade is definitely not something I want to see when I regain my bearings. He glared at her. Not my problem. Althea just casted her magic like a machine gun and made a river of blood. Aren't you like an amazing person? Lars watched her carnage. Althea's eyebrows twitched at his insinuation. Are you saying that I'm a second-rate adventurer? She squinted her eyes. Don't put words into my mouth. Lars whistled and he started sweating. Humph, 
Now. I'll teach you how to be a supporter. Pick everything up. Alfia threw him towards the carnage. Ah. Crazy woman. I'll get dirty. Lars saw that he was about to drop onto guts and blood. That's your job, get dirty and pick up the items. Alfia smirked at him. Fuck, where's child protection services when you need them? This is child labor. Lars grumbled. Hmm, did you say something? Alfia heard him loud and clear, but she feigned ignorance. Violent woman. Lars grumbled again and Alfia smirked at him. Chop chop, supporter. You are too slow. Alfia was definitely having fun in messing with him. He was going to be a powerhouse, she needed to collect blackmail as much as possible. Yes, boss lady. Lars sighed as he picked up the magic stones and putting it in his inventory. The drops were also noticeable, as they weren't bloody at all. He then tried to think of putting them in his inventory. Alas, it didn't work like that. TCH, an automatic collection system would have been nice. Such is a human's greed for convenience. After he gathered everything, Alfia thought that this is quite inefficient. Monsters take too long to spawn. So she decided to go to a special place instead. Come, we're farming too slow. I don't like it. Alfia carried him again and he surrendered to his fate. Alfia ran back to the 39th floor. And she continued going upwards, until they reached the 37th. They then arrived at a place that looked similar to something in Lar's previous life. A Colosseum. He looked at the eerie atmosphere of the place. It was darker, and the Colosseum looked gloomy. Here, monsters spawn infinitely. Alfia pointed at the arena and there were all kinds of monsters inside. Skeletons that looked like gladiators. A floating skull of a sheep that has a coat over its torso. A wild-looking monster with two curved horns. It was also two meters tall. Some bipedal midget werewolves. And a serpentine dragon with poisonous-looking spines. That's crazy, they're having a free-for-all. Lars pointed out. And they spawn infinitely, a good place to farm. Alfia jumped down and she looked cool. Did she just do a superhero landing? Lars chuckled. But what happened next wasn't hero-like at all. She grabbed the serpentine dragon and she used it as a damned club. Its long body and spines was a nice weapon to use. Alfia swung it around like a madwoman and the monsters died in droves. She then used her magic to gather the magic stones as it floated right towards Lars. T this is definitely more efficient. He smiled wryly at Alfia's display. It made his blood boil, wondering if he would get that strong as well. Alfia. I'll start consuming them. Magic stones I mean. Lars took out the smaller stones. And it was just the right size for one bite. Alfia nodded at him and went closer to him to protect him. Lars then started munching on magic stones like it was popcorn. And due to the Baylor stone changing his body massively, he didn't really feel much. Some drops also arrived and Lars looked at the fangs and head shell of a worm that Alfia killed earlier. Hesitation, is death. Lars started eating them and he suddenly felt his gums ache. He also received a headache. Ugh, do I gain their attributes? Lars wondered. After a few minutes, his teeth turned into daggers and he could also see heat. The worm monster called Wormwell has a peculiar ability. Its mouth had sensors that can feel heat. And it transferred over to him. Now, he has infrared vision. I'm like the predator, goddamn. He looked around in wonder. He then took some fur and some organs in his inventory. Should I really eat this? Lars ate some raw organs before. But it came from a monster. He then shook his head. I can't be giving up here. He munched on them. His skin tingled and his insides burned. A qualitative change happened to his organs. And when he thought of it, he could grow thick fur on his body. This will be useful against sharp attacks. Lars remembered that thick fur could repel blades. Even thin ones, like deer fur. He kept rummaging around his inventory and now, he found a piece of obsidian. Well, magic stones are rocks too. Bottoms up. He bit into the obsidian that came from a warrior made of the stone. His new teeth helped with cutting through it too. But he needed his molars to grind it. Lars' skin began to tingle again and he swapped his fur with black obsidian. Thank you for the meal, Alfia. Lars clasped his hands as if praying. He has found his patron saint. The neurotic and violent Alfia. The woman in question suddenly gave him a sharp look. A woman's intuition was something else he thought. 
as he started sweating a bit. So he decided to just keep on eating the delicious magic stones. Though the Baylor's was different. If the monsters in the Colosseum taste like prime cuts, then the Baylor's was Kobe beef. I'm not complaining though, free food is free. Go Lady Alfia. You look dashing. Lars cheered her on. Alfia frowned at him and he was definitely happy to ride on her coattails. Just you wait, I'll train you to the limit later. Alfia said with a dark expression. Eh, I have made a grave mistake. Lars felt a chill in his spine. He continued eating the drops and magic stones. He never expected that monster drops will be tasty. Hmm, how can I make the ultimate meal with monster parts though? They turned to black mist after getting killed. Lars sighed at the dilemma. I guess I'll think about it later. He shrugged and the duo continued for a couple of hours. He gorged himself with monster drops and they had an efficient system. Alfia would kill as many monsters as possible and deliver their drops to him with her magic. Lars will eat everything with amazing speed. His specs increasing, so he could eat them more quickly. His golden eyes were glowing and Alfia could feel a qualitative change on him once again. Is that mana? He's leaking mana. Alfia didn't feel him having mana earlier. Now, he was starting to increase it like crazy. Such an insane growth rate. The only problem is his individual skill. Alfia looked at him in wonder. He will grow weak if we just keep on doing this. He must gain his fuel to grow by himself. Alfia concluded. She wasn't strong because of her magic and skills. Alfia is strong due to her ability to use them and her body to their maximum potential. A level 7 adventurer that doesn't know how to fight will get taken down by some level 5s. That's why first class adventurers specialize in something. Else, they will be forgotten. Overshadowed by more brilliant adventurers that have something unique, setting them apart from rabble. Alfia decided to stop for now as Lars started to eat their spoils slower. Store them all for now, we will go back to rest. Alfia grabbed him after he did so and they went back to the 39th floor. Alfia observed him and his stats ballooned towards the 500s. Just in a single day. He doesn't even have Falna. He's an irregular amongst irregulars. Alfia was still surprised by his growth. It was most likely because he was just starting and she was carrying him hard. But if he did have a Falna, he can already level up to two. Which was insane, she then had a thought. What if his ability and Falna are additive? Alfia shuddered at her dangerous thought. If that's the case, he could disguise himself as a level one. But his stats can be any number. And a blessing will only make him stronger. What a monster. Alfia could see it. A hero in the making. We definitely had a good haul Lars started counting the drops and magic stones. Every slot had hundreds of them. It also categorized the magic stones. It's just like the old days. He smiled, reminiscing the times where he would grind RPGs for loot. Though based on Alfia's explanation, EXP here is S. Lars frowned. Unlike in games, Exelia has to be hard earned. You can still grind it like a true gamer. But it will take years to increase your stats. Good experience comes from fights or feats that is hard for the individual. That means he can't just grind like a madman. It has to be difficult to have meaning. It will take too much time to farm Exilia the conventional way. And that's for later anyways, when he gets into a familia. Alfia, here. Lars gave her some fruits and she started to eat them. You are growing nicely. But you know it, don't you? Alfia squinted her eyes. Yeah, I don't know squat about fighting. I've seen the moves you did. If I could see it in the first place. They were elegant and calculated. Lars frowned. Umu, then this makes things easier. I will teach you how to fight. Alfia took some branches and formed them. A sword, an axe, and a spear. The big three weapons that everybody uses. He could just specialize into another kind of weapon later. Alfia wanted him to learn how to use them first. Training hui? Bring it on. He was inspired, Alfia's fighting style was brutal and elegant. It was a man's romance to learn how to fight. And Alfia is there to teach him. Good words, and guard. Alfia rushed at him and Lars prepared for a beating of a lifetime. Chapter 5, A Conspiracy Fing on the ground. Alfia beat the shit out of him once again. You're too strong Alfia. Do you even have a weakness? Lars asked her after he caught his breath. I used to, but you cancelled it. Alfia shrugged and Lars remembered his elixir. Ah, 
so you have an illness or something. Lars got curious and she nodded with a frown. If it's unpleasant for you, then I won't pry. He smiled at her. It does, or more like it did. But not anymore. Alfia sat down besides him. I had a twin sister. We were both born with an incurable illness. Alfia looked at the sky and she wondered if Meteria was looking over her son. My condolences. Lars noticed her wording and she didn't mind. Thank you, anyways. Her name is Meteria. And I. I took everything from her. Alfia frowned heavily. Lars had a feeling that asking why would be insensitive. And she will most likely continue. She just had that sad expression on her face. And it didn't match her brutality and confidence. Meteria was normal, just a girl. And our illness made her as fragile as glass. While me, I absorbed all of her talent in the womb. I am exceptional, talented, monstrously so. Alfia clenched her hand. I see. She blames herself for her sister's misfortune. Lars almost sighed at her self-depreciation. Meteria couldn't even go outside much, she stayed at home most of the time. So I trained. Then I entered a familia. It's so Meteria will have a better life that she rightfully deserves. And the Hira familia took interest in me. Alfia reminisced their childhood. I grew stronger and stronger, until I turned into an executive of the Hira familia. And that perverted bastard Zeus. He is Hira's husband, two pieces of garbage made for each other. Alfia's tongue released poison. Damn, she really hates them. Lars sweated at Alfia's hatred. And one of Zeus' children managed to trick Meteria. Alfia grinned her teeth in rage. Lars almost choked at her killing intent. And the ground trembled due to her rage. Meteria got pregnant and she died due to her poor health. Alfia went into deep thought. What happened to her child? Lars changed the topic or Alfia would most likely go on a rampage. I couldn't take care of him. Meteria gave my nephew to Zeus in order to take care of him. Alfia closed her eyes. It is something I regret every single day. But what can I do? I will also leave him soon. Alfia sighed. As the strongest familias, the Hera and Zeus familias were tasked with three great quests. The Behemoth, Leviathan, and the One-Eyed Black Dragon. Alfia renumerated them. Great quests? Sounds dangerous. Lars could already imagine it. That they are. A friend of mine, Zeld. He was poisoned because he ate the flesh of the behemoth. You two actually have similar skills. But his, is not as strong as yours. She looked at him curiously. While the Leviathan, in order for it to not flee. I killed it with my third magic. Genos Angelus. My disease worsened after that. Alfia frowned heavily. She then went quiet. How about the dragon? Lars asked. We were defeated soundly. Not even my captain who was a level 9 adventurer could do anything to it. Alfia shook her head. Damn, then it's the last boss yet. Lars could imagine how strong that thing is. Alfia could mow down monsters for hours with breakneck speeds. Her magic makes things explode in just a blink of an eye. But they got stomped by it. And there are stronger people that was with them. It is. The only survivors are me and Zeld. Everyone else died. Alfia sighed. Lars went quiet and he didn't want to comment anything about that. Thus, we decided to live our final moments peacefully. That is, until an evil god approached us. Alfia smiled and Lars went wide-eyed. An evil god? What happened? He got engrossed in the story. Erebus. He gave us a chance to use our final moments. To give the strongest adventurers that will be the future of Orario a challenge in order to level up. Alfia shrugged. So, stepping stones. Lars admired their final gift to the adventurers in the surface. I don't even know if it's going to be worth it. I helped a bunch of level 5s and 3s to level up. I could have squashed them like a bug. Alfia snorted. How about your buddy? Lars was curious about Zelt. He made a level 7. But it's not enough, not nearly enough now that I think about it. That new level 7 can't even face the behemoth or leviathan that is so much weaker than the black dragon. Alfia shook her head wistfully. Then doesn't this place have a definitive time limit? What if that thing rampages around in the surface? Lars frowned at the thought. It already destroyed a kingdom. And caused widespread destruction. Alfia said seriously. Where is it then? 
Lars was surprised that the dragon didn't just bathe the world in fire or something. It flew up north. We don't know what it's doing, nobody does. Alfia frowned. Then your familias were tasked in dealing with it. That's some heavy stuff. He clicked his tongue. It seems that people are the same anywhere. They just wait for heroes to arrive. Not that it's inherently a bad thing. Not everyone can fight and be like Alfia. He even doubts that somebody like her can appear again. A combatant that is held back by a disease heavily, rising up as one of the strongest people ever. But why aren't people trying to do something? Just waiting patiently to die. Lars' tone turned harsh. If there was something they were really good at. That is producing weapons of mass destruction. Lars doubted that Dragon could survive the whole arsenal of humanity from his world. Humans are capable of so much destruction that it isn't even funny. They can turn the whole planet to a wasteland. Alfia was surprised by his sudden shift. What do you mean? She was unfortunately stuck with the denizens of Orario. Thinking that the topmost adventurers are the only ones that can kill the threat. Humans are tenacious bastards, the gods are basically useless. Why rely on them solely? Lars have learned things from Alfia. They have arcanums, their divine powers to wield. If they really wanted to, the gods could just bombard the dragon and be done with it. Yet they raise adventurers. They don't see their familias as their children. Because if they do, they'll destroy the dungeon and the monsters at all costs. Lars frowned. An enemy of humanity that will only lead to bloodshed and suffering. There are numerous gods around. They can surely do it, but they don't. Just to be entertained. Lars hissed. Alfia went quiet. Now that she thought about it, that was true. What is a mortal dragon? Against the gods of heaven and their divine might. It all made sense to her now. Why the gods don't tell anyone what the dungeon truly is and how it even appeared in the first place. I think the dungeon and monsters are made by the gods. Not a natural phenomena. Alfia theorized. After all, they all spread propaganda that monsters are the enemies. That the dungeon needs to be dived into. Alfia clenched her fist. Yet why is there only one of them? If it's a natural occurrence that the planet creates to cull humans as per the rules of nature. Then why is there only one? Alfia was creating a conspiracy theory. And it made sense, otherwise. Why won't the gods just blast the dungeon into oblivion? The black dragon? Leviathan? And the behemoth? If monsters are the enemies of humanity, then why not eradicate them? Yet. And if it's for the bullshit reason of not meddling with mortals? Then why are they even handing out fauna in the first place? Lars arrived at a hypothesis. They can experience a mortal's life even without monsters and adventurers. They simply don't care. And it's all a game for them. Alfia gritted her teeth. Ha, huh, wait for a second. This must have some truth to it. But not completely. Lars calmed down and he thought about it. What do you mean? Alfia raised a brow. Just like humans, there must be elder gods right? Those who make rules for them. Lars squinted his eyes. Yes. There is one, Auranos. It is said that he is using his divinity to hold back the dungeon. Alfia remembered the god. Then he must know the reason. Why else would they ban the use of Arcanum? To prevent chaos? Not quite, because they could just banish them to heaven again. And the use of it can still be regulated. Lars thought it was stupid. They can't use their divine powers on the lower world or they'll be sent back to heaven. If it was regulated, like guns or weapons. Then it's basically the same. But why aren't any of them using it to get an advantage? Based on the gods he knew. They were just humans with great powers. Immortal, divine, yes. But not perfect, they can still be stupid, greedy, good, or evil. We need to learn more about this. But not now, we are too weak to do so. Alfia surprised him with her words. After all, she has already shown him how powerful she is. Alfia could shake entire floors of the dungeon with her magic and strength. And the dungeon floors can even be larger than the city above. Are you saying that we should reach the realm of gods? Lars frowned. That would take a really long time. Yes, we should. So kick your butt into gear, we need to get stronger. Alfia stood up. But you don't have a fauna anymore. Lars pointed out that she couldn't level up. Then we find one. Alfia squinted her eyes and she looked upwards towards the surface. Right now. 
Lars raised a brow at her and she shook her head. No, not yet. I can't afford to be seen yet. I need to let the heat die down. Alfia shrugged. Then, let's continue with making me get stronger. He smiled at her. Humph, eager still? I like that, just don't be noisy. Alfia created another pair of wooden training weapons for him. And so, he trained like a madman. Too slow. Stand up. Alfia always hit him when he made a mistake. It wasn't a soft one too. It was directly tied to his status, Alfia would swing her weapon at him with the same intensity that someone his level was at. Every blow would sting like a motherfucker. And she targets all the soft spots too, the only exception was his groin and eyes. When he's not fighting for his life against her, he was eating his stockpile of magic stones. Gorging himself with it until he got full. He didn't know why, but monster drops and magic stones satiated him. Even for a small amount of time. They then found out that once he was full, he would enter a cooldown time where anything he ate while in that time frame will not give him any strength. Thinking that it was the way of the skill to not make him explode due to his growth, he opted to train more of his skills in that time. Falling into a not-so-comfortable routine, he lived every second with purpose. With burning determination. Gods lived there in that world. And they could just order around their adventurers like their slaves. What's stopping them from trying to take his peace once he's found out? Once they see that he was involved with someone like Alfia, they would stop at nothing to annoy him to no end. Annoy him was even too soft of a word. The gods will do everything to poke and prod at them. And he couldn't afford to be weak. Alfia's weakest link is him. So he had to get stronger to get rid of that weakness. Hey, Alfia. We're partners right? Lars asked her while they rested on their new cabin. Hmm? Why would you even ask? Alfia looked at him weirdly. Well, just answer the question yet. He got embarrassed a bit. And it also lingered inside of his mind. Will Alfia stay besides him when they reveal themselves on the surface? Of course, I have become accustomed to your noise. Alfia rolled her eyes. My noise? What does that even mean? He snorted. You wouldn't understand, now get your butt up and start training again. I want your swings to be perfect. Alfia huffed at him. Yes boss lady he sighed and she glared at him. Are you calling me old? What? No. Why would you even think that? Lars raised a brow at her and she stared at him. She then huffed as she turned around, waiting for him outside. She's gotta tone down her neuroticism. Lars sighed at her unpredictable behavior. Chapter 6, An Unlikely Ally As Alfia kept on strengthening Lars, they didn't notice that a year has already passed. Alfia checked his insane growth without a fauna. And currently, he had the stats of a level 2 mid-class adventurer. That's not all. His stats are equal all throughout. She was amazed by this. Normally, adventurers would have a main status. There were several of them. Vitality, strength, agility, dexterity, and magic. Tank types will focus on vitality and strength. While their agility and magic suffers. Assassin types will dump their magic and vitality stats. Mage types will have lower VIT and STR. So on and so forth. But Lars growed them equally without even thinking about it. Or focusing one or the other. After all, he doesn't have any magic. But why is his magic container increasing? So she theorized that the magic stones he eats will always prioritize equal growth, in exchange for fast increases. Monsters have different stats after all. And the warrior types in the Colosseum that Alfia farms for him are more focused on VIT, STR, Agi, and Dex. They also found out something. Monsters don't disappear unless you take their magic stones. It was a time-consuming task, but when Lars eats monsters like that, he gains access to their physical traits. Though through intense testing, they learned that his monster traits are weaker. Most likely due to Lars still lacking stats. It gave him versatility like no other. Albeit, it needs to be home to be useful. Alfia and Lars were sparring once again. Lars breathed in and released a torrent of flames from his mouth. An ability he got from eating the magic stone of a green dragon in the middle floors. That Alfia fetched after learning of his peculiar skill. She just said one word and the blazing flames just lit the anti-magic armor around her. Not even singing a single hair. He clicked his tongue and he took out some spines from his back. The ends of it were dripping with violet liquid. And when it dropped on the ground, 
the earth hissed as it melted. Poisonous spines from the Peluda. The serpentine dragon with four legs on the 37th floor that looked like a porcupine. He threw them at her, but she just cancelled all his attempts. Gospel. A wall of vibrations just made it flew away. You're as ridiculous as ever. His skin suddenly turned blue as scales appeared all over his body. The scales of elite lizardmen that also came from the Colosseum. And you're as versatile. Alfia went into close quarters combat with him. She restrained her strength, dexterity, and agility to level 3. And they entered a fierce exchange of blows. Lars utilized his scales as armor and his claws were daggers that could rip apart even level 3 adventurers due to their hardness and sharpness. Alfia's unmatched dynamic vision made everything she saw go in slow motion. It wasn't an exaggeration to say that nobody below level 8 can fight her one-on-one. -on -one. Her monstrous talent isn't propaganda and just for show. Now that her body isn't chained down by a terrible curse. She got used to fighting like that now. And she is an efficient killing machine. A true battle mage that gets into the thick of battle. Being able to copy the strongest adventurers period, Alfia is a one-man army that can dive deeper floors on her lonesome. The personification of skill and perfection. An adventurer that can reach the realm of gods in due time. And her protege, Lars. A growing monster that will surpass the gods when left to his own devices. His scales suddenly turned red. The scales of a Cadmus dragon. The strongest monster in the 51st floor. Comparable to monster rexes, dungeon floor bosses. It is estimated to be at high level 6 in strength. And its stats were mostly equal. With a terrible roar, a beam of flames was released from his mouth. Similar to Valgong dragons that can snipe adventurers in the 52nd floor from the 58th floor. Alfia had to strengthen her enchantment magic, Silentium Eden to disperse his magic. Steam was released from his mouth and burning flames flickered on Lars' body. But he ran out of steam due to the intense mind consumption. It was his trump card, yet it did nothing against her. That was a splendid attack. That could severely injure level 4 adventurers. Yet it has a terrible consumption rate high. She helped him up. Yeah, ha, ha. I'm having a severe headache right now. Lars started eating some magic stones to replenish his mana. Or in that world, mind. The energy used to supply all of the spells. Rest for an hour, you'll need to recover your mind. Alfia smirked at him for being too easy to beat. Yeah, yeah, violent woman. Lars grumbled and Alfia stretched his cheeks. Hmm? What did you say? A vein on her forehead almost popped. I'm Sawai, oh most beautiful Alfia Shama. Lars quickly tried to pacify her. Humph, cheeky little brat. Alfia had a small smile on her face. They were definitely closer, the two only had each other for a year now. And without the other, they would have most likely gone insane in the dungeon. Not that Alfia would have that chance, as she would have been dead. Alfia then suddenly craned her neck to the side. Stay here. Something's over there. Her insane senses was prodded by a rustling noise. She was incredibly sensitive to noises and vibrations. It could be said to be her domain. A monster or an adventurer? Lars frowned. A monster, it doesn't sound like a human walking. Alfia suddenly disappeared. Lars followed her trail and he quickly knew where she was. Making his limbs grow longer by imitating a Lugaru, the small werewolf in the Colosseum. He ran on all fours, following the trembling in the dungeon due to her magic. Underscore underscore a little ways away underscore underscore. Alfia saw a siren that was watching the surroundings. She didn't like those pests, they were noisy. Gospel. She quickly used Satana's varian and a block of sound traveled towards the humanoid monster with feathers. Alfia was surprised though, because it dodged it and flew to the skies. H.O.H. You are an enhanced species hey? Too bad though, you would be strong against normal adventurers. Alfia squinted her eyes. Her magic flowed and the siren was alarmed to the maximum. But you're not facing a run of the mill one. Wait. Please. I am not an enemy. The siren cried out. But Alfia snorted, sirens were known to trick adventurers with their beautiful appearances and voices. Noisy, shut up. Alfia launched Satana's Varian and was about to turn it into a pressurized air bomb. Wait. Alfia, don't kill her. Lars suddenly arrived and Alfia cancelled her magic. Lars? Don't tell me you're charmed by a monster? I thought you were better than that. Alfia frowned at him. No. No, 
I feel something. She's kind of, different. Lars couldn't help but furrow his brows. He doesn't know why, but she was different. The siren didn't have the dangerous feel of normal monsters. Yes. Please. I was just roaming around here. I'm a Xenos. Not a monster. The siren begged for her life. She sweated bullets, the siren was approximately level 4. And Alfia was about to turn her into a paste. The Baylor which is a high level 6, but weaker than the Cadmus dragon got one shot by her after all. Vibrations, shockwaves, and oscillatory waves were no joke. Speak. Alfia decided to entertain Lars' speculation. She could just kill her in a heartbeat anyways. I. I'm Ray. As you can see, I'm a siren. We are called Xenos. Reincarnated monsters that gain sentience. Pick. Ray started explaining her circumstances. Alfia raised a brow and Lars squinted his eyes. They both had the same thought, even if sirens can mimic human speech. They don't speak fluently like that. Okay, we hear you. Why are you here though? Lars asked. And why are you looking around like you're hunting for something? Alfia raised a brow. W.L., I'm trying to look for more members of our race. You see, the Xenos have communities. We live in settlements called Hidden Villages. And they're mostly near in safe spots. So I thought that some Xenos must be here. Ray explained quickly. Village hidden in the dungeon? Do you have cages too? Lars suddenly asked a confusing question. Hey? No. Ray tilted her head in confusion. I knew I couldn't believe it. Lars clicked his tongue. Eh anyways, the dungeon attacks us as well. And adventurers would definitely do so too. Case in point. She pointed at Alfia with her wing. That's because you were suspicious. I'd kill anyone who's scouting our home. Alfia was as extreme as ever. Well, sorry about Alfia. She didn't mean it, you just met in the wrong circumstances. Lars smiled wryly. Oh okay, what's good is I'm alive. And I found adventurers that even want to converse with us. She sighed in relief. Lars then had an idea. Hey, how about you guys move here? We don't know why, but no adventurers have passed here yet. Lars thought about it. The 39th floor is a safe point, but there has been no parties that went for an expedition. Alfia then had a look of realization. She most likely had an idea on what was happening in the surface. After all, she is one of the people that caused that chaos in Orario. What? Really? Ray asked in suspicion. After all, she had to be vigilant. She's one of the leaders of the Xenos. Yeah, besides. This violent woman here is extremely strong. Lars patted Alfia's back. She then kicked him and proved his point as Lars crashed through a tree. Ugh, see? She's a certified level 8 in prowess. Nothing will be able to touch you with her here. Lars dusted himself off. L level 8. Ray almost fainted at his words. She was about to be hunted down by a level 8 adventurer. Her blood went cold at the thought of Lars not appearing in time. She would have been killed without her breaking a sweat. Lars. Stop saying unnecessary things, they'll just be noisy and annoying. Alfia glared at him. Ah, uh, she's also neurotic. So you better don't make much noise. Besides that, you'll be safe here. Lars smiled at Ray. S shut up you. Alfia kicked him again. He knows her too well. Ha. Huh. As for why there are no adventurers going in an expedition. There's this group called Evil Us that must be keeping the top familius on their toes. Alfia furrowed her brows. Some gods that are affiliated with them are like Erebus. Someone that wants to see a group that stands for true justice. Creating chaos so a group will rise to enforce justice. But others surely aren't. Like Thanatos that wants more deaths. His twisted devotion for his work of reincarnating souls made him do it. Gods are bound by their divinity after all. Gods of smithing will want to create weapons. Gods of discord will want to cause chaos. So on and so forth. Ha, what a lame name. It doesn't really sound, evil. Lars said with a lackadaisical tone. Oh they are, they probably killed hundreds of adventurers up there. Alfia told him with a wary tone. She might be untouchable, but he wasn't. Though people would just think he's a normal person if he didn't show his abilities. But evil us definitely are capable of evil. 
and they have succeeded multiple times in bringing down top adventurers. Like the sister of Ganesha's captain, Arti Varma. Then they need to disappear, humans are already having problems with monsters. Lars sighed. Just like back in his own world. Humans are too busy trying to fight each other to see the main problems in the world, politicians, corruption, and the large corporations that control the world. Albeit in this case, it's a mix of gods having a hidden reason as to why they're not taking care of the dungeon themselves. And the monsters that roam the land, wreaking havoc wherever they appear. Um, can we really be under your protection? Ray raised her wing and they looked at her. Ah, uh, sorry. We got distracted, where's your community? Let's fetch them and move here at the 39th floor. Lars apologized. Deeper floors are better too, less adventurers will come here. And even if they do it will be in large groups, easily avoidable. Alfia's interest got piqued. Xenos, they can raise them. And just giving a hand to them while they live in desperation will put them in debt. And with them inside the dungeon, Lars will always have information about it. Alfia looked towards him and thought that would help him immensely when he goes to the surface. I can't go up yet. The Loki Familia and Freya Familia will definitely protest and try to incriminate me. I need to be stealthy and careful. Alfia made her choice. Chapter 7, Sinner UMM, the hidden village we reside in is in the 27th floor. Ray revealed. She didn't know why, but she had the feeling that she could trust Lars and Alfia. It's like they don't care about what she looked like. Alfia just attacked her because she was acting suspicious. And Lars just didn't see her as a monster. After all, he was a person that has seen tons of fiction. A harpy-looking siren is the least of his worries. What truly worries him, are humans and the gods having a nefarious purpose. Then let's go, lead us to the place. Alfia gestured at her to go. And she looked impatient. Gulping, Ray immediately saluted and she started flying. Alfia looked at Lars and he was still too slow. So she grabbed him by the scruff of his neck and ran after Ray. Ha, it is what it is. Lars just shrugged and he has long accepted that the plane called Alfia will drag him all oh hey or the place. Turning monsters into mincemeat left and right. Alfia just made a path for Ray. Their travel was smooth and Ray got excited at the thought of being led by Alfia. She's a level 7. Our strongest combatant is just a level 5. We'll be able to save the Xenos that are roaming around more easily. Ray thought. After about an hour of constant travel, they arrived in front of a wall. I can feel the draft inside. You better seal that better, more sensitive adventurers will definitely find this place. Alfia revealed immediately. Oh ah, uh, that's why we stayed here. The waterfalls around hides our sounds. And this place is far away from the entrance to the 28th floor. Ray explained. Good choice, but you won't be staying here for long anyways. Lars shrugged. Ray started to chirp and somebody opened up the entrance of the village. Ray Chi. Humans. A red lizardman that was wearing some armor looted from adventurer corpses immediately put his hands up. L.Y.D. They're friendly. Don't even try. She'll kill you with a single hit. Ray got deathly nervous for her friend. So noisy. Alfia got irritated and Lars patted her on the back. He just got startled is all, Alfia. Hello. I am Lars and this is Alfia. If I were you, you should listen to your friend. Lars said seriously. Lyd then looked at Alfia and he shuddered at the aura coming from the woman. His instincts were screaming at him. He'll be killed without even being able to do anything. Oh okay, I'll trust you as Ray Chi's guests. The lizardmen let them enter their village. So, how old are you guys? I don't really know how to check Azino's age. Lars broke the ice. We're both 14, there's a green dragon called Gryuu. But he's much older than us. There's also another leader figure called Gro, he's a gargoyle. Ray revealed. Oh, then you're kind of like fresh adults in human years. Lars continued conversing with them. They started to get a bit more comfortable with him. Hey, Lars Chi. What does the surface look like? Lyd asked him in curiosity. Don't know, I was born in the dungeon. Lars shrugged without a care in the world. Like they were hit by lightning, Alfia and the Xenos stared at him. Uh, don't stare at me so intensely. I'll melt and blush. Lars fidgeted around. What? You were born in the dungeon. Alfia blinked. But he was human, she was sure of it. Sure am, I don't know my parents. 
but when I gained consciousness, I was already in the 39th floor. Lars told the truth, technically. Wow. A human that doesn't know the surface. You're kind of like us. Ray chuckled. Yeah, but I'll be going there soon. I need to find a good familia to start leveling up. Lars shrugged. Eating magic stones and growing in strength is good and all, but he could feel it. A year was a long time. He was stagnating. The only person he used his skills against is Alfia. In a sense that wasn't bad, after all. He was turning into an anti-Alfia weapon. But he'll lack versatility against other people. Alfia's brutality is extremely hard to fend against. Yet there are sneaky bastards out there. Monsters with desperation moves. People with hidden weapons or curses. And if he gets caught in them in a pinch, he'll most likely get killed. Humans aren't infallible, Alfia included. Though she was next to impossible to kill. Magic doesn't work against her. The woman's martial prowess is insane. And her magic bypasses normal durability. It uses physics to deal damage. And physics is a bitch, even against magical beings. After they walked a bit, they were suddenly met with a green dragon. It had a white horn on its head and it was easily 10 meters long. 4 meters tall. An enhanced species for sure. It couldn't talk, but it snorted at Lars and Alfia. Though Alfia's magic didn't let its breath hit them. She then raised a brow at it and the green dragon stared at her for a few seconds. It then started trembling due to Alfia's pressure. A monster's instinct is incredible. And it felt her immense, tyrannical power. Gryuu, their friends. We'll be under their protection. We'll be moving to the 39th floor. Ray said with a smile. The dragon growled softly and it moved to the side. He says that we're thankful. Lyt translated and they nodded. Tell him to be silent, I don't like noisy things. Alfia gave the dragon a side eye and it nodded immediately. Why yeah, sure. They got scared by Alfia's domineering attitude. Don't be too harsh on them Alfia, they'll behave. Lars gave them a meaningful look and they nodded. Good. Because I dispatch those who are noisy. Alfia cracked her knuckles ominously. Humans. They heard a low voice. Ray and Lyd immediately frowned. Ray. Lyd. Why do you bring humans here? A gargoyle shouted at them. Alfia's face scrunched up and she was getting agitated. The neurotic woman was definitely at her limit. Shhh. Shhh. Stop being noisy Gro Chi. Lyd shouted silently. Ray then pointed at Alfia with immense urgency. How about you guys inform everyone first? So we won't have any happy accidents. Lars smiled wryly. Lyd then jumped towards Gro and covered his mouth. Shut up. She's insanely dangerous, and she doesn't like noise. You'll get us killed. Lyd grew maced. Gro looked at Alfia and her sour expression was clear to see. Her magic was leaking and the pressure emanating from her was immense. I. I understand. Gro whispered and they started talking about what happened. Truly. Gro looked at Lars and Alfia. Lars wasn't that strong looking, especially with his build and his aura. But Alfia was a whole different beast. Is he her son? Gro asked and Alfia's eyebrows twitched. Are you calling me old? Alfia glared daggers at him. Gro, who was proud of his scales that were stronger than steel, suddenly felt his torso almost explode. Alfia slugged him and he flew like a bullet, crashing through multiple trees. He was definitely not getting up. Ah I forgot, Alfia here is forever 18. Lars commented and she glared at him too. What? You look youthful, your skin is as smooth as a baby even without using lotions. Lars quickly gave some lip service. And it might not look like it, but Alfia is a vain woman. Humph, let's go. She was happy that he didn't seem to be lying. Why you re-amazing Lars, you can pacify her easily. Ray was sweating bullets. Shhh, she can hear you. Lars mouthed to her and she shut up immediately. After that, the Xenos informed the whole community to shut up or end up like Gro. And he was one of their strongest combatants. An estimated level 4 monster. Hi, I'm Fear A Harpy introduced herself to Lars and she had brown feathers. She was a bit different to Ray who was a siren, her legs were digiti grade. Wrong ye. An arachne just introduced herself succinctly. Pick. Oh, humans. I am Laura, does she perhaps have a lover? A blue-skinned Lamia asked Lars. 
pick. He kind of turned into their diplomat. As Alfia is calm around him. And he can converse with her normally, even trading slights against each other. Uh, one at a time please. Lars smiled wryly. He was then tackled by a girl with blue skin and green hair, a mermaid. Pick. Hello me Marie. She pointed at herself and she didn't have a cover for her chest. Uh, L-Y-D, Ray. Shouldn't you cover her chest? Humans find them attractive. Lars didn't have a libido yet. But he was sure he was going to remember this later. He also looked at Laura who didn't have anything to cover her large chest. Ron Yi quickly spooled some silk and made some makeshift clothes for them. Thanks for that. Lars gave her an appreciative nod. It was for them as well. She pointed out, still acting a bit cold. Which was unavoidable, as arachne silk is very valuable. And her kind was hunted down every chance humans got. They were also not aggressive towards her even though she is a Xenos. Anyways, we will be going to the 39th floor. We'll be making a town there. And you guys will retrieve all the Xenos you can find. Lars started to announce. I will be the guardian of the 39th floor, those who disagree, leave. Alfia announced with finality. She has no time to argue with ungrateful garbage. Lars was already giving them a chance to have a more free life. The 39th floor is massive. It was easily the same size of Orario. And they could make a dwelling there. It might not be the same as the surface that a lot of them craves. But it was better than hiding in a cramped village. The adventurers will also never accept them. Monsters still look like monsters even if they are harmless and meek. Humans work like that. Even their own race gets discriminated on just because of color and ethnicity. What more of a non-human? By creating a fortress that is made by monsters, they will be forced to accept them as a group that just lives there. Though they need to be strong enough to match the top familias. Something that they don't have right now, strength. Everyone got excited, but they refrained themselves due to Alfia. Let's move. Alfia announced and the monsters started packing their meager belongings. But Alfia suddenly heard a commotion. A stampede of epic proportions. A monster parade. Alfia whispered and Lars could infer what it meant. Someone is trying to lure monsters. Lars knew of it from playing RPGs. That was the most efficient way of farming monsters. But this was real life. And people's lives are on the line. They don't have infinite stamina like game characters that just need to chug potions infinitely to never run out of mana. Basically, yes. And it's really big. Alfia could feel the vibrations. Thousands of monsters were moving. The weaker Xenos also started to growl. Alfia and Lars noticed it. Lyd, Ray, and Gro gasped when they smelled it. Something that only monsters react to. That accursed powder. It makes us go berserk. Lyd explained. Luring powder, someone is most likely trying to kill people in droves. Alfia frowned. It was a tactic of unsavory bastards. Lure a ton of monsters to a group and let them get killed by them. They will then loot everything once both groups have suffered immense damage. But at this scale? Something weird is definitely happening. Let's go, everyone stay here. Lars looked at the Xenos and their leaders started to pacify those who are affected. Lars. Marie tugged on his shirt and she took a knife from a goblin. Lyd understood her intentions and he fetched a container. Marie then cut her arm and collected her blood. Mermaids have regenerative properties. She's giving it to you as a gift. Alfia explained to him. Oh oh. Really? Thank you very much Marie. Lars immediately drank it and he licked her wound clean. I can gain traits of monsters by consuming them. Lars expounded as he saw the confused expressions of the Xenos. Whoa, that's... Overpowered. Ray commented and the others nodded. Alfia puffed her chest in pride, after all. She's a part of the reason he found out about it. The duo then went outside and when they opened up the rock that acted as a gate, they were assaulted by the scent of blood. There was a sea of monsters around. And dozens, no. Hundreds of adventurers were being sieged by them. T this. This is terrible. Lars almost puked when he saw the bloodshed. Adventurers were getting ripped apart. And it was like a goddamned war of extermination. Unpleasant and noisy. Alfia furrowed her brows. Are you going to intervene? Lars understood her circumstances. It would be a pain in the ass to reveal herself. And he also didn't want the top familias to investigate them. After all, 
their relatively peaceful lives will be in jeopardy. How about you, what's your move? Alfia asked him. Me? I'm just a normal guy. Alfia snorted at his answer. He was anything, but normal. I'm only human, I get scared. Those monsters are going to kill me easily. Lars knows his limits. Alfia beat it into him. But I can't just watch. I'm conflicted. Lars thought of something, anything to help them. But as long as Alfia doesn't want to help, he'll respect her wishes. He wasn't an idiot that just dives into danger. Then what will you do? Just watch. Alfia watched on in interest at what he'll do. Can I ask of you to extricate me when I get in a pinch? Lars felt a bit brave. Marie just gave him regenerative powers. And how will he test his limits if it was in a controlled environment all the time? His soul was burning, his golden eyes glowed as an irregularity formed in his unique soul. Mortals are said to unlock their skills instead of gaining them. And his back glowed, a symbol of a peacock that had six feathers pointed around in a circle. The very first feather formed another symbol. A symbol of a pig engorging itself. Superbia, the cardinal sin. Marking his soul as an arrogant mortal that declares the gods to be sinners. Gula, the deadly sin of gluttony. As he feeds endlessly on the essence of monsters. His skin turned into red scales and his teeth went as sharp as daggers. Breathing in deeply, he released a beam of pure heat towards the horde of monsters. Chapter 8, A Feast Enhancing his body to the limits, Lars jumped into the fray. Distracting the monsters that were like a sea. Come at me. He started tearing them apart. Sharp and decisive. His clawed hands pierced through a monster's chest as he tore its magic stone out. He then crunched on it like candy. The adventurers were shocked by the sudden beam of fire. Only a handful of adventurers has fought the Cadmus or Valgong dragons. And it came from just a little palum who was armored with dragon scales. Or so they thought, but Lars was just a kid that's covered in multiple layers of scales. Forming the more flexible scales of a lizardman over his skin. While the scales of the Cadmus dragon gave him an armored shell. Lars went on a rampage as his eyes glowed. Fight. Charge with everything you've got. A first-class adventurer shouted loudly. Battles only need a single slip up. And the distraction that Lars did gave them an opportunity to counter-attack. There were dozens of upper-class adventurers in the mix. And they started to make a wall to push back. Lars also created a massive shift by being in the monster's ranks. He wasn't swift as top-class adventurers, but he was small and nimble. Spines appeared on his back to protect him as a crimson swallow tried to snipe him. It got stabbed by his poisonous spines and it gave his back a layer of protection. Blue sea urchins with sharp spines spun and tore through monsters. Its trajectory was aimed right at him. Breathing in deeply, Lars released a torrent of flames in front of him. Roasting monsters aplenty. He saw a mermaid and he didn't waste any time. Lars jumped right towards it and he bit off its neck. Blood spurted and he drank it all greedily like a parched man in a desert. A group of blue crabs that were as tall as average people tried to snip at him with its crushing claws. He quickly pushed away the mermaid towards the claws and it snipped the monster in half. It was a fiesta, he was surrounded at all sides. Yet he grinned viciously. His dagger-like teeth shone and Lars roared. This is what I prepared for. Hordes of aquatic monsters, insects and scaled creatures stared at him hatefully. Berserk due to the luring powder, they charged at him in droves. Harpies launched a barrage of feathers at him that could pierce normal steel. He ignored them and let his scales intercept the attacks. Sparks went to life as they bounced off of his brilliant, red scales. A group of large fish then started charging at him with its stone carapace. He immediately dropped to the ground and the large fish monsters tore through groups of monsters with its violent charge. A mammoth roared and it tried to stomp on him. He flexed his back and the spines he formed were launched like bullets. The spines tore through its belly and it howled in pain. He quickly jumped towards its abdomen and Lars used his claws as a spear. Grabbing the magic stone inside of it, he quickly scuttled around to avoid the monsters that want to grab him. Alfia's first lesson, never stay still. He dodged and weaved. Looking for places to avoid. Of course, it's not enough. He is still considered to be a mid-class level too. Ugh. He got stung by a deadly hornet. It was approximately a meter in length, and its stinger was a foot long. His scales got pierced by a few inches, and its stinger hit him on the back. Poisoned, he could feel the burning pain encroach all over his body. With a quick grab, 
he squeezed its thorax in rage and he tore through its carapace with his mouth. He was then hit by a barrage of beams made of light. Purple crystals that weep floating in the air sniping him. Ha, ha, fuck. These bastards are fucking annoying. His back started to glow red. And the second feather showed a symbol of a lion. A horse monster with blue fur and a blue mane charged at him stomping over its allies. When it arrived towards him, he grabbed its hooves and he kicked its knees. Neighing in rage, the Kelpie thrashed around violently. He went jumped on its back while it was injured and he pulled on the horse's mane. Lars bit on its neck and severed its spine. Ending its existence in one fell swoop. His scales started to get thicker, his claws, larger. Lars was growing and he was now at least as tall as an average man. With a sigh, steam escaped from his mouth and his body was producing energy like a reactor. Die. I'll kill all of you. Lars released a beam of pure heat from his mouth. A group of mermen were hit by it and they burned to ashes. He quickly picked the spears they wielded and he stabbed anything that was in front of him in a frenzy. Gun libellulas, dragonflies that fire projectiles from its abdomen released a barrage. Harpies and light quartz blasted him with feathers and beams of light. Igiwazu, crashed onto him with suicide attacks. An onslaught of monster-shaped bullets suiciding to kill him. His scales peeled off and some even shattered upon the great stress he received. But the more they damaged, him. The stronger he became. Magic started to bounce off of him, poison from dark fungus releasing their spores didn't work on him. His resistances were rising and his rage increased. Bathing in blood of monsters, he used the spear of the merman he looted that long since got broken as a club. A clash of flesh and claws, bones crunched at his every swing. Blood spurted whenever he slashed with his hands. The crimson liquid that dropped to the ground started gathering towards him. And his body was absorbing blood to heal itself. Come here and die. I'll tear you apart. He roared as he continued his rampage behind enemy lines. Magic resistant obsidian formed over his scales. Spines grew on his back and they launched themselves over and over. He was like a chimera that was a legendary monster, capable of causing mass destruction. Fire escaped from his mouth and their blood fueled his abilities. A tail sprouted on his lower back and spikes of obsidian formed all over it. Alpheus' second lesson, his whole body is a weapon if he wills it. Kicks, punches, headbutts, tail sweeps. A flurry of blows were released towards the monsters. Her third lesson. Every strike should have meaning. Lars targeted the most vulnerable monster parts. If he could help it, he'll tear off their magic stones so they would disappear as wisps of smoke. Alpheus' brutal effectiveness in combat transferred over to him. He was like a raging storm of magic and physical combat. But they were too many, every time he killed one. Two more would appear. And every attack he blocked or parried, his body will be hit by numerous more. Fatigue started to set in and his mind drained faster and faster. They were relentless, mindless, with a single objective in mind. Kill anything on their way. The adventurers were also getting exhausted. And Lars' distraction sadly did not bear fruit. As both the entrance to the floors below and above were crowded with monsters. And they're too drained, too tired to continue resisting. It also didn't help that the people who lured the monsters to begin this nightmare were intent on killing as many people as possible. And they were also dying in droves. So they were at least taking down some monsters with them. But it didn't make a dent on the hordes of monsters intent on killing everyone. Where the hell is the executives of the top familias? Where's the backup? Lars gritted his teeth. He was assaulted by an intense headache and it was the signs of Mind Zero. Her last lesson, fight like you don't have mana. Or you'll be caught with your pants down. Lars stood his ground. Even without mana, he continued his assault by using his body to the limit. Relying on his body that began to shrink once again. He buffed his time and he took magic stones from his inventory to chomp on them. Every chance he got. He ate a handful of magic stones and fought fiercely once again. It was a battle that a masochistic battle junkie wouldn't want. The odds were stacked against him, yet he continued until he had strength. Spotting a weapon on the ground, he picked up a sword that belonged to an upper-class adventurer. It gave him an advantage as it tore through the monsters with ease. He grinned as he started looking for more. And he managed to grab a spear that was stabbed on the ground. With a spear on his offhand, and a sword on his mane. He stabbed and slashed monsters all around him. And due to the pinch he was experiencing, he developed a brand new technique while his hands were occupied. He took out items from his inventory and it appeared right in front of his mouth. 
funneling magic stones as he stuffed his gullet, he was healing and recovering mind at a tremendous rate. The symbol of Gula on his back glowed and he felt a tremendous hunger. Biting the enemies that got too close, he regained his strength at every bite that he savored. With a roar, Lars charged in with renewed vigor. Using the spear and sword he plundered, everything that was under level 4 got killed. I have taught him well. It's also a good thing that he trains hard. Alfia nodded in satisfaction while watching him mow down the monsters. A green dragon roared back at him and he met his match. Green dragons were approximately level 4. This isn't good. He was surrounded. Monsters were rampaging at his rear. And the sides of the green dragon have hordes of other monsters. His only way out was through above, but he can't fly. At least not yet. With a growl, the dragon resisted the luring powder a bit. It was still aggressive as hell due to it though. And the monster opened up with a breath attack. Shit. Lars put his arms in front as obsidian formed from his little limbs. A shield of magic resistant rock was the only thing keeping him from being roasted by the hot flames of the dragon. Dying screams resounded behind him as monsters were burned to ashes. Hold. He planted his makeshift shield on the ground, gritting his teeth. Pieces of it flew away from the concussive force of the magic breath and his skin blistered due to the heat. His legs started burning and he formed scales on them as his shield fractured. But when the only thing being covered left was his torso and head, it stopped. Smoldering, his shield dropped to the ground and he was smoking. Ha, ha, you fucker. That hurt, a lot. His golden eyes glowed brightly as his mana surged. Let me return the favor. Lars roared as an orange beam of concentrated fire hit the dragon's face. It was sent reeling and the full force of the breath crashed onto its chest. Howling in pain, the green dragon's emerald scales on its chest were gone as its ribcage showed. Lars coughed and steam escaped from his mouth. He kneeled on the ground and he was almost at his true limit. Ha, ha, she's watching over me. This is a battle to prove that everything she did had a purpose. Lars shakily stood up as he wielded a half-melted spear and a chipped sword. I'm no hero, just a human still. He brandished his weapons. We are weak. Fragile. But humans have ruled the earth for thousands of years. Lars charged as his scales fell off of his skin. The green dragon roared in rage and it tried swiping him with its arm. He leaped into the air, just a small child that wanted to save as many people as possible. The half-melted spear on his left hand stabbed through its eye and he held on. Lars felt his shoulder dislocate due to the dragon thrashing. Yet he gritted his teeth and kept his grip. Our potential is limitless. The chip sword on his right hand stabbed through the dragon's neck and it snapped due to the stress. The dragon slammed its face on the ground and Lars coughed up blood as he got smashed. Yet his hold on the shaft of the spear held true. His bones broke into smithereens, his ribs fractured. Lars' golden eyes continued to glow brightly as he gritted his teeth. Alfia bit her nails in anxiety as she watched him enter mortal combat against a level 4 dragon. It was basically suicide, even Alfia wouldn't be able to do it when she was just a mid-level 2. And she has monstrous talent that was godlike. The dragon who considered him its mortal enemy rolled its neck and his joint popped off from his shoulder fully. Flopping around, his eyes widened and Alfia also moved as she broke the sound barrier. His arm got chomped by the green dragon who was fighting with ferocity. Like a candle that was about to burn brightly before being snuffed out. Hat. Lars scoffed and Alfia's breath hitched as she stopped in midair, noticing that he wasn't done. Humans are born with nothing. Yet we conquer everything. Lars swallowed a bunch of magic stones. The strong try to exterminate us, but you can't snuff us out. Lars' throat started to burn a bright crimson. Flames leaked out of his mouth as he gave a twisted grin. We grow beyond the impossible because we know we are weak. He roared and a bright flash blinded everyone near him. A beam tore through the green dragon's eyes and made its brain flash boil. Like a pressure cooker, its skull contained the steam and it exploded. And with that knowledge, we can become anything. Now come at me, monsters. I will tear you apart. Lars lost his arm, his skin burned off at multiple places. His legs a crisp due to the breath of the dragon. Yet he soldiered on as the symbol of a peacock shone brightly on his back. Lars' pride refused to yield. His desire to surpass the gods so he won't live as a puppet made his soul burn with the intensity of a star. Chapter 9, The Nightmare Ends While Lars fought tooth and nail members of Evil Us that caused the monster parade lost their blessings. The emblems on their backs melting. Their fauna disappearing. 
alongside their strength and power. Numerous adventurers kept on dying left and right. Alfia who was observing with awe as she saw Lars fought like a brilliant flame wondered. What are heroes? Those who fight evil. Those who overcome overwhelming odds. Mighty people that become the hope of many. She didn't know the answer. But she felt it, if he was allowed to grow. To become strong and be with them when they fought the terrible dragon. He would burn brightly like a shooting star and take the dragon with him. Alfia looked around and she was the only one who noticed it. The birth of a hero, a symbol that fights for his principles. A being that makes the impossible, possible. Break the unbreakable, touch the untouchable. Shatter their destinies to reach the unreachable. Silence. Alfia whispered and the whole 27th floor went quiet. Gospel. She raised her hand and her tyrannical magic made everyone kneel down. Lugio. She clenched her hand and an earth-shattering shockwave flattened every monster and evil us member in sight. The dungeon trembled and even Orario shook due to her awesome might. Alfia quickly extricated Lars who was still fighting while unconscious. His eyes were already hollow. Yet the sin of Superbia refused to yield as he fought, even if he couldn't anymore. You did well. Alfia whispered as she saw his actions save dozens upon dozens of adventurers. She then disappeared as she returned to the hidden village of the Xenos. Underscore underscore Orario, earlier underscore underscore. As for the reason why the top familias weren't helping. Finn, a blonde palum. A race that looked like children, noticed something awry. The familias in Orario has been hunting down the members of Evilus. And the Loki familia, Finn's familia were especially active in destroying them. Cooperating with other top familias like the Ganesha and Freya familia. The guild, something akin to the governing body in Orario also provided them any information that adventurers report. Currently, the executives of the Loki familia were having a meeting. We're investigating the familias that are suspected to be with Evilus. And the Hermes familia has given us enough proof for it. Finn laid down a map of Orario. A green-haired elf then gave him some pins and Finn started putting them down. Pick. According to the guild and Hermes, there are major familias that are aligned with Evilus. Finn looked at the map seriously. Electo familia. Who have two level fives with amazing teamwork. Finn gave them some information about the captain and vice-captain of the familia. They were a pair of elves, a white one and a dark one. Looking about fourteen or fifteen. Childish and with twin pigtails to match their bodies. But they weren't fooled, the sisters were sadistic, sick bastards that take great pleasure in torturing and killing people. The two perhaps have the highest body count in Orario. Against adventurers and civilians alike. They have a few more level fours. The Electo Familia are definitely the strongest in Evilus. A dwarf frowned heavily. We might be level six, but we just turned into level six. Gareth, Finn, we should be careful against them. The elf said seriously. Yeah, my thumb is actually hurting when I think about fighting them, Riveria. Finn held his thumb. He always had good instincts. And all the members of the familia knew to trust it. Because it was always right. How about the Apate familia? Gareth pointed at another pin on the map. There were several pins. And they were scattered throughout Orario. Which is the correct choice to be made. After all, bunching up would get them found out faster and a full-on siege against them won't end well for them. As Orario's top familias have level SIXS. The Freya familia that rivaled Loki's also has a level 7. Their captain that Alfia's friend sacrificed himself to. The Apate familia is a bit weaker than the Electo familia. But they also have level 5s. And multiple level 4s. Finn bit his nails. Getting rid of them will be akin to an all-out war in Orario. And first-class adventurers fighting will cause massive collateral damage. Don't overthink, Finn. The Ganesha Familia will also work with us. Their captain just turned level 5. A red-haired woman opened her eyes. Pick. Shakti. Bless her sister's soul. Riveria prayed for the woman's sister that was assassinated by Evilus. Using a little girl to stab her with a cursed knife through the chest. And I don't like it, but that whore's Familia is also going to be with us. Loki squinted her small eyes. The Freya Familia. Otter, the newest level 7 will be a great help indeed. Gareth nodded. But would they cooperate with each other? Finn raised a brow. Humph, that Onahol's Familia might be filled with her simps and white knights. But they are capable, even if they have bad teamwork. Loki huffed. 
the executives smiled wryly at their goddess foul mouth. She sure has them wrapped up on her fingers. They want nothing, except to please her. Finn shook his head wistfully. Enough about them, what's important is they'll be acting. Riveria put a curtain over the Freya Familia issue. She then looked at Loki and the trickster goddess pointed at the Electo Familia. They are going to be taking care of the Electo Familia. Their captain insisted. Loki shrugged. If they want to take on the strongest familia of Evilus, then so be it. Loki thought that it would be better for them. How about the Ganesha familia? Gareth asked what the other group will do. They'll be taking on the miscellaneous familias around Orario. They have more members than us and Freya familia. Finn divided their forces. Smart, they also only have Shakti as a level 5. They'll get killed by the Apate familia. Riveria nodded at him. So they'll divide and conquer Hui? There are approximately nine familias as targets. It would be much better for them to take care of them. Gareth also agreed. Yes, so we will be going to the Apate familia. Finn decided and he was about to inform their allies. When somebody wearing a guild official's uniform suddenly busted in through the door. Huffing and puffing, the guild employee was sweating bullets. Oi, we're having an important meeting over here. Loki clicked her tongue in annoyance. Loki, he must have something important to say. Riveria sighed at their goddess being unreasonable. T that's right. It's terrible. The guild official kneeled down as he ran all the way to the Loki familia's manor. Out with it then. Loki tapped her fingers on her arms as she crossed them. Give him some time to catch his breath, Loki. Finn rolled his eyes. T the 27th floor. There's a gigantic monster parade in the 27th floor. The man shouted and they froze. A large force of Evilus was sighted by the guild in the dungeon. The guild's answer to that, was to post a mission on the guild's bulletin. Hiring any able-bodied adventurer to hunt them down. In exchange for a wealthy reward of course. Evilus has caused too much damage. And the guild wanted them exterminated. So, a lot of adventurers signed up for it. We're only able to know this due to an adventurer that escaped. He said that there was a strong palum that distracted the monsters. He finished his report and flopped down. A palum you say? Finn raised a brow and he thought of meeting this person. But he quickly shook his head. They have a major problem to solve right now. The 27th floor has monsters that are approximately level 2 and 3. There's also the green dragon in the great tree labyrinth in the 24th floor that are level 4s. And the thing with the dungeon is, adventurers don't die due to the strong monsters. It happens, yes. But they are prepared there are guides to what spawns in the dungeon. Irregulars and accidents don't happen all the time. What truly kills most people is exhaustion, fighting for hours and hours on end. Wave after wave of monsters that are ready to kill you at a moment's notice. Supplies are limited, weapons need to be maintained. And after you are exhausted, the dungeon surprises adventurers with an unlucky spawn. Perhaps one or two more monsters appear and the team can't handle them. Or a strong monster appears. And a monster parade combines all of that in practically an instant. A tsunami of monsters coming in from all sides. Even the top executives of the stronger familias in Orario won't be able to survive that. Then we should go and give them some support. I don't know this Palum, but he is relatively unknown. So he must be a level 2 or 3. Gareth stood up. Gareth. My thumb is hurting like crazy. Finn held his thumb. Are you saying this is a trap? Riveria raised a brow. That may be so, but hundreds of adventurers will die in the 27th floor if they don't help them. I'm not saying to abandon them Riveria. We should strike while the iron is hot. Finn said seriously and they gasped. You want to send back their gods to remove their fauna? Riveria was speechless. Yes. It's a golden opportunity. And I have a feeling that the stronger members of Evil Us will strike once we exhaust ourselves. Finn furrowed his brows. Then we strike. Gareth frowned heavily. He didn't want to let the adventurers in the 27th floor die. But their sacrifices wouldn't be in vain. It was all for the greater good. Let's go, Loki. Please send a messenger to the Ganesha and Freya Familia. We'll be attacking now. Finn requested of her. I, I quite like this plan of yours. Loki grinned at him. Today, evil us shall be no more. Finn took hold of his spear. Underscore underscore Zeno's hidden village underscore underscore. 
Lars who was taken by Alfea suddenly lost consciousness when his mind and body deemed himself safe. Who can attack him? When he's under the strongest person in the world's protection. Lars. You crazy fool. Alfea furrowed her brows. She looked at his left arm that was just now a stump. It wasn't bleeding due to his regeneration, thanks to Marie's blood. But he lost a whole arm and his legs were in terrible condition. How can he fight in that condition? Alfea wondered. She then took a look at his back, seeing three symbols. In the middle of his back was a golden peacock. Six feathers fanned out around it. And the other two symbols were a pig and a lion. What does this mean? Is this his skill? It's like his behavior suddenly changed. Alfea noticed it. When his back glowed, his attitude changed. And he gained some sort of ability or power up. Foolish boy, fighting a green dragon without a fauna. Alfea frowned as she looked at him softly. You'll give me a heart attack. She hugged his broken body firmly. When Alfea returned to the hideout of the Xenos, they were welcomed back by Lyd, Gro, and Ray. The three gasped when they saw his body. Lars Chi. What happened to him Miss Alfea? Lyd was flabbergasted. Ray put her wing above her mouth as she teared up at the sight. Lars. Marie who popped up from the side crawled towards him. She then took a knife from Lyd and she bathed him with her blood. But it had minimal effects, the damage was too much. Dozens of bones of his were fractured. Burns were scattered all over his body. Cuts and contusions from the hordes of monsters attacking him accrued everywhere. Did he fight the monster parade? Gro couldn't believe it. Just a child without even fauna, fighting. Stop being noisy, Lars fought and that's the gist of it. We move towards the 39th floor now so he can rest. Alfea stood tall and she was in a bad mood. The Xenos nodded immediately. They had no doubts that the earthquake earlier was her doing. Because after that, everything went quiet. So, they quickly made their way to the 39th floor, stealthily. Chapter 10, City of Monsters A sizable group of Xenos were making their way towards the 39th floor of the dungeon. Gro was carrying Marie while Lyd gave her some water from time to time so she won't dry out. Ray was scouting the surroundings in the air. And Grihua was escorting the group from behind. The vanguard though. They did not need to worry about a thing. In front of Alfea, a stegosaurus-looking monster that had blood-red skin spawned and it charged at them. But it suddenly exploded into pieces as Alfea raised her hand. Noisy piece of trash. She clicked her tongue in annoyance. The neurotic and violent woman was getting madder by the second. Monsters kept on screeching and their noise irked her to no end. She also wanted to lay down Lars on a bed immediately. He was regenerating slowly, his healing wasn't really comparable to a mermaid's. But what's important was he was healing. And he is alive. Nobody knew how Alfea would react if say, he was dying. Slowly, but surely making their way. With Alfea in the front, they made it to the 37th floor of the dungeon. And the monster wrecks of the floor spawned. Just like the skeleton warriors called Spartoi in the floor. It was a skeleton as well, but it was easily 15 meters tall. Even though it didn't have legs and is just floating around. Alfea then handed Lars to Lyd. W we can help. Ray offered. You just protect him. Got it. Alfea gave them a meaningful look. The Xenos immediately nodded, knowing that she'll gut them if he gets harmed. Alfea then stood in front of the boss, Udias. It suddenly took out a massive, black sword. Udias swung its blade at her and she used her magic. Gospel. The blade suddenly stopped in the air. Like all of the kinetic energy of the swing just simply disappeared. She then disappeared from her place and reappeared in front of the monster's face. Humph. With a grunt, she kicked its head and its skull shattered into a thousand pieces. The Xenos watched in awe as a human showed them what overwhelming might means. T that's the monster Rex of the 37th floor right? Isn't that a high level 6? It will slaughter all of us. Lyd was flabbergasted. She took it down with a single hit. Girl looked pensive. You, carry this magic stone and sword. Alfea pointed at Ranyi. Her abdomen could be used as a pack horse after all. Why yes ma'am. The Arachne immediately used her webs to get them and they continued onwards to the 39th floor. And when the group arrived, they saw nothing but forest. Ray flew around as she liked the wide space there. Alfea then left them behind to go to their small house with a garden in front. You stupid boy. 
Alfia put him down on his bed made of leaves and moss. TCH, I should have stepped in earlier. Alfia clicked her tongue in regret. But he'll resent me for doing so. It was his time to use everything he learned from me. Alfia was conflicted. She then thought if she would be like this with her nephew, Bell. And even though she wants to gouge his eyes out due to it being the same as his father's. She still considered him as Meteria's most beloved treasure. She died in order to give birth to him. I should at least make some progress with the Xenos while he recovers. It's what he would want. Alfia sighed. So she went outside and the Xenos who were looking around suddenly straightened up. Listen, all of you. Lars decided to take you here to the 39th floor in order to build a true village. Alfia crossed her arms. The Xenos listened intently and they were grateful for that. I do not know what his plans are for all of you. But he is a kind child. Alfia closed her eyes and she put pressure on them. Under her, the ground cracked due to her ridiculous amount of mana. Betray him, and you will never be able to reincarnate. Alfia squinted her eyes and they sweated heavily. Yes ma'am. Everybody shouted immediately. It is good you understand, now. I want all of you to start making dwellings. And take as much edible food as possible. You will plow the soil near the river and make a farm. Your weaker kin will need food, that's what a community means. Alfia barked orders. And the stronger ones, kill as many monsters in the Colosseum in the 37th floor. Magic stones will be fed to all of you to make you stronger. Is that clear? She wanted to turn them into capable soldiers. Everyone nodded. Grow, Lyd, and Ray then looked at each other. Agreeing that they should go to the Colosseum to farm magic stones. The second rates with me, we will go and retrieve the other Xenos. A decent expedition party will result in your extermination, you need more numbers. Alfia ordered and she started walking back to the entrance to the 38th floor. Every Xenos who were level 3 and 4 immediately followed her so they could recruit more Xenos. W. Weary going to make a city. Lyd realized. Gro, Gryu, and Ray then nodded slowly. Do you think that Lars will bring us to the surface? Ray questioned. Bah, we should just stay here. Being in contact with humans will just endanger us. Gro did not want to interact with humans. Growl. You don't make that decision, Ms. Alfia and Lars does. Gryu snorted. Gro got embarrassed at that and Lyd remembered something. But how will our benefactor know about this? I forgot about informing them. Lyd took out a magic item. It was a crystal ball and Ray immediately grabbed his arm. Let Ms. Alfia know of this first. Or Lars when he wakes up. We don't know if they would like this. Ray looked at him seriously. Why you rewrite? Thanks for stopping me. Lyd scratched his head sheepishly. Come on then. Let us go back to the 37th floor and get as many magic stones as possible. Gro urged them to go. His eyes also burned with determination. It didn't feel good to be protected by humans. Especially when Alfia takes Lars' decision seriously. And he didn't even have a fauna. Ms. Alfia is correct. We need to grow stronger for the weaker children. Lyd nodded at them. The trio then made their way towards the Colosseum in the 37th floor. Underscore underscore few hours later underscore underscore. Ugh, fuck. Lars woke up and he has a searing headache. Phantom pain also assaulted his left arm. He slowly opened his eyes. An unfamiliar ceiling. Just kidding, this is my house. Lars thought that Alfia brought him back. Lars remembered what happened and he frowned when he checked that his arm really was gone. My leg. Lars couldn't feel his legs as they got too damaged by the breath of the green dragon. What got into me? I didn't back off, even when the odds were against me. Lars rubbed his head due to his headache. That's for later, ugh. My head is killing me. Lars started eating magic stones to recover his mind. He slowly stood up, his legs were busted. But thankfully, he could still walk. Making his way outside, he saw that the Xenos were building houses by using the dungeon's lumber. Goblins were doing the farming while the hobgoblins made standard log cabins. Lars Chi. You're awake, wait. Can you even walk in that condition? Lyd who has returned with his team to rest saw him. I'm fine Lyd. Lars waved his concern off and the lizardman thought he knew his body best. Here, Lars. Marie insisted in giving these to you. Ray gave him some vials of her blood. She didn't need to. But I will gratefully accept. 
Lars started drinking them and he felt a lot better after doing so. Supplementing his regeneration with mermaid's blood that can even reattach limbs. His skin started to peel off and raw, pink skin began to grow. The muscles on his legs also repaired themselves faster. I can breathe much easier now. Lars sighed in relief as his hurting ribs that were fractured started to fuse again. You're crazy, Lars. You fought monsters without a fauna. Grohl looked at him incredulously. Well, something just made me do it. Haha. <laughs> he laughed awkwardly. They also don't know about my special skill I guess. But I think it changed. Lars suspected. Miss Alfia must be on her way back, they gathered all the hidden villages of the Xenos. Lyd explained to him as Lars seemed to be looking for something, or someone. Eh, thanks for telling me. I'll go on and rest for now. Lars went back to his house after waving goodbye. Taking a wooden bowl, Lars took a seat on the dining table. Growing boys need to eat. He put his hand above the bowl. He then took out magic stones like it was some kind of cereal. Now, I just need some milk. Wait, does that female foam war I saw earlier produce milk? Better ask later. Lars thought that eating some magic stone cereal without milk is unacceptable. Now. Why did I suddenly gain new abilities? And what are they? Lars tried to remember his battle. One of his new abilities increased his size and aggression like crazy. His physical and magic resistance also skyrocketed. It was like all of my specs continued to grow, the more damage I took. Lars hummed in thought. He then wondered if it was the thing that made him keep going too. Not really knowing what was on his back. But as he ate the magic stones like it was Captain Crunch, he heard a commotion outside. Hmm? Is Alfia back? Lars looked outside and he locked eyes with her mismatched eyes. Shit, she's pissed. Lars waved awkwardly and he almost had a heart attack when Alfia appeared in front of him suddenly. Jesus. Woman. You oughta approach people more carefully. Lars caught his breath. You. You are too reckless. Alfia glared at him and she started giving him a nuji. Ow. Ow. You gorilla woman. It hurts. My skull has a fracture you know. He cried out in pain. Shut up and accept it without resisting. Alfia kept at it, turning it into his punishment. After a minute, she stopped and he was tearing up due to the pain. All in all, we recruited three more hidden villages. We're approximately in the 150s. Alfia thought that was a logical number. Their hidden villages aren't really that big. And it was located in the higher floors as well. So the floors weren't that big. Unlike in the 39th floor which is as large as Orario. Maybe even bigger. You won't be pulling something like that again for some time. Alfia looked at him with annoyance. She stared at his arm and winced. My arm. I think it'll grow back, just like a lizard. Lars remembered the lizardman he ate back then. And not to mention that he also consumed Marie's blood. Which was like the best wine he ever tasted. You need more training. There were a lot of things you should have avoided. Like the swarm of Igiwazu. Alfia squinted her eyes. Ah ha ha. I'm still a bit too slow. Lars thought she was being unreasonable. And your little stunt with the green dragon. Magic and ranged attacks like that should be dodged, not blocked. She started giving him a lesson. Though, he thought that she just cared for his safety. Not holding it against her. Thanks for the tips, Alfia. I would have died at the very next floor I walked to without you. He didn't exaggerate. She blinked in surprise. Humph, it's good that you know. Alfia had a small smile on her face. And aren't you forgetting something? Alfia raised a brow. He was stumped, as far as he knew. There was nothing that he forgot. I should have been more careful. He started guessing and she just stared at him. Sorry for being reckless. He looked at her sheepishly as she just stood there, menacingly. No, foolish boy. Welcome back. Alfia's expression softened and he blinked in surprise. She looked so vulnerable, so. Normal in that moment. Like a next door big sister that worried about him. I'm back home, Alfia. He hugged her and this time, she was the one that got surprised. Alfia might be human, but she doesn't like people touching her at all. Just like elves in that regard. Even elf royalty doesn't have anything on Alfia's love of personal space. She'd kill anyone who would violate it. Welcome home, Lars. She hugged him back. Her words and actions, 
surprising even herself. I have grown softer. But maybe it isn't so bad. Alfia had a soft smile on her face as she closed her eyes. Chapter 11, Recovering After talking with Alfia, Lars slept. His exhaustion needed good, old-fashioned rest and sleep. The next day, the Xenos gathered and it seemed they they still voted for Lyd, Gro, and Ray to be their leaders. They were intelligent monsters, but monsters nonetheless. And strength's importance was at their very essence. Lars Chi, I heard that people name their cities. What shall we name ours? Lyd asked him with excitement. His tail was wagging from left to right. And he was actually raising some dust. Lyd, stop your tail from going crazy. Ray coughed from the dust. Ah, sorry about that. Lyd stopped and Gro snorted with a small smile on his face. It's a very human tradition, but I don't mind. Gro was being a Tsundera and Lars looked at him weirdly. A Tsundera gargoyle. It doesn't look cute at all. Lars deadpanned at the gargoyle. Well, how about we keep it simple? Lars rubbed his chin in thought. Monstro, it rolls of the tongue. And in an archaic language, it means monster. A city of monsters. Lars shrugged. Monstro. The Xenos started whispering to each other. And it was a place that they could call home. Their very own community that won't hide against other people. Monstro hey? I like it. Ray smiled and Lyd nodded. Gro then nodded. He embraces his nature as a monster. And it wasn't some fancy name that humans like. So, Lars. What do we do next? Ranyi tilted her head in question. First, we abuse the hell out of the dungeon's tendency to regenerate. Lars pointed at the farmlands they made. And the crops they planted were already ready to be harvested. But even if we hoard them, won't they just get spoiled? Ranyi raised a point. That's a really good question. Lars smiled at her and he took out one of his favorites, the square tomato. TCH, this would be really good with some mozzarella, olive oil, salt, and pepper. He thought of useless things before he gave it to her. But the Xenos just had questioning gazes. That has been harvested months ago. Lars smiled and they were shocked. What? But that's impossible, Lars Chi. That fruit just lasts for a couple of days at most. Lyd recognized it. Ranyi then bit into it and it was still juicy as hell. Like it was just picked from the vine. This is as fresh as it can be. Ranyi was confused and she even thought he was lying. I have a separate space that can store things. And guess what? Time doesn't flow there. He had a grin on his face. Everyone was shocked except Alfia who thought that Lars will be the ultimate supporter. And he doesn't even want payment you just pay him in goods through drops and magic stones. And even if I'm not here, nobody will starve due to the regeneration of the dungeon. Lars pointed once again at their farm. But what about our task of getting as many magic stones in the Colosseum? Gro raised his hand. That hey. He looked at Alfia and she shrugged, basically saying he think of a reason himself. Taxes. Lars' face suddenly went stone cold and the Xenos didn't understand. It's the equivalent of a tribute. This is our place after all. And Alfia will be protecting you guys from unforeseen invaders. Lars explained patiently. Not until I speedrun this dungeon and get as much EXP as possible though. Lars squinted his eyes and a yellow light almost formed on his back. A faint symbol of a toad formed on his back, but it disappeared, for now. Oh, smart. So you'll be like our storage for emergencies? And there will be tons of food that won't go bad. Ray nodded at his genius. Yes, we can also store a lot more than that. For example, I can buy armor and weapons from the surface. Lars smirked. The Xenos started whispering and that would be a game changer. Monsters are already a struggle to fight with natural weapons and armor. What if they wield and equip armors and weapons made by the smiths of Orario? They will basically be unstoppable, it's insane how much stronger they will be. That's why you guys are also tasked with getting as many magic stones and drops from the Colosseum. Lars closed his eyes. Looking like he was about to say something really important. We need money. In order to establish a city. We should be rolling in it. To arm everyone, to buy the necessary armor and weapons. To protect ourselves. So that your brethren and sisters won't die to the monsters and adventurers. Lars hyped them up. This guy. He sure knows how to trick people. Well, it's true anyways. Alfia rolled her eyes. 
And in order to do that, I need to sell drops and magic stones on the surface. Then, I'll buy materials to make a fortress. A home where everyone will be safe. Lars grinned as another symbol formed on his back. The sin of greed, avaricia. The Xenos cheered and they were especially motivated now to kill as many monsters as possible. Now that they know it's for the city, everyone was burning in desire. We'll divide it into three parts. One is for taxes, one is for the construction of the city, and the last one is for armors and weaponry. Lars finished his speech and the Xenos ate it up. Ha, too easy. Lars felt like a politician. Won't I be a good politician, Alfia? He looked at her and she chortled. Yeah, you little twerp. How are you so good at riling them up? She snorted at his skill. These guys don't desire to go to the surface per se. They want a home, a place to return to. A place they can call their own. Lars looked at the cheering Xenos fondly. Monsters attack them, humans will hunt them down regardless of their intelligence. What they want is a place in the world. Lars nodded sagely. And who am I to not indulge them? After all, we will both benefit from it. It's a win-win situation. He shrugged. That's a good way to hide your intent of using them. Alfia rolled her eyes. Sure, I am. But I'm giving them something that they want. It's a transaction, not a scam. Lars huffed at her. Yet, yeah, yet, yeah, keep on going with this pyramid scheme. Alfia teased him. Humph, you better shut up or else. Lars squinted his eyes. Or else what? Alfia raised a brow. I'll tell everyone here that you like hugging me when you sleep. He had a grin on his face. They share a bed, it was inefficient to make another one after all. It's also big enough for them to have a spot for themselves. Except Alfia always reaches out to him and hugs him tightly like a teddy bear. Lars emits a lot of excess energy due to consuming magic stones. And the dungeon is cold at night. Alfia sucked in a cold breath. You wouldn't dare. Try me, woman. Lars stood his ground. They stared at each other for a moment and she yielded. The great incarnation of talent, defeated by me. Lars Johansson, I've made history. He laughed like a maniac. I'll skin you alive if you tell anyone. Alfia squinted her eyes and he started sweating. Enough of this, will you go to the surface now? Alfia raised a brow at him. At most, he'll just be treated as a disabled kid in Orario. He doesn't look strong, nor capable. Nat, I need to accumulate strength and wealth. My arm is slowly combing back as well. He looked at his left arm that was a stump. Good choice, Orario is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You're too weak to fight against adventurers. At least the first-class ones. Alfia reminded him. I know, thanks for telling me. Captain Obvious. He rolled his eyes. Why you, your noise is getting annoying. Alfia assaulted him once again as she squeezed his fractures. Ah. Uh -huh. I give. I give. I'm sorry. Lars apologized immediately. That's what I thought. Alfia huffed at him. Ha, ha, not the injuries. You're being unfair. Lars rubbed his fractures. Humph, everything is fair in war. She rolled her eyes. Hey, Alfia. Do you have a thing here called chemistry? Lars asked and he thought of that thing that would help tremendously in a siege. Bullets. Chemistry, hey? It's a field of science, no? It is underdeveloped, adventurers and gods prefer alchemy and potions. Alfia got curious about why he asked. I know that look on your face. Fine, fine, I'll tell you. See? Mixing chemicals will give us a very important thing called gunpowder. Lars had a smirk on his mug. Guns? Those muskets? You can barely kill a level 1 who wears beginner gear with that. Alfia remembered that countries outside Orario has something like that. No, heavens no. Muskets? Humph, the thing in my head is like a level 10 mafia boss against a level 1 thug. Lars thought of the higher caliber rounds. And if upper-tier adventurers can get killed by some claws and bites, then bullets will definitely injure them. The only problem now, is he doesn't have a fucking clue on how to make them. What he knows is that their major components is nitroglycerin and nitrocellulose. But explosives using black powder will suffice for now. He wants to give the Xenos an advantage against adventurers. And having an infinite supply of bombs while controlling a choke point will make their fortress unbreachable. I'll need to experiment on how to make them though. 
You see, I've seen guns work and I think they can improve a lot. Lars quickly gave an excuse. Suit yourself, I think it's a useless endeavor. Althea shrugged. Ah, uh, you'll see. What I'm envisioning can fire spells that can pierce through steel plates. Hundreds of times a second. Lars had a grin on his face. If some adventurer fuckers want to mess with them, then they'll be in for a grand old time. Hey, Althea. Are there alchemists in Orario? Lars asked because he wanted to check with them first. If he could buy ammonia and sulfuric acid first. Because he doubted that they know how to oxidize ammonia to turn it into nitric acid. And sulfuric acid is a pretty well used solvent. So potion making might use it. Potion makers and alchemists are kind of like chemists. Magical chemists. Hmm, there are of course a lot of them in Orario. Especially those who sell potions. It's in demand all the time. Althea answered. Can I go to the surface? Get some ingredients. I need to experiment first in order to make the perfect defense weapon. Lars gave her the puppy dog eyes. The guild won't buy your goods for the retail price. Althea raised a brow at him. Don't worry, it's not like I need a lot of money. And I have a story for them. Say that I'm a proxy that's tasked with selling. Lars shrugged. And if they still want to get some info, then I'll just dip out of there. Lars explained and she sighed. You really want to make that thing in your head, hey? Althea rubbed her temples. Then let's go. I'll sell all the magic stones and you'll be my supporter. Althea sighed at him. Really? Thanks for that. He hugged her with his one arm and she recoiled. After all, the Xenos can see them. Get off of me, your noise is annoying. Althea pried him off of himself. Then I'll inform the trio that we'll be fetching things in Orario. Lars ran around to find the first Xenos. To tell them that they'll be going on an expedition. Lars already knew what to do and he raised his arm. Come on, my noble steed. Onwards. Althea's vein almost popped in annoyance and she bonked him on the head. I'm not your steed, you little punk. Althea stretched his cheeks like it was rubber. Chapter 12, A Goddess Althea of course speed ran through the floors, her healthy body can be considered godlike. They arrived at the entrance of the dungeon and Althea dashed through the guards like a gust of wind. And they didn't know what just passed through. Hey? That's some pretty strong wind. One of them fixed his hair. Yeah, maybe it's the fart of the dungeon? Gwahaha. His partner said with a boisterous laugh. Now that you said it. That's possible. The other guard rubbed his chin in thought. Althea and Lars quickly made their way towards the guild and they saw that the guild was busy. Everyone was running around and the guild officials look like they haven't slept well. Perfect. They're disoriented. Lars whispered and Althea nodded at him. Why is he so devious? This guy's like a villain in the making. He'll fit in with evil us. Althea thought as they walked inside. And not lacking any confidence, Althea walked towards a counter that is pretty big. It was the counter that they would always use in the past. Because they have too many items to sell. Uh, -huh. hello ma'am. Do you have a lot of drops and stones to sell? A tired-looking lady gave them a suspicious stare. Because they didn't have anything on them at all. And the stall specifically had a sign that it was for bulk selling. Yes, now accept them. Althea quickly said with a cold voice. The guild was noisy, and with her cloak on. They didn't see her face. Back then, whenever she entered the guild. Everyone would hold their breath or she would send them to the hospital. Then please put them here inside this chute. The official's face twitched. But Lars walked up to the counter and he put his hand over the chute. Dozens upon dozens of drops and magic stones rained inside of it. S space mag she was about to shout, but Althea grabbed her face tightly. Continue what you're going to shout out loud and I'll crush your throat. Althea said coldly. The woman nodded vigorously and she immediately coughed when Althea let go of her. T these two are super dangerous. The woman thought that she'll be killed if she makes a scene. They were definitely first class adventurers. When Lars poured out about 3 slash 4 THS of his inventory, he stopped. Thinking that would be enough money for now. Start counting, be quick. Althea said with a threatening voice. Why yes. She started doing her work as fast as she could. And when she finished after 15 minutes, a personal record. She calculated everything. T the total comes out to 10 million valis, ma'am. She looked at them. 
give it to us all in gold coins. Lars tapped on the counter and she immediately ran inside to get the money prepared. You didn't even need to pressure her, but she moved quickly. You're good at this. Alfia ruffled his hair. Humph, it's about body language. And you already scared her shitless, you violent woman. Lars pinched her sides. But she didn't even feel it and Alfia pinched his ears. While they were messing around, the lady came with ten bags of gold coins on a cart. Nice doing business with you. Lars took out a coin and flicked it towards her. When she looked at the flying gold coin, they were already gone when she looked back in front. Am I having a fever dream? The woman pinched her cheek. But the gold coin was real. Back outside, Lars wanted to get some equipment for some chemistry. And also some nice weapons that would give the Xenos an edge. Armor can come later, they need to be fitted after all. Let's go to Babel. The Hephaestus Familia has shops all over that place. Alfia even pointed at her black dress. It was made by Hephaestus herself. And it was pure arachne silk that was enchanted with anti-magic. And along with Silentium Eden, it limited her magic output by almost 90%. Meaning, she's normally fighting with her magic at 10% power. Her magic is so insanely destructive that it could kill high-level monsters easily. Vibrations bypass armor like a hot knife through butter. And Satana's variant is made for pure, destructive force. Then let's go shopping. Lars pointed at the tower and they went towards it. Entering the first shop that they found, Lars quickly walked up to the dwarf that was on the counter. Hey, old man. I want equipment for level threes. Give me all the weapons I can buy with this much. Lars took out five million valis. I like ya kid, guha ha ha. No fuss, no nothing. Just business. The dwarf immediately went inside and he gave them 25 weapons that varied. Here you are kid, approximately 25 weapons. 200k valis each. Some are more expensive, like swords. But I decided to put it here for ye. The dwarf smiled at him. Thanks old man, I'll be coming back for commissions later. Weapons and armors that will cost dozens of millions. Expect me to come back. Lars stored it in his inventory. The dwarf's eyes almost popped out of their sockets and he only have one thought. First class adventurers. Alfia then grabbed him and they disappeared. They then went towards the Diansect Familia. A well-known potion selling Familia. While they were on the way there a silver-haired girl was looking around at Diansect's store. Pick. Hey, you are suspicious. Lars teased her and the girl was startled. I. I'm just thinking of joining the Diansect Familia. She furrowed her brows. Alfia looked at the girl. This girl feels different. Her magic has this unique feeling. Alfia didn't know where, but she felt it before. I'm just joking, why the Diansect Familia though? You want to be a potion maker. Lars made some small talk. She's the first human he talked to in a year besides Alfia. The guild official didn't count. Yes, I have been able to make this with my savings you see. I've always been fascinated with making potions and being a doctor. The girl showed him a vial. Can I see what that is? Lars checked it out and he opened it up. Alfia who has stronger senses recognized it. An elixir. What's your name, girl? Alfia walked up to her. Uh, Ermid Tizanere. She got a bit nervous because Alfia was being overbearing. Sorry about my companion, she's a bit. I don't know how to put this, intimidating. She's a first-class adventurer you see. So she just has this pressure. Lars gave Alfia a look. I'm Lars. And this is my friend, Sophia. Lars made shit up on the fly with a smile on his face and Alfia thought he really was a villain on the making. Hello, so you've recognized it. I made it without a fauna. Ermid was quite pleased with her potion. Whoa, that's amazing all right. Lars fed her ego and based on what Alfia told him. They would want her immediately. Just Alfia's attitude says a lot, she has never asked anyone's name before. Not even the Xenos that were with them. You wanna join ours instead? We're a rank S familia you know? Even though I look like this, I'm a level 5 and she is too. Lars lied as he breathed. Definitely going to be a scammer. That's how he could make a pyramid scheme on the spot. Alfia smiled. And that's just what we need. Alfia was pleased. Really? Why would you want me though? You must be in an exploration familia. Ermit got suspicious. 
Hmm, this girl is quite competent against scammers hey. Lars cleared his throat. It's because we use up tons of potions every day. I have a good feeling about you, you'll most likely be a great doctor. And we need a good one to cure our meatheads. We have a lot of level 4s and 3s. We can funnel drops to our healers so they can improve exponentially too. Lars explained. And his logic was impeccable. Ermit got pensive as she thought of that juicy offer. With a familia like them, they can just fetch anything she needed to make potions, antidotes, and the like. While the Diane sect familia will need to buy everything or commission them to the guild. Something that is inefficient. And lost time, means more chances of death for people that needs treatment. Sure, I'll check out your familia. What's its name anyway? Ermid smiled. Sophia. Lars whispered and the woman moved in a split second. Alfia grabbed Ermid in less time than a blink of an eye. And a naive girl was kidnapped. Phew, that was quite stressful. Did anybody see? Lars looked around and thankfully, there were no witnesses. Damn, we just kidnapped someone. I hope Ermid will continue to be with us. Lars sighed. He doesn't want to do that again. But Alfia was intent on taking her in. Which gave them another problem. They need a god to give them Fauna. Alfia can't level up, or update her status. While Ermid would be held back if she doesn't receive a Fauna. TCH, I'll let future me deal with this for now. Lars slicked back his hair as he sighed. He entered the Diane sect familia's store and the receptionist welcomed him. Hi, I want to make a commission. Lars wasn't fortunately shrugged off to the side. As palums were a thing in the world. Yes, what do you need, sir? Do you have these equipments? Lars didn't go to glassmakers as it would take too long. So he hoped that the Diane sect familia will have some that is ready to sell. Flasks, beakers, graduated cylinders, condensers. She started reading them. Certainly, we have some of these. We need them to process chemicals to mix with the active ingredients. The receptionist thought it was weird that he came to them though. I'll buy them at twice the retail price. Lars didn't want any trouble so he immediately put down a bag of gold coins. T that's too much sir. Some of them are needed to be made to order though. So I recommend you to make a trip to the artisans of the Hephaestus Familia. She explained happily. After all, she just made a lot of money due to Lars buying some glassware. Okay, thanks. Pack it up for me please. Lars held back a sigh as he needed to come back to the surface for some equipment. He also asked for some sulfuric acid and ammonia that they thankfully had in bulks. Lars then made his way towards the Hephaestus Familia's shops once again. Going inside an artisan's shop, he asked for lab equipment and they accepted his commission. Money is money after all, and artisans need it to further their craft. Even though it's not their specialty. It was easier to make than intricate pieces as well. While still being complex enough to keep them on their toes. Thanks for accepting my request Hephaestus. A honey blonde woman was talking with a red haired one with an eye patch. Picks. Ha, we might be blacksmiths mainly. But we don't just make weapons. Nails, farm equipment and the likes are the basics for aspiring upstarts. Hephaestus shrugged. Still for a goddess of smithing to make farming tools for my familia. The voluptuous woman felt a bit sorry. It's fine Demeter, you're a good friend of mine. Besides, we need your familia right now, more than ever. Hephaestus frowned. Right. Orario is in chaos due to evil us. Demeter sighed heavily. Yes, so don't mind it. Take care, Demeter. Hephaestus said goodbye. Till we meet again. Hephaestus Demeter hugged her and she started walking away. Lars didn't know why, but he was quite attracted to the goddess. Not in the sexual or physical way. But she radiated warmth and kindness. And he thought he could trust her. Demeter is the goddess of harvest in Greek mythology right? She's also said to be kind and maternal. I guess if I'll join a goddess, it's going to be one that does real work for people. Lars made his way towards her. A goddess that runs farms. Now that's someone who is the backbone for society and civilizations. Not a god that just wants to make killing machines instead of taking care of the threats that plague humans for millennia. Hello, are you goddess Demeter? Lars smiled at her and she turned towards him. Ah, uh -huh. What is it child? She returned his smile and he stated his objective. I'd like to make a deal that you won't be able to refuse. Lars had a bright smile on his face. Chapter 13, Mortal Enemy 
really? Phew 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 how about we talk it over some tea then? Demeter chuckled. She was generous and kind, but Lars was too confident. And with him knowing her identity. He surely know that she is a goddess of agriculture. Works for me, let us go to a place of your choosing. Lars shrugged and Demeter appreciated that he let her choose. Orario is in a precarious situation right now after all. They didn't know if evil us might still be lurking around. And Arti Varma, the Ganesha Familia's captain's sister was assassinated by a child. They made their way to a cafe and Lars ordered a milkshake. Ahem, I am Lars. And the offer I want to make is very important. Demeter listened as she had time. Her children were the ones that did the physical work. Do you perhaps know these? Lars gave her samples of vegetables and fruits from the dungeon. Those are food from the dungeon. Demeter looked at them with interest. Adventurers don't take them back after all. They would rather haul loot than some food. It gave them more money. That's correct, what if I told you? That I can provide enough of these to supply Orario. Lars smiled and she was shocked. Wait, really? Are you perhaps farming these in the dungeon? But how? Demeter was flabbergasted. Trade secret Lars winked at her and she chortled. I guess it is. She shrugged. I want to enter a contract with the Demeter Familia. I know that money isn't that importani to you, farming is. But these are luxurious ingredients. Lars gave her his favorite. A square tomato. How peculiar. Demeter bit into it and she went wide-eyed. Why? This is exquisite. Such juiciness and balance between flavors. Demeter blinked. She thought that it can become her familia's specialty. And that will bring her children more prestige. Leading to greater satisfaction. Let's talk specifics then, Lars Kun Demeter was easygoing and he was thankful that she's as he expected. Sure thing, I also want to be a part of the familia. That would make things much easier. Lars requested. Then that makes things much easier. Demeter clapped. How about it? I'll give you my fauna at the Wheat Manor, our home. Demeter smiled warmly. Okay mommy, I mean goddess. Lars chuckled nervously. Fu 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 just call me Demeter. Let's go. She offered her hand and he grabbed it. They walked to the Wheat Manor while talking about the specifics of their contract. Really? You have a spatial magic. Demeter blinked in surprise. I do, so I can also haul large amounts of produce. The familia members would love it I imagine. Lars chuckled. They surely will, everyone would definitely welcome you warmly. Demeter laughed softly. After walking for an hour, they went towards the Wheat Manor and Lars thought that Ermid will at least have a goddess now too. And that's two problems solved in one shot. The only thing was, Alfia's fauna. Demeter would definitely see that she was level 7. Most likely almost at a breakthrough to level 8. That's going to be a problem, I have to wait before I could trust her fully. Not everything is what it seems. Lars squinted his eyes. Demeter then led him to her private chambers. Strip. She ordered him. Wah. He quickly hid his body as he thought of useless things. I is this what the fate of a Shoda is? Lars wondered. Hmm? Have you never been in a familia before? I need access to your back, silly. Demeter laughed. Oh well. He blushed in embarrassment and he took off his cloak and shirt. Demeter's eyes went white as saucers. She gasped upon seeing his missing arm. His body was also riddled with scars. W what happened to you? She grabbed him immediately. Ah, uh, this is just a little accident. He scratched his head sheepishly. Poor young child. Demeter hugged him and he almost drowned in between her cleavage. Humph his muffled voice sobered her up and she released him. Don't worry, you'll be fine here. Demeter looked at him with concern. Ah, uh, I'm fine Demeter. Don't worry about me, this was some time ago. Lars chuckled. But what he didn't know, is gods can feel the soul of mortals. And she had an inkling that he was lying. Though not all gods and goddesses can do it. The most of proficient with this skill is goddess Freya, Loki, Artemis, Athena, and Hestia. With the latter being in heaven. Demeter frowned, but she didn't pry. Okay, lie down and I'll be giving you my fauna. Demeter pointed at a couch for status updates and he nodded. Lying down, Demeter quickly saw the symbols on his back. And she didn't know what it meant at all. So she thought she'd understand once she gives her fauna. 
because gods can access a mortal soul when they give their blessings. It was the reason why they can put a number on statuses in the first place. Lars felt a warm sensation on his back as Demeter dropped some blood on him. She then started to read the specifics of his soul. And she was shocked to the core. Demeter went quiet for a good minute and he thought that something went wrong. Demeter? What's the matter? He asked and she sobered up. And no, nothing. I was just surprised that you have this skill already without even having a blessing. Demeter redirected her real thoughts. Ah, uh, that? I don't know as well, it just came to me. Lars shrugged and Demeter started writing it on paper. Lars Johansson, Level 1. STR, I0, 1534. AGI, I0, 1489. DEX, I0, 1732. VIT, I0, 1684. MAG, I0, 1943. Skills? Septum Peccata Mort Alia. Superbia. Gula. IRA. Avaricia. Infinitum Spatium. Magic. None. I. I can't understand your skills. Demeter shook her head. Lars then thought that could be because it was in Latin and the fauna of mortals are supposed to be written in divine hieroglyphs. The language of the gods. While the common language and writing, koine, is Latin in a weird font, appropriated to English letters. It was weird, but he concluded that real Latin didn't exist in the world he was in. Really? Is it weird? Lars feigned ignorance instead. If a goddess can't read it, then that's all in his favor. He didn't want anyone to know his skills especially his most special one. The Seven Deadly Sins Lars doesn't know the culture in Orario. But having a skill called Seven Deadly Sins isn't going to end well for him if people knew it. He'll most likely be branded as a blasphemer or heretic. It's fine Demeter, for the farm in the dungeon. I have first-class adventurers as my backers. We have a farm on Rivera. Lars downplayed the depth of their farm. The 18th floor? But you can get killed by going there. Demeter looked at him in worry. Don't worry, my friends protect me. And it's not deep. Lars smiled and Demeter accepted it. Though she noticed that he lied. I also want to bring in another aspiring adventurer. She's going to be a great doctor and potion maker. Lars trusted Alfia's instinct. Hey? But we're an agricultural familia. Demeter didn't think they could support Lars' friend. Don't worry, who said that familias can't branch towards other endeavors? Lars laughed. Okay, if you say so. Be careful in going to the lower floors. Demeter patted his head and he puffed his chest. Don't worry, I'll be back. Lars exited the room and Demeter sat down on the couch while trembling. W what am I going to do? Demeter poured some water in a glass. She didn't write down one of his skills. And it was the only thing she was able to understand. Because it was realized when he arrived in this world. Typhon. The sworn enemy of the gods. A terrible monster that is fated to battle heaven for the supremacy of the cosmos. Underscore underscore plaza underscore underscore. Lars was waiting for an open area for Alfia to pick him up. He wasn't conceited enough to think that he could go towards the 39th floor on his lonesome. Swinging his legs as he sat on a bench, he thought that meeting with Demeter was a stroke of luck. After waiting for 30 minutes, he was approached by someone. I've been looking for you. Alfia was pissed. Sorry, I got into a familia though. Lars reported his spoils. A familia? What familia? She squinted her eyes. The Demeter familia. I thought that she was generous and quite easygoing. I don't like exploration familias. Lars frowned. Demeter hey? Good choice. Do you think she's trustworthy? Alfia asked as she also wanted to update her stats. For now, yes but I can't risk you with her yet. After all, I don't know her personally. Lars shrugged. Logical, then I will wait. Alfia sighed and she picked him up. Traveling towards the dungeon, they quickly arrived at the 39th floor and there was a disheveled airmid waiting for them. You tricked me. Why am I surrounded by talking monsters? Airmid was still a bit nervous. But they introduced themselves to her and she calmed down a bit. Sorry, sorry. We don't really have a familia you see. Lars smiled sheepishly. So? What are your plans with me? 
Are you going to force me to make potions? She looked a bit fearful. Thinking that they were going to enslave her. No, not really. I actually just got a goddess to give me her fauna. And I'll let you get one too. Lars shrugged. Ermit just stared at him in suspicion. Well, if you promise to not say anything about this. Lars pointed at the budding village of the monsters. Ha, it's not like I have a choice anyways. Ermit sighed heavily. Yes, you don't. Alfia affirmed and the silver-haired girl winced. She still felt dizzy due to Alfia's mode of travel. And unlike Lars, she was just a normal person. I was telling the truth though, our group has a lot of level 4s and 3s. Except they're Xenos, don't call them monsters okay? Lars warned her. Okay, fine. This is my life now. Ermid huffed at him. Welcome to Monstro, this is the 39th floor. And you're our newest member. Lars smiled at her. When will you introduce me to your goddess? Ermid was quite the calm individual. In a few days' time, how about you make yourself comfortable here? I also bought baths, beds, and furniture for everyone. Lars started to take out the necessary items for living. Now, they have tools, silverware, beds, and baths. Baths are very important. I guess. Ermid was still a bit down for being tricked, but she did got interested at the so-called Xenos. She didn't expect that she'd be healing sapient monsters. Beings that are supposed to hurt adventurers that she's going to be healing. If she was a conventional doctor that is. Don't worry, Ermit Chi. You're a part of our group now. And Lars Chi found you important enough to introduce to us. Lyd waved at her. Yeah, don't worry. We won't eat you or something. Ray chuckled. You're not making her feel any better, Ray. Lars deadpanned at her. Oh, sorry. But it's true, we prefer magic stones and the crops here. Ray pointed at their farms. Humans don't taste good anyway. Gro shrugged and Ermid was alarmed. What did I just say? Lars sighed heavily and Lyd smacked the gargoyle. What? It's true. Gro grumbled and the others sighed at him. Come on, I brought weapons for 25 people. Good enough for level 3s. This will help your DPS tremendously. Lars laid down the weapons he bought. DPS. They tilted their heads and even Alfia didn't know what that meant. Higher DPS means more dead monsters. Lars explained succinctly and they nodded. The Xenos started picking the weapons that suited them best and the leaders led them to the 37th floor's Colosseum. They need to pay their taxes after all. And seeing them act so human made Ermid look on in curiosity. Welcome again, Ermid. To Monstro, the city of monsters. Lars smiled at her and she nodded. I guess this place isn't so bad. She thought with a smile. Chapter 14 Hidden Difficulties Lars started with his experiments. And with his meager knowledge. He knew that nitrocellulose is from tree pulp. Putting random shit together, he didn't really know what he was doing. And after he finished. He knew that something was wrong, it was easy to see. The end product didn't look like fluffy cotton. Ha, this is going to take a while. Lars sighed and he thought of hiring a chemist for this crap. But that would inevitably spread the recipe of nitrocellulose. He isn't dumb enough to think that they wouldn't be able to engineer nitroglycerin to complete the package. Lars shuddered, thinking of being the cause of a world war due to the appearance of new weapons. I guess I'll take care of this later. And I should do this myself. He sighed, but it was a worthy endeavor. After all, arming monsters with guns. That would be ironic and truly amusing. Besides, having a competent army is a man's romance. After experimenting, he entered the bath of his home. They can't make reservoirs of water because the dungeon would just get rid of it. But what they can do, is gather them and put them inside containers. And what's in his bathroom right now is a shower. What he didn't expect though is Alfia was showering. And she did so while using her magic Silentium Eden. So the whole bathroom was soundproof to oblivion. After all, for Alfia. Having a shower is noisy. And you want to do unto others, what you wanted to be done to you. Ah, hello there. Lars greeted confidently. For he has an iron-clad principle. Fortune favors the bold. Lars, I forgot to lock the door. It's been some time since I had a shower like this and not in some river. Alfia just stared at him. Yeah, good thing I got some large containers hey. Lars tried tricking his body. Mind over matter. 
he couldn't let his heartbeat go up. Because Alfia would definitely hear it. She's a level 7 for goodness sake. Can I join you? He asked with a straight face and she nodded. Come on in. She was shampooing her hair and was about to lather up some soap to really cleanse her body. It was burned into his mind. Alfia is an extremely beautiful woman. Her body hot imprinted into his brain. Thank God that I don't have a functioning libido yet. Lars almost sighed in relief. But when he turned his back on her, he started to calm down. Phew that was a close one. Lars wiped some sweat on his brow. He then quickly washed it off in the shower. What are your plans with the Xenos? Alfia couldn't help but think of what he was going to do. Isn't it obvious? Make a country for them. But they should stay here for multiple generations at least. Lars frowned. Why is that? Don't they want to see the surface? Alfia was confused. That's simple. They grow strong through adversity. And they feed on magic stones to level up. Hard times create strong people, easy times create weak ones. He said as a matter of fact. And Alfia was surprised that he could speak like that when he's so young. They'll get destroyed eventually. Once the pioneers that have established their kingdom is gone. The adventurers of Orario will continue to get strong. And they'll pillage them to extinction. Alfia winced. It was the cold, hard truth. And it was a tough pill to swallow, even for her. After all, she could see the Xenos. They were practically people in monster form. Nay, they were akin to young and confused teens that have no allies to speak of. And anyone around them is an enemy. The duo then finished their shower silently. Both melancholic due to how cruel the world truly is. After they finished, LYD was silently waiting in front of their house. Hey, LYD? Why are you here? Lars asked and he looked a bit nervous. Ah, you see. We actually have a backer, Lars G. Ronyi won't be able to have her full plate armor otherwise. LYD took out something from his bag. Is that a magic item? Alfia noticed the complex magic inside of it. Lars still isn't that sensitive in sensing magic, so he didn't notice. Yes, we use it to communicate with a sage. The sage, Fels. LYD revealed and Alfia blinked in surprise. But that person has lived centuries ago. Alfia was doubtful. Ah, they're alive all right. I just don't know if they're alive in your view. LYD winced. Well, if they're helping you guys. We need to talk with them. It's all right, make them come here. Lars nodded at him. Okay, I've been wanting to ask for some time now. LYD activated the magic item. The sphere glowed and a hooded individual appeared like it was a camera feed. LYD, what is it that you need? A gender-neutral voice resounded. Sage, we're actually moving. LYD didn't really know how the sage would react. Moving? To where? Did you find a better hidden village? Fels of course, wanted to know the details. Uh, to be exact. We're already on the 39th floor. LYD scratched his head with worry. Fels went silent for a moment and Lars broke the silence. Yo, so you're the one who's helping them from time to time. Lars greeted. LYD. Who is he? Fels' voice sounded stern. He's Lars G. He brought us to the 39th floor and we're fortifying a village. LYD replied. Come here, we need to talk. I'm taking care of them well. I even have friends to help the community. Lars assured Fels. I will be there in a moment, please wait for me. Fels ended the call and LYD got nervous. Don't be afraid of them, they're most likely just worried about your situation. The Xenos I imagine should be a secret. Lars concluded. For the surface would be in a massive uproar if they revealed the existence of the Xenos. Hey, what are you guys talking about? Ermit chimed in. The backer of the Xenos from above is visiting. And LYD here is nervous as hell. Lars snickered at him. This is no laughing matter you know? Fels helped us a lot. If they didn't help us, a lot more of us would have died. LYD snarled. Then if they truly want to help you, this Fels fellow will let all of this be. Strength in numbers. Ermid widely said. It does not matter if people target us anyway. They won't be able to do anything. Alfia left to do her own thing. Yet. Yeah. We have Alfia too, what do they have? Some level 6s. Lars' pride for Alfia started to show. L level 6? 
are we going to be okay? Ermit got scared. Well, didn't you know? Alfia is a high level 7. And her strength is way above her current level. Lars informed her and Ermit's jaw almost dropped. Be but that's impossible, the only level 7 in Orario is the king, Otter. Ermit didn't know about Zald or Alfia. Alfia is an executive of the Hera Familia. And that was when she was ill. She also told me that she could rival her captain who was level 9. But now, she's completely cured. And her illness isn't simple either. It's so debilitating that normal people would be disabled their whole life. Lars explained to her. W wow. She turned to a level 7 with that kind of disease? Is she even human? Ermit couldn't believe it. Sometimes, I wonder if she's some kind of demigod too. She's so strong it's ridiculous. Lars chortled. How about you, Ermit? Why do you want to be a doctor? Lars was curious. Me? I came from a pretty well-off family. Better than most, a middle-class one. Ermit reminisced. So I have access to books. And I've seen the magic of potions. Liquids in a bottle that could reattach even severed limbs? I was in awe. Ermit smiled. Yeah, it's pretty insane what potions can do. Especially those amazing elixirs. Lars thought of Marie's blood. It helped him survive the now-dubbed nightmare of the 27th floor greatly. And due to it, he was also slowly regenerating his left arm. So I researched what the requirements are for making them. And bit by bit, I learned that I'm talented at them too. Ermit chuckled. We don't know that yet, so we're going to Demeter in order for you to have your fauna later. Lars snorted at her. I'm going to be the best doctor and potion maker in Orario, just you wait. Ermit smiled at him. Should I leave? Lyd who was watching them flirt felt awkward. I don't think that's necessary, Lyd. A gender-neutral voice said to him and they looked at the new arrival. They were cloaked, so Lars and Ermit couldn't tell what they looked like. But they weren't one to pry. So, you are Lars, hey? It is nice to meet you. Fels gave a small bow and they were really respectful. And Fels, likewise. It is nice to meet you. Lars got a feel of them and they were pretty mysterious. I have seen what you've been aspiring to do here. And I have to say, it is quite something indeed. Fels nodded at them. How about we talk inside of our house? Lars pointed at his cabin with Alfia. That would be appropriate. Fels agreed and they followed Lars. Should I come with? Ermit didn't know if she should. You're a part of Monstro now, of course you should. Lars grabbed her hand. Another human that is not. Afraid of helping the Xenos. How intriguing. Fels looked at her direction. Well. I was forced to come here. Ermid looked at Lars incredulously. Ah, we sort of kidnapped Ermid. He he Lars decided to play it off with a light-hearted chuckle. Fels and Lyd just stared at him in silence. She's with us now. I swear. Lars put his hand on his chest. No matter. She does not have malicious feelings. Fels waved it off and they sat down in his cabin. I have to be blunt and ask this, who is your benefactor, Lars? Fels is a genuine level 4 in power. They could feel it, Lars wasn't strong enough to lead them towards the 39th floor. That would be me. Alfia suddenly appeared behind them and Fels was visually startled. T the monster of calamitous talent? How? Fels was shocked to the core. He saved me. Alfia pointed at Lars and he sheepishly scratched his head. You're gonna make me blush, please don't stare at me too much. Lars chuckled and Alfia rolled her eyes. He used an elixir that can only be called as a panacea. My body was basically reborn after he gave it to me. Alfia explained. But her disease has been reported to be incurable. I doubt that my philosopher's stone can even lift her curse. Fels went pensive. Hello, so what do you want to talk about? Lars brought Fels to the world of the living. Oh, yes. So she is the reason why you even dared to do this in the first place. Fels understood everything now. Alfia is a deterrent that not even whole countries can siege through. She was the one who finished off one of the beasts of the three great quests, the Leviathan. The woman is a genuine army of one. And her being a guardian made Monstro one of the safest cities in the whole world. That's right, she's my lucky charm. Now, enough of that. How can you support Monstro? Lars clasped his fingers. So young, yet so intimidating. 
Fels didn't dare treat him as a mere child. I'm affiliated with the guild. You can say that I am the one running it in the shadows. Fels revealed. Lars then grinned. Then you can buy our magic stones and drops right? I'll deliver it to you weekly. And in exchange, give us materials to build a city. Arm the Xenos, fortify the 39th floor. You want them to live prosperously I assume. Lars looked at Fels seriously. That is correct, but the Xenos desire to be at the surface. And my master also hopes to integrate them to society. Fels replied. But Lars frowned. Sorry Lyd, but that's impossible. Lars shook his head and Lyd was surprised. Why? Lars Chi? We can have a pretty strong group that can fend for ourselves in due time. Lyd can't accept it. Well, there's a variety of reasons actually. No, a myriad of them. Lars donned a serious expression. First of all, the biggest and fatal weakness of the Xenos. Your population, can you even reproduce sexually? Lars asked and everybody was stumped. They didn't think about it because monsters were naturally born in the dungeon. Second, who is going to feed you outside when you make a country? Nobody, that's who. And new countries rely a lot on imports. Lars put up another finger. Third, can you resist an all-out war against humanity? Elves? Dwarves? Beast people? The Palum? Heck, everyone will be out for your blood. Lars didn't want to give him a reality check. But it was sorely needed. T that's. Lyd was speechless. I think you've made your point, Lars. Fell side and the sage put a stop to it before Lars breaks his dreams further. I also want you guys to explore the surface but there's just too many variables at play here. It isn't as easy as wanting to. The world doesn't work like that. Lars patted him on the back. Yeah, thanks for telling us all the problems we need to tackle. Lyd got depressed. An awkward silence then dominated the cabin. And Alfia loved it. Chapter 15, Adventuring Hey everybody, I brought some fruits. Ray arrived with a basket and Lars started eating them without a care on the world. This guy is really confident. Lyd, Fels, and Ermit all thought at the same time. While Alfia nodded at his display of dominance. So she also ate some of the peculiar fruits. Some adventurers might accept you, like us. But the majority will kill you on sight. So don't have any bright ideas. I'm warning you. Lars chewed on an orange grape. He's correct, don't trust anyone. If we were malicious, we would have wiped you out in a heartbeat. Alfia gave Lyd a scenario. And he paled when he thought of Alfia appearing in the hidden villages to raise it to the ground. They'll be sitting ducks. Lyd, they are correct. Inform everyone that not all adventurers are like them. Fels said with a serious tone. I understand. Lyd nodded with a grave expression, his brethren and sisters lives was on the line. Now that we took care of that, we have to first make sure you won't get annihilated by the first expedition that large familius launch. Lars looked at Fels. Lars, your plan will be implemented immediately. The guild will give you a special pass to sell things at a premium price. And warehouses where equipment and raw materials to build a city will be given to you as payment. Fels liked his idea. That's just the start, please look for adventurers that can be trusted as well. I'll also do it of course. Lars wanted more personnel. Fels nodded and Lars pointed at Ermid. Ermid is a special case. We don't want to kidnap people if possible. He smiled wryly and Ermid rolled her eyes. That is for the best. Fels went quiet after that, remembering that they kidnapped Ermid. Which wasn't going to be sustainable at all. And they just might poach someone who will report them once they arrive at the surface again. Do you have that magic artifact that Lyd has? Give one to Alfia, Ermid, and me. We will be going to the surface. And we can contact the city if needed. Lars wanted one. It is expensive, but it can be arranged. I can see the importance of you having them. Fels agreed easily. Information is power. And the 39th floor is a bit too deep. Alfia is the only one who can warn Monstro in time if ever there's an emergency. Something that they can't afford. Because if a familia like the Loki familia arrives at the 39th floor without any warning, they will be exterminated without Alfia and she would inevitably go to the surface or dive deeper in the dungeon so she could level up. They talked specifics and Lars decided to bring Ermid to Demeter for now. I'll be power leveling Ermid, 
it's best if she gets a developmental ability that focuses on making potions and healing. Lars wanted to have a resident doctor. The Xenos are going to fight tooth and nail in the dungeon to get more magic stones. They were their lifeline. Get a low amount of it, they will be weak. Losing the chance to fortify Monstro and receive equipment. Fels might be able to give them some pieces of gear from time to time. But the Sage doesn't have Hephaestus or the Smithing Familius on their payroll. Then we shall meet again later, it was a pleasure to meet you. Fels stood up and the Sage started to walk back to Orario. Come, Ermid. We need to go to Demeter by using the Alfia Express. Lars looked at Alfia and he raised his arm like a child that wants to be carried. Alfia's eyebrow twitched and the vein on her forehead bulged. Alfia Express you say? Un, the great Alfia Sama is our only way to get to the surface, praise the Alfia Express. Lars nodded sagely. Ha, shut up and prepare yourself. Alfia sighed. Ermit and Lyd looked at him weirdly. The balls on this guy. Even Fells that didn't look simple were shocked when they saw her. The two of them remembered what Fells said. And Alfia's monikers was simply on another level. Even the strongest adventurer on Orario who's legit, Otter, the king. His moniker makes him seem human. While Alphaeus was a monster with no equal. Wait. Ermit still hasn't prepared herself, but Alphia didn't give her a chance. They were then delivered by the Alphia Express towards the surface. Alphia, I think we'll stay here on Orario for the moment. Demeter will welcome us to the Wheat Manor. Lars informed her. Humph, good. I'm not your ride to and from home. Alphia snorted. But what about the crops and magic stones? Ermit asked and Lars forgot about that. Yeah, about that. Praise the Alphia Express, I'll be counting on you. Lars bowed at her and she clicked her tongue. Fine, but it's because the magic stones will lose their magic if they are left hanging out for too long. Alphia rolled her eyes. Well, that went well. Lars nodded as he saw Alphia disappear like a ghost. She could be elusive as hell. I still don't know how you can treat her like that. She's extremely infamous, the calamitous talent. Ermit shuddered just saying her moniker. How strong. How talented. How much better must you compared to everyone must one be be to be called that by the gods. While basically being half dead. Well, she's a person for one. Being fearful of her will just make her annoyed. Though that woman has a sadistic side. Lars frowned. His body could still remember the beatings it received under the guise of training. Though he did improve like crazy. A year ago, he was just a guy. Now he could fight exceptionally well. Alfia's dynamic vision let her correct all of his incorrect movements. We also share a bond I guess. We only had each other for a pretty long time. But that's a story for another time, let's go to the Wheat Manor. Lars started walking. The Demeter Familia's estate is up north of Orario. As an agricultural familia, they also had land at the outskirts. Fields and farms that sustain Orario was located there. And the Demeter familia can be categorized as a C-class familia. Which is pretty decent. But take them away? Orario will be plunged into despair. In just a week, riots and anarchy will consume the city. Because they supply the city the majority of its foodstuffs. Even if all of the potion makers, smiths, and artisans disappear from Orario, it will still continue. But if the Demeter Familia goes poof. Orario comes along with it in less than a month. She's actually an untouchable goddess in the city. Not even Evil Us dares to attack her. And they've attacked S-rank Familias like the Freya and Loki Familias. Because if they truly want to cause discord and chaos to the maximum, taking her out is the best option. Here we are. Lars pointed at a manor that looked like a summer home. So this is the Demeter Familia? I've heard that they have thousands of members. Ermid rubbed her chin. Yeah, but the members don't get status updates much. After all, they're farmers. Lars shrugged. Because handling that many familia members will be exhausting. And Demeter would have to shed a decent amount of blood too if they all wanted status updates. They were then met by a man who looked like a typical farmer. Hey, young uns. Whatcha doing here? He asked with a kind smile and Lars thought that entering Demeter's familia was a good decision. Hey, old man. I'm actually new here. And I'm recommending her to the goddess. She makes a mean potion. Lars laughed. A potion you say? Well, there are some accidents here and there. Demeter-sama is in the lobby, you won't miss her. The farmer laughed. 
You're quite sociable, hey? Ermit who was a bit too stiff couldn't imagine being like that. Just think of others as your fellow humans. But be wary still, humans are very complicated creatures. Lars warned her. They then entered the manor and Lars quickly found the voluptuous woman. Demeter she's here, my friend, Ermit Tizanere. Lars introduced her and Ermit waved shyly. Era? You disappeared suddenly, Lars. I thought you were loitering around. Demeter chuckled. She then looked at Ermit and she smiled softly. Lars has told me about you, child. Do you want to join my familia? Demeter asked. Why yes, I want to. She nodded and Ermit really wanted to be in a familia. Because she wants to develop her skills as a doctor and potion maker. So it didn't really matter if she was in a familia that specialized in it or not. Lars and Alfia will be providing her with everything she needs anyways. Ingredients that might be rarer even. As Alfia can dive deep into the dungeon without any problems. Then let's give you a fauna. Demeter clapped and she guided Ermid towards her room. After waiting a while, Lars saw Ermid with her paper and he looked at it. Hey, reading other people's status is rude. Demeter chided him. Ah, uh, really? Don't worry, it's just a bunch of zeros Lars took a look, and it really was just a bunch of zero stats. Except her skill, Dia Fratel. He didn't know what it meant, but he was sure that she would tell him later. Come on Ermid, let's go dungeon diving. Lars smiled at her. He has never went dungeon diving. And it excited him to no end. Adventuring is a man's romance. You need equipment first. Demeter sighed at him and he grinned. Don't worry, Demeter. I have some for Ermid. Lars took out some armor for noobs and he gave her a spear. After all, stabbing things is much easier than swinging a sword or a cudgel. Isn't she going to be a doctor? Demeter asked, confused on why he was arming her like that. Lars looked at her like she was stupid. But he then remembered that this wasn't like an RPG at all. And Alfia is an irregular amongst irregular just like him who raises stats equally. Ah, a doctor that can't fight. Is going to be just a waste of space in the dungeon right? Well, she'll learn today. Lars smiled. Ermit shuddered, but she held onto her basic, steel spear tightly. He didn't want her to breeze through everything with the equipment for level 3s. This Exilia is a crap system. Experience has a shitty condition to be achieved. You can't just grind like a true gamer here. Lars clicked his tongue. Ermit gulped and Demeter sighed. Lars, you do know that potion makers and doctors don't dungeon dive right. Demeter gave him an incredulous look and he snorted. That's what they like to say. The effects of it can be seen easily too. Adventurers die a lot. If a competent healer dives in the dungeon and groups don't just rely on potions, lethalities will be cut down by at least 50% in my estimates. Lars huffed. Potions are consumables, magic. It can be replenished. And everyone can save potions for true emergencies where a healer can't heal people. But isn't that because healers are rare? Ermid raised a good point and Demeter nodded. Then supporters that are focused on healing will do. People look down on supporters too much. They are an integral part of the team. Lars sighed. Adventurers of Orario thinks that supporters are leeches or something. Which is true in some cases. But based on Alpheus' stories about the supporters of the Zeus and Hera Familias that were level 4s or 5s. They let the whole familia dive deep into the dungeon. They're the secret to their expedition's success, actually. Because people can't fight without food, water, and supplies. They're the logistics of the team. Enough about that though, let's go dive in the dungeon. Lars pulled her arm and they went towards the dungeon. Ha, he's too energetic. But, I do wish that he'd just stay like that. I can't let him meet with foul gods and goddesses. Demeter bit her lip. Or else, his skill, Typhon, might activate. She then remembered its description. Typhon, the promised enemy of heaven. The arrogance of the gods have gone on for too long. The time is nigh, and the emperor of monsters shall usurp heaven and earth. Chapter 16, Dungeon Diving Lars and Ermid made their way towards the dungeon. And it was the first time they saw the beginning of the dungeon. Alfia just ferries them over like a jet after all. It's a spiral staircase with a huge hole in the middle. Lars went to the edge and checked it out. Hey, you might fall. Ermid pulled on his arm. Don't worry, I won't die because of a fall. Lars remembered terminal velocity. And with his stats, 
that would be close to a weak impact at most. Okay, you said it. She huffed at him and he smiled. Thanks for getting worried, come on. Talk to me while we descend. Ermit nodded at him and she was satisfied that he at least acknowledged her concern for him. My magic is actually for healing, Demeter Sama tested it with me earlier. It creates a 5 meter radius that can heal. She said that I can also pick the intended effects. Like healing, which is the base effect. It can also replenish stamina, cure status ailments and curses. Ermit listed it all. And she had a happy smile on her face. Wow, your magic is overpowered. Lars blinked. A green light appeared on his back, but as quick as it came. It also disappeared as fast. It is, it needs a lot of mind to use though. Ermid remembered that she was drained when she used it. Well, that's why we're here. But you can't just focus on your magic stat. You'll be a combat medic. Lars squinted his eyes. Demeter might be untouchable in Orario, but that doesn't mean that her children are. And Ermid is just an adventurer that's starting out. It was only a matter of time before people would discover her insane magic. It wasn't an exaggeration that Ermid will be the best healer in Orario, nay. The whole world. Thank you for the carry, Alfia Sama. Lars prayed as Alfia was the one who sensed Ermid's talent. Yes. I'll do my best. Ermid did a guts pose and her determination to be the best healer burned. Okay, let's start. Lars acted as the vanguard. He can't afford letting her be in front. After they roamed about, the walls of the dungeon fissured and a green creature attempted to get out of the wall. But Lars does not follow anime rules. He took out a standard spear with an iron head and he jogged. Flexing his muscles to the maximum, he threw it with a grunt. Lars got lifted up a bit as he aimed at the largest part of it, its torso. The goblin then got nailed right on the middle of its chest before its feet could plant on the ground. T that's. You killed it before it can even spawn properly. Ermid looked at him with surprise. She didn't expect the small boy to attack with extreme prejudice. And Ermid saw it, he wanted it dead. Remember Ermid, never ever hesitate in the dungeon. Kill anything that moves, trust no one and nothing. Lars looked at her seriously. He knew that this was real life. He got a taste of it recently. And his arm was taken from him due to it. These monsters will try to kill you with everything they've got. Hesitation means death. Lars took the spear back. He plunged his hand towards the wound on its chest and took its magic stone. Gulping, Ermid nodded with a determined expression and her grip on her spear tightened. After the little interlude, they continued their dive into the dungeon and another goblin appeared. Legs bent, spear forward, tighten your legs and thrust with your whole arm while using your shoulders. Lars instructed as he watched. Ermid waited for the goblin who was growling at them. Smart, if you do not know the strength of your enemies. Let them make a move and react. He nodded at her and Ermid followed his instructions when the goblin ran at her. Being the weakest monster in the dungeon, her spear struck true as it couldn't even dodge or parry. Ermid then struggled as the goblin thrashed around while the spearhead stabbed its shoulder. When using a spear, always prepare to take it out and stab again. Later enemies won't go down with just one. Lars continued to instruct her. She nodded quickly and pulled on the shaft. The goblin's wound spurted out red liquid and it was stunned due to the pain. When enemies are distracted, kill them. Aim for the vital points. Avoid bony parts, your spear may not pierce. Lars waited for her to finish it off. The budding healer then stabbed it on the neck and the goblin gurgled for a bit before it dropped on the ground. Good, now take its magic stone. You are an adventurer. You should learn how to take the spoils. Lars didn't want her to waste any time. Ermid took some gloves that was in her little bag on her waist and she opened up its chest with a knife. She didn't complain though, Lars who was normally cheerful was quiet and serious. Looking at the surroundings, Ermid knew that it wasn't the time to whine or complain about collecting magic stones being dirty. After taking out the magic stone, the blood of the goblin disappeared anyway. That was a bit stressful. Ermid sighed as she stood up. Good job Ermid, but that's how you grow stronger. Through stress and tempering, let us continue. Lars smiled as he patted her back. Ha, I don't have a good feeling about this. Ermid felt ominous about Lars' method. They continued downwards the dungeon and Lars heard two cracks. In the second floor, they were met with a group of two goblins. Watch how I deal with them, Ermid. Lars felt like he was a high-level player that was teaching a noob. Good times. 
Ermit watched him circle around the goblins and he went near a corner so they would have to funnel into him. If you can't escape, fight in a corner. Control the crowd, of course this isn't applicable to everything. Lars stabbed the charging goblins. And due to him being in the corner, they were basically non-moving targets due to their trajectory. Domu, Domu. But monsters that have long-range attacks will be a problem with that strategy. Ermit nodded seriously. Yes, that's why first-class adventurers will always tell you to never stay put in one spot. Lars nodded at her. But that doesn't apply in these floors, unless I'm against a frog shooter. Ermit rubbed her chin and was learning quickly. Yup, those Lickitung wannabes are the first ones that can attack in range. Lars snorted. Lickitung. Ermit tilted her head in confusion. Sorry, it's nothing. Come on, let's find you a group of them. Lars gestured to continue. After walking a bit, Ermit was met with another group of goblins. But this time, there were three of them. It's okay to be scared, but don't panic and be filled with terror. Always keep your calm, kill them and turn them into EXP. Lars monologued. EXP? You mean Exilia? Ermit stabbed with her spear and she copied his STRAT. Something that gave humans the ability to be at the top of the food chain. The broken ability of copying strats. Ermit was also quite intelligent, so she did everything correctly. Making their way deeper, Ermit faced monsters after Lars taught her how to deal with them. The kobolds that were agile should be tripped before falling to her spear easily. Frog shooters that look with their lone eye first before launching their tongues. And the dreaded assassins that kill so many newbies, wars haddos. Shadowy monsters that stalk adventurers. Coupled with the low light of the dungeon, they were pretty dangerous. But Lars couldn't fathom how adventurers that could read about them in the guild would get killed by the bastards. He could understand if they were arrogant pricks that dive solo even though they're weak. But starting with groups of two, just a little vigilance will go a long way. And humans aren't that insensitive to movement. This place is filled with noobs. And what if the dungeon grows stronger by consuming their corpses? Lars wondered. Ermit struggled with the war's hado. Because it was quite resistant to physical attacks. She then started thinking while dodging the attacks of the monster as she kept moving. A weak point, everything has won. She then saw the glowing eyes of the monster and Ermit stabbed right there. It shrieked before disappearing and it left its magic stone behind. Good work, observation is a skill as well. And not a lot of people has it. Lars gave her a thumbs up. Thanks for accompanying me too. Ermit was exhausted and Lars thought that they should go back for now. It was a good run, and Ermit would definitely increase her stats a lot. But, he then remembered her magic. Ermid. You're my lucky star. Lars held her hand and Ermid was surprised by his sudden burst of enthusiasm. What? Why? She was confused and Lars laughed wickedly. You're a gamer's best companion, cast your magic. I will teach you how to be the best doctor in the world. Lars ordered her. Okay. Ermid started chanting. Healing droplets, tears of light, eternal sanctuary. Her magic started to form. And after arriving at her last verse. Curses be gone in the light of vitality. In the name of all that is holy. I heal you. A five meter radius of white light appeared and it looked like a divine sanctuary. Lars stepped into it and Ermid felt her little wounds and fatigue reduce. Though the magic consumption was intense. Amazing. I never knew my magic would be this effective. Ermid clenched her hands and she was at full strength. Domu. A gamer's greatest companion indeed. With you in tow, we can dive the dungeon endlessly. Lars smirked. E endlessly. Ermid suddenly felt a chill on her spine. Yup, the grind never ends. There's no shortcut to being a good doctor. You exhaust yourself with gathering Exilia. And then... You use your magic to top yourself back again. And once you're exhausted again, your mind has recovered fully. A good system, no. Lars smiled at her. He already created a hellish training regime that would traumatize her. And Ermit winced upon hearing him. Isn't that a positive feedback loop? Ermit frowned. It's a destructive cycle that produces positive outcomes on the body. But it doesn't show the mental stress that would be the result of such a regime. There's positive in it right? Then that's good. Chop, chop. Let's kill everything in sight. Lars had seen enough of her skills. It was time to go deeper. And he pulled Ermit's arm. Wait. Wait a minute. 
she was sweating bullets at the ominous feeling she felt, but her pleas fell on deaf ears. And so, Lars killed everything in the way by tearing them limb from limb with his bare hands. Why your strength is unreal. Ermid looked at his little hands that caught a frog shooter's tongue in midair. And the powerful muscle of the monster was ripped off of its mouth with ease. I work out. Lars shrugged and he led them towards the tenth floor of the dungeon. They were instantly met with a group of orcs. And Ermid thought that she would definitely die. Rejoice, Ermid. I will be power leveling you. A special technique that bloats your experience gain. Lars cracked his neck. He started kicking the orcs back and kept them busy. Lars pointed at one of them that was heading towards her. Kill it, I will funnel them to you one by one. It was a Spartan way of leveling up. Even the most insane adventurers would never think of it. Ermit grimaced at the fat monster running at her with a stone club. A natural weapon of the dungeon. I'll definitely beat you up when I get stronger. Ah. Ermit charged and Lars watched closely. Checking if he needed to intervene. Hmm, my disciple has learned from me well, indeed. Alfia who was watching from the sidelines nodded in satisfaction. Ermit then entered mortal combat against an orc. Chapter 17 Effects of Power Leveling Ermit shouted with courage as she stabbed the thigh of the charging monster. Booyath! The orc squealed in pain and it started rampaging around with its club. Fortune favors the bold. Take advantage of every opening. Ermit's mind was working full time. She maneuvered herself for another stab with her spear and with a wet schlick, the spear had pierced through the orc's back of the knee. Her spear shattered its kneecap and the orc was brought to the ground. She then screamed in fury as she stabbed its fat neck multiple times until it collapsed on the floor. Ha, ha, fat orc. My hand went numb due to that. Ermid huffed as she clenched and unclenched her fist. Good, another one. Lars let through another orc and Ermid had to think fast. Quickly following the same strategy, she polished it up and made quick work of the group of stupid orcs. She then kneeled on the ground, panting. Sweating bullets. She knew that she'd be grievously wounded if those orcs got a hit in. Good job, I'm proud of you. Truly, you have a soul of a gamer. Lars saw her polish her strat and it was the basics of being a hardcore grinder. He could already see it. Ermid would be like a paladin. A holy warrior that will heal the front lines while tearing through monsters in the vanguard. While he was fantasizing, Ermid threw a punch at him. Though he caught it easily. What? We make a good team. Why are you angry at me? Lars raised a brow. Are you crazy? I haven't even updated my status. Do you want to kill me? Ermit glared at him. Well, you didn't die. And I was ready to step in at any time. And I didn't need to, you were amazing. Lars said sincerely. She then blushed at his sincere compliment. No, I can't do this. I'll burn out. Ermit shook her head in defeat. What do you mean? I thought you wanted to be the best doctor. Lars frowned. And I can be without being the vanguard of the group. Ermid raised a point, she could focus on her magic after all. Then you won't be the best doctor. Look at this way, the best cure. Is prevention, if monsters can't hurt your patients in the first place, then you'll be the best. Lars tried to gaslight her. Do you think I'm stupid? Ermid deadpanned at him. He he I thought it would work. But seriously. You're basically my vice captain Ermid. Lars held her shoulders. I will be diving deep in the dungeon. And I want you there to be with me. Your magic is extremely useful. Lars said seriously. I it is. But what do you mean I'm your vice captain? You're not even the captain of the Demeter Familia. Ermid was confused. Well, they're a familia that is focused on agriculture. Working together with Ninsen for animal husbandry and the port city of Melon to feed Orario. Do you really think that they'll dive into the dungeon? We'll be the expedition party of the Familia. Lars explained. Ah, oh, you're serious about bringing me with you. She sighed and she thought about it. The Xenos also needs her. And she could practice her magic against them to the maximum. They were in a constant feud with the monsters of the dungeon. Fine. Let's go, power level me then. Ermid huffed at him. Though she thought that he will pay later. That's the spirit. Come on. Let's grind. Lars led them to another group of monsters. After a vicious cycle of killing monsters, healing herself. Then repeating it all over again, Ermid reached her limit after a whole day of mindless slaughter. 
Lars then forgot that people there doesn't look at killing monsters as an adventure like him. Sorry, I pushed you a bit too much. Let's go back to the Wheat Manor and have your status updated. Lars carried Ermit in his arms. She lasted for a good amount of time, Ermit has potential as expected. Fels gave me these, contact me with this if you want to return home. Alfia appeared and she gave Lars an orb. It was the same artifact that Lyd had, and it made him smile. Finally, a phone. I guess I can finally face time with Alfia rather than wait in the plaza. Thanks Alfia, we'll update Ermit's status. I'll turn her into level 2 as fast as possible in order to get a developmental ability. Lars started ascending. You go and do that, mage would be incredibly useful for her magic. Alfia returned to the 39th floor. Lars quickly made his way to the Wheat Manor and Demeter saw that they were ragged. Well, Ermit was. What happened? Demeter blinked in surprise. Ermit is really motivated. And she pushed herself to the limit. Though, I did goad her. Lars scratched his head sheepishly. Foolish boy, there is no rush. Dear oh dear, let her rest here. Demeter helped him put Ermit on a couch. What happened really? Demeter looked at him with a raised brow. I power leveled Ermid, we went to the tenth floor. Lars explained and Demeter was shocked. The tenth floor? Are you really that reckless? Demeter couldn't believe it. Well, everything was under control. Lars shrunk back a bit at her scolding. Demeter felt that he wasn't lying. Which made her huff in exasperation. Ugh, my head. Ermid woke up and Demeter tried to ask her instead. Ermid, dear. Did you feel that everything was under control in the dungeon? Demeter gave Lars a side eye. The Wheat Manor? Eh, Demeter Sama. Well, I don't. But Lars said that he was ready to intervene at all times. Ermid trusted that he was. And Demeter didn't detect any lies as well. Ha! Huh. Just new adventurers, yet already so reckless. Well, Ermid's magic is really overpowered. So I decided to abuse it in order for Ermid to grow exponentially. Lars smiled wryly. Now that he was explaining it to Demeter, he did feel that it was a bit too hard on Ermid. His mind was poisoned by Alfia's hellish training. She beat him up all the time after all. Ha, huh, I'm sure you won't stop right? At least tone it down a bit. Demeter sighed at them. Yes the two of them affirmed and Lars pointed at Ermid. Well, can you update her status? She needs more stats. Lars' words didn't fill Demeter with confidence at all. You're going to go there again, aren't you? She squinted her eyes. Yes. Come on, goddess. I know what I'm doing, I promise. Lars put a hand on his chest. And surprisingly, Demeter felt that he was telling the truth. The truth might be distorted in another's point of view. But she could see Lars' confidence. It wasn't just hot air. Fine, but I hope you will restrain yourself. Demeter admitted defeat. She then updated Ermid's fauna and she stared at her status with white eyes. Ermid T. Zainaray, Level 1. Str, H156. AGI, H178. Dex, H134. VIT, H115. Mag, G316. Magic. Dia Fertel. Skills. Lamhalais, as long as the bearers will to heal never fades. The heavens shall bless the saints' hands to create miracles. W. What exactly did you do in the dungeon? Demeter wondered what the hell did they do there. Well. I lured monsters and let Ermit fight them one by one. And when she gets used to them, I increase the numbers. Lars explained with a gulp. What is it, Demeter-sama? Did I get something weird? Ermit glared at Lars. And no. It's just, you gained a lot of stats. Almost a thousand which is unheard of. And you gained a skill. Demeter massaged her temples. She then thought if it was due to Lars' skill, Typhon. If the world was blessing her and identifying her as a saint to control the emperor of monsters. Really? What does it do? Ermit got excited and Lars listened in as well. It's called healing hands. As long as you want to heal people, your ability to heal strengthens. Demeter downplayed it a little. Because they might go crazy in the dungeon if its true prowess was revealed. Miracles aren't used by the fauna lightly. Cool, let's rest for now and dive into the dungeon again Ermid. Lars was excited to abuse her skill too. A true grinder exploits everything he can get. 
systems are made to be broken. And he wondered why the stronger Familius aren't doing it. According to Alfia, they were practically power-leveling people in the dungeon just like him. Except they were doing it pay-to-win style, draining tons of money on potions and mana potions for their members so they could level up. Just hearing about the conditions of getting Exilia would make a child know that being in hard fights will let you grow stronger. Are people here just dumb or something? Or their common sense limits them? Lars got pensive. But Alfia didn't explain to him that leveling up is such a pain in the ass. And that there are two kinds of Exilia. And the type needed to level up must be impressive to the gods. Something that will make him curse Falna for a long time. That's right, take a rest. Ha, you two are too hyper for me. Demeter smiled wryly. Though Lars was taking rest into consideration properly. I want to level up too. I think having a developmental ability that complements my magic and skill will be beneficial. Ermid thought about it. Getting the Magedah will boost her field effectiveness a lot. She doesn't know how much, but it would be a very welcome boost. Demeter, tell us if there are any injured Familia members. Ermid needs to train with her magic. Lars asked of her. She needs to chant faster, concurrent chanting even. Or the best case scenario, eliminate the chant like Alfia. Lars imagined it. Ermid would be one of the most important members of the group in the future. An unkillable paladin that just spams heals everywhere. It then dawned on him, what kind of class was he? Especially because groups need proper classifications. I'll definitely be in a heavy assault team. Ermit and Alfia basically confirms that. He thought of the others. Alfia would never be a support mage. She's built different, nay. Born different, the she-devil is an ordnance unit on her lonesome. Ermit's magic lets her increase her stats to the maximum without much risk. Unlike other adventurers that has a dump stat and specializes in something, she can be an all-rounder. Something that benefits healers a lot. Because they need a mix of all of their stats. So I'll be the commando. Lars thought of his ridiculous skills and it would put him in multiple classes at the same time. In due time, he can be a tank, healer, mage, assassin, and warrior all at the same time. He just needs to consume the right things and develop the resulting effects until they're viable. Ugh. This world's progression system doesn't do anyone a favor. Lars thought it was too hard for an average Joe. You can definitely grow solo, but the risks of it are too damned high. And you'll most likely die first before becoming a first-class adventurer. So they continued on with their dungeon diving and Lars slowly ramped up the difficulty for Ermid. A routine formed for the two of them and they continuously went in the dungeon every day. Sometimes even staying inside for days on end due to his inventory and Ermid's magic and her skill basically made them unstoppable. Their stamina that gets depleted is replenished with her magic. Wounds were healed, poison was neutralized. Run and continue fighting them in a choke point. Lars instructed. He was carrying a large ant with its mandibles crushed and its legs taken off. And as a eusocial insect, the killer ant was letting off pheromones like crazy. You insane bastard. You're making a pass parade. Ermit shouted at him. More enemies more EXP. Now get to work woman. Lars hurried her and Ermid started chanting. She used her magic on a choke point and she grasped a sword. It was much better for close quarters combat than a spear. Become EXP, ants. Ermid jumped on her sanctuary and she went crazy on the killer ants, hacking and slashing them with all her might. She was now a true gamer, abusing the hell out of her skill. Ignoring all of their attacks at her as she focused on killing them all like a berserker. Nice, your VIT will increase nicely like that. This is a Lars approved power leveling method. He gave her a thumbs up while holding back another wave of the dog sized ants. I hate you. Ermid started chanting once again as the light of her magic died down, refreshing it. And when she was sufficiently healed, Lars opened up the floodgates. Several killer ants charged at her once again. Ugh. I will level up. Ermid continued tearing through them as they bit her and she powered against their attacks. Chapter 18, Level Up RTA After power leveling Ermit in the dungeon for weeks on end, Lars was excited with Ermit and they went up to Demeter. Are you excited? I think we've maxed out your status. Lars beamed at her. And the beautiful, silver-haired girl whose mind got poisoned by the grinding mindset nodded. I'm ready to be level 2. She had a smile on her face. There's Demeter. Demeter I think Ermit can level up to 2 now. Lars ran at her with Ermit. L level 2. Demeter looked at them like they were stupid. 
Only two months have passed since Ermid turned into an adventurer. And she hasn't updated her status since the first one. Because Lars saw the con of doing so when power leveling. Updating stats are like using available stat points. And more stats, means easier progression in the dungeon. Which will then turn into a loss of EXP. Something that he wasn't keen on. So after Ermid's first ever status update, they disappeared from the Wheat Manor and Lars focused on Ermid's level up. Why you re not drunk are you? Demeter sniffed them and they deadpanned at her. You do know that I'm only probably ten right? Lars raised a brow at her. While Ermid wasn't the type to drink at all. At most, she would sip some wine or something. Why yeah, just making sure. Did you hit your head then? Demeter patted their heads, checking for bumps. No, we're serious Demeter. I think we've gathered enough Exilia for Ermid. Lars had a proud expression on his face. I've cried tears of blood for this very moment. Ermid clenched her fists and she'll demand a vacation for the level up. I've been farming Exilia and healing the Xenos. I deserve a vacation. Ermid was burning with determination. Okay, you two are quite boisterous. Demeter led them to her room again. Let's see, why are you so excited? Demeter chuckled and she thought that her parameters could have at least hit D. The 500 to 600 range. Taking into consideration her explosive growth. W what? Demeter went wide-eyed as she saw Ermid's stats and the girl had a smug grin on her face. Please, can you tell me the developmental abilities I can get? Ermid was sure that she was going to level up. Your stats are ridiculous, Ermid. Demeter showed her the paper. Ermid T. Zaneray, Level 1. STR, S999. AGI, S999. DEX, S999. VIT, S999. MAG, S999. T that's amazing. Ermid looked at Lars in shock and he scratched his nose humbly. I told you that my POW leveling STRAT is supreme. Ha 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 ha. Lars laughed. Then, what's my DAS Demeter Sama? Ermid asked her and that's the problem. You can't level up yet. Demeter winced and Ermid looked like her whole house just burned down. W what? That's bulls I mean, unfair. Lars quickly corrected himself. Well, she doesn't have enough high class Exilia to level up. Demeter explained with a frown. H high class Exilia? What do you mean? Ermid furrowed her brows and Demeter sighed. It's a feat that even the gods will find impressive. You don't think that people hit their limits just because, do you? Demeter sighed. What? Really? That's really grinding my gears right now. Lars couldn't help but get angry. It was like seeing your experience bar was at a 100%. But the server was bugged and you can't level up at all. And the worst thing is, that EXP doesn't accumulate. So he was really pissed off. Red light was starting to shine on his back and Demeter shuddered at the feeling. A Arcanum. Demeter was alarmed to the maximum as she hugged Lars and stuffed his face in between her cleavage. Humph, HMMFF. Pwa. What gives, Demeter? Lars was clearly in a bad mood. You don't need to be so mad. It's any kind of feat. Something that will be impressive, it doesn't have to be a heroic act like killing a dragon on your own. Demeter explained. But all that hard work we did. We'll be wasting a lot of time. Lars growled and Demeter caressed his hair. Don't worry, I can imagine that you and Ermid can think up of something amazing. Demeter shushed him and she calmed down. The feeling of something divine rolled off of him completely and she almost started sweating bullets. I hope that nobody else felt that. Demeter looked at him who was pouting and Ermid sighed. Wait. Have you forgotten, Lars? Ermid remembered something and he raised a brow. I created an elixir without any fauna. Ermid suddenly had a beaming smile on her face. Oh ah. Uh, oh. That's it. Maybe it didn't register yet because you didn't have any fauna before. Lars pulled her. See you later Demeter, we'll be back a bit later. Lars waved at her and Ermid waved hastily as well. Energetic kids. Demeter smiled wryly. But her expression suddenly turned dark. A child in Gakai that has divine power. No matter how weak that was, it is impossible. Even the few demigods that were born into this world didn't have an arcanum. How could they? When they don't have a domain to rule over. Demeter had a grave expression. Nobody can know of this. Especially those two from the Norse and that man from the Greek pantheon. 
underscore underscore Orario ruins underscore underscore. Why are we in the ruins Lars? Ermit looked around and it was deserted. We're going to make a call. And I don't want any people be seeing her. Lars shushed her. Ermit immediately nodded and people would never forget someone like Alfia that quickly. In a few more years, they most likely would. But she was iconic, she can't be forgotten that easily. Even though only a few people knew what she looked like directly. Lars activated the crystal ball and Alfia appeared as she answered his call. Though she was wearing a hood. The coast is clear Alfia, we're in the ruins at the outskirts of the city. Lars shrugged. I see, I have taught you well indeed. What do you need? Alfia was a no-nonsense person as ever. We need to go back to the 39th floor. And Ermit will start creating potions so she could level up. Lars explained. Ah. You must have helped her too much, high-level Exilia is needed to level up. Alfia forgot to tell him that. That seems to be the case. Ermit frowned and Alfia moved after ending the call. Waiting for a couple of minutes, their bus arrived as a gust of wind blew their hair. I'm never going to get used to this. Ermit prepared herself. Your loss, the Alfia Express is the best. Lars patted her on the back and Alfia glared at him. Stop calling me that or I'll step on your balls. Alfia threatened and he just laughed at the face of danger. You love me too much for that, now chop, chop. Oh great Alfia Sama. Lars ordered and Alfia rolled her eyes while running towards the 39th floor with breakneck speeds. When they arrived, Alfia pointed at a warehouse that the Xenos made and right there was the taxes they paid for. Drop items and magic stones are there, store them before they lose more of their magic. Alfia then walked away. To do whatever she was going to do. Geez, Alfia must have missed me too much. She's colder than usual. Lars sighed. Aren't you just delusional? Ermid rolled her eyes at him. You don't understand, I'm too sinful Ermid. Alfia adores me, I'm too adorable. Lars sighed wistfully. Just lead me to your so-called failure of a lab. She sighed. Okay, go to my cabin. I bought some stuff from the Diansect Familia. Then I'll bring in the item drops that you might need. Lars went to the warehouse. Ermid headed to his cabin and saw another shed which had a crude sign named Lab. Explosive? Do not enter. What the hell is he making in there? Ermit shrugged and she entered either way. There, she saw some bags of cotton that were stored in thick jars in a pretty cool place. Weird, why is he collecting cotton? She shrugged and inspected the equipment he had there. This is even better than what I made do back then. This will be easier than I thought. Ermit cracked her knuckles. She then started making a list of all the things she would need to make an elixir. Hey, is it good? Or do we need to board the Alfia Express once again and buy some things? Lars appeared and he was munching on some magic stones. Ermit has never seen him do that before. And she was shocked to the core. Lars. Are you a Xenos too? As far as she knew, only monsters ate magic stones. No, I'm human through and through. Though you can't get any of these, they're dangerous for normal people. Lars hit his bowl of magic stones like it was cereal or something. I don't want any from the beginning. Okay, here's the drops that I need. Ermit started telling him what she needed. And Lars checked his inventory for the things she required. And done, I've got to be honest with you. I don't know how those things will turn into an elixir. Lars looked at a dinosaur egg. It was the egg of a monster called a Bloodsaurus. And there's also some butterfly wings that were blue. From an insect called Blue Papilio. Which is an offshoot of its poisonous counterpart the purple moth. I'll make this for now. How about you go and do something else? Ermit shooed him away. Fine, I guess I'll check the taxes of my people. Lars shrugged. He then went back to his home and he checked the catalog. Looking for useful drops that he could eat or something. Hmm, I guess this could come in handy. Lars took out the drop of a war shadow. It was a gnarly looking claw and he bit into it like it was chose. He then spawned some black claws on his fingers and he slashed at a rock outside. Hey, I guess it's more for slashing. Who figured? Lars rolled his eyes as it just gave some slash marks on the rock. But against fleshy enemies? It would definitely work better. He then ate a crystal mantis which is something like a weaker obsidian soldier in the 37th floor. With it being resistant to magic and all. I'm Scyther now. He spawned some scythes that looked like quartz on his forearms. 
It also had stronger slashing power against the rock, which is to be expected. He then looked at a violet liquid that looked very, very poisonous. Poison vermis. It's said that only elixirs can cure its poison. Well, bottoms up. He drank it like a shot and he didn't really feel anything. But he doubted that would be the same case if it got onto his skin. After that, he spat on the rock and it started sizzling like crazy. Oh fuck, that's insane. Lars didn't want to get hit by something like that at all. It was like a super acid on steroids, because its poison was said to be untreatable by normal means. So he played with different kinds of combinations and Lars felt that he would do much better now if he fought in that massive pass parade back then. I just need to heal up my arm now. He looked at his left arm and it was now almost at his elbow. He reckoned that it would take at least two more months to completely heal up. Should I ask Marie to give me more blood? No, no, that's too personal. Lars shook his head. After having some pretty sick combinations in his mind. He was called by Ermid. You done. Lars went up to his shack of a lab and he saw another vial with a pretty potent smelling elixir. He smelled the mana inside of it. And just like what Alfia said, Ermid's mana was just special. I managed to make a batch of them. Ermid smiled as she showed ten vials. Wow, let's give it to the leaders so they could use it in emergencies. Lars was pleased. Oi. Lyd, grow, Ray. I've got something for you. Lars called out to the Xenos and they quickly arrived. What is it, Lars G? Lyd looked at him curiously. Put this on you at all times, it's an elixir. It's great for poisons and injuries. Lars didn't tell them that only a select few can make those. Gee, thanks Lars. Ray accepted them with gratitude and put it in a holster on her hip. Really? You'll give us something like this? But Ermit Chi already heals us up nicely. Lyd was embarrassed. Accept it Lyd, or it will be rude. Thank you. Gro quickly took it and left after a small thank you. Gro is as hot-headed as usual. Ray sighed. Don't worry, this is my job too. Though Ermit is the one who made it. Lars smiled at her. You're welcome. Ermit returned his gesture. Then, let's call the Alfia Express. Lars called for Alfia and the neurotic woman was annoyed as ever. Though she still ferried them over to the surface. Making their way to the Wheat Manor, Demeter was surprised that they didn't take too long. Era? Are my children really that amazing? Demeter teased them. Damn right we are. Lars pointed at Ermit and she took out an elixir. This. This is an elixir, not a failed one too. Demeter looked at her with surprise. Can I level up now? Ermit was giddy and Demeter smiled. Let us see, Ermit. They then went to her room and after waiting for a few minutes, Lars was met with a beaming Ermit. Did you get the mage day? Lars held her hand and her wide smile got higher. Even better, mystery. Ermit had a smug expression and he tilted his head. Hwazud. He genuinely didn't know what it was. Chapter 19, Making Waves Ha! Huh? You don't know what mystery is. Ermit blinked at him in surprise. Uh huh, that's why I'm asking day. Lars rolled his eyes. Don't fight you two Lars. Mystery is the most rare day, ever. Only a handful of people has it. Demeter explained. Whoa. Then it must be overpowered right? Lars' tune changed. Well, it can help me make items with magical effects. Ermit shrugged and Lars thought of the possibilities. Good job. That's going to help us a lot. He first thought of making magical harvesters for Demeter. After all, she hasn't asked any question about his little farm. Well, he could just retreat to the dungeon anyway. And Ermit already unlocked her magic. Even if Demeter locks her fauna she could maybe still use it. If not, then she can be an elixir factory. The entirety of Orario does not want to mess with them. Praise O Almighty Alfia Sama. Lars prayed. Come on, let's test your new prowess. Lars was about to pull her into the dungeon again. No. I want a vacation. I demand one. Ermid protested and he blinked in shock. Ah, I have erred. I acted like a boss of a black company. Lars clicked his tongue. Okay, you'll have a week off. Enjoy your time Ermid, but after that. The grind continues, for it never stops. Lars nodded sagely. She sighed in relief that he wasn't against a vacation. Finally, some real rest. 
Ermit sighed at his antics. Go on, you deserve to rest. Demeter looked a bit distracted. You okay, Demeter? Lars asked her and she snapped out of it. Yes, I just need to have a little nap is all. Demeter shooed them away. I guess I'll explore Orario for now. Lars gave Alfia a message to bring Ermit back to Monstro. She wasn't safe in the surface at all. And unlike Lars, she can't fight back against people that are higher up in her weight class. Not yet at least. I hope you enjoy your time. Demeter smiled at them. And when they left, she frowned. How am I going to reveal this in the Denatus? Demeter thought that the gods will be on their asses. The record for the fastest level up to two was a year. Even the Zeus and Hera Familius didn't grow that quick. And Ermit broke that record by miles. Only needing two months, while being a healer by nature. Unlike Loki's doll princess, which is now being called the Sword Princess. Ermit's skill and magic is for healing. This will be a headache. Demeter massaged her forehead. Underscore underscore orario underscore underscore. Lars was currently roaming around, fulfilling one of his wishes. And that is to check out the local cuisine. Man, I kind of forgot because I was stuck there. But this is what I love to do. He checked out the different types of cuisine in another world. There were a lot of similarities, but some food were really different. Like it matched the past era's preparation. But it was still better than the food of Earth. Because everywhere, there is magic. While stuffing his face with a bunch of jagamarkins, he stumbled upon a woman. Pick. Sorry, big sis. I was distracted you see. Lars apologized and he looked at the woman. That is of no concern, child. She smiled at him and Lars could feel it. There were only two goddesses that he has seen so far, being Demeter and Hephaestus. But they have this aura on them that just says I am a god. His eyes glazed over for a quick second, but he snapped out of it and he shook his head. Well, pretty lady, nice to meet ya. He winked at her and he went on his merry way while stuffing his face with his potato puffs. No way. She was shocked out of her mind. Are you fine, my lady? A large man with animal ears appeared besides her. No. No I am not, Otter. That child, he brushed off my charm like nothing. The woman was still processing things. Shall I get him for you, Lady Freya? He looked at Lars who was looking around for unique food. That won't be necessary. Who are you, child? And why can't I see through your soul? Freya squinted her eyes. That lady sure was pretty, I guess as expected of a goddess. Good thing my balls aren't making testosterone yet. Lars shrugged. And that would have been a sufficient explanation. If the place was a normal world that is. But that's a story for another time. Lars then saw a pretty popular place. Hostess of Fertility. He walked inside and he shuddered when a black-haired cat girl locked eyes with him. Pick. Naya Naya Naya. A cute little boy? Are you here to dine with us? She had immense speed and Lars was shocked. She appeared right in front of me instantly. Then she must be a level 4. A damned waitress is level 4. Lars wanted to laugh. Um, yes. Is there a table open? Lars asked and she dragged her tail on his chest. Of course Naya. Seating 1. So, what's your name? She purred at him. He gulped and thought that she must be one of those. Touch me and you'll be arrested. Lars said seriously and she started sweating. Oh okay, let's not get to that point. I'm Chloe, so what's your name? Her voice got a bit shaky. I'm Lars. You should get a better hobby, Chloe. Lars looked at her with disgust. Ooh that stare. Those golden eyes that look at me with disgust. I'm. I'm see you she was suddenly pulled by a blonde woman. Pick. Hello, sir. I am terribly sorry for my co-worker. Please, let this Lunoir take your order. She smiled, but it was strained. Well, I'll have one of everything. How about you give me a discount? Lars was a master of exploit. And he used Chloe's misbehavior for a chance to get a discount. See certainly. Lunoir winced and she thought that Chloe would be getting a beating. For the owner of the restaurant slash bar is a level 6. Dangling his legs and sighing, Lars just waited for the food to come. After a quick 15 minutes, a large woman then slammed tons of plates on the table. I hear you shook down one of my girls? You've got some balls, kid. 
she stared at him and he raised a brow. Well, one of your girls harassed me. What do you have to say about that? Lars returned her glare. He was no pus asterisk why. Humph, I like ye. You've got guts. All of this is half off, but you've gotta pay full price next time ya hear me? The name's Mia Grand, enjoy kid. She waved as she walked back to the back room. She's strong. Oh well, better start eating. What should I start with? Lars looked at the food with sparkling eyes. He then started stuffing his face. The patrons even started betting if he could finish it all. But he quickly finished all the food in one sitting, and he didn't even look like he gained a gram of weight. Damn. What is that kid's stomach made of? Is he a first-class Palom adventurer or something? Mia was shocked. Thanks for the food, hey Le Noir. Grab me another two orders of everything. Lars looked at Chloe and he stuck his tongue out. Chloe then paled and Mia glared at the cat girl. Lars walked up to Mia and he paid with gold coins. That was good, the best I've tasted. Too bad there's a pervert here. Lars looked at Chloe again. Ha 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 ha. Don't be too harsh on her kid, she doesn't do anything to little boys. Though I should beat it out of her. Mia glared at her. Lars is a paragon of gender equality. And he nodded at Mia's decision to discipline her waitress. He knew that people were treated as adults at a tender age of 14 or 15 at the world he was now in. But he was clearly still too young. I'll forgive you if you let me play with your tail and ears later, maybe after four or five years. Lars shrugged. Naya, Mama Mia. He said he'll forgive me. Can we talk about this for a second? Chloe was sweating bullets. You lost me a lot of money. Mia cracked her knuckles. Rest in peace, showed a loving cat girl. Lunoir prayed for her soul. Nyo. Chloe's scream was heard as Lars exited the building with a satisfied smile. He then gave Demeter some soft food to eat because she wasn't feeling well. And Lars went towards the dungeon on his lonesome. The grind never stops. He cracked his neck and he created black claws on his fingers. The very first goblin he saw, he ran at it and tore it apart with savagery. His teeth then turned into daggers and he bit off its face. A pink glow appeared on his back. Ermit can't see this, not yet. And it made me so hungry. He feasted on its flesh before he swallowed its magic stone. Lars then continued his hunt as he ate any monster he saw on the way. And the more he feasted, the hungrier he became. Kobolds tasted like gamey chicken, along with goblins. Frog shooters had firm meat, like lean chicken. Orcs were like pork belly, as he chewed on one's arm as the monster started to bleed out. His face was covered in blood. And the crystal scythes on his arm were too. Similar to pork cutlets, you guys are delicious hey. Lars' golden eyes targeted the orcs. Just a child that was several centimeters taller than a meter. Facing three meter tall orcs. He nimbly dodged the club of one and he lunged onto its face. With a terrible crunch, its face got torn off as he chewed. Bone was crunched and the sound of a gulp resounded. He then enjoyed his prey thoroughly before crushing their magic stones in between his teeth. Not enough, more. He took out magic stones from his inventory and ate them by the handfuls. He then saw an infant dragon and it was a bit taller than him. But it was longer than an orc. Lars grinned and he spawned scythes on his arms. We've got a juicy one. The infant dragon roared at him and released flames from its mouth. Lars quickly maneuvered his way out of it and he went to its back. He slashed its tail and it got cut off. It roared in pain and it rampaged around. Lars then grabbed the fallen tail and he started chewing on it. Why do you all taste like chicken? It doesn't matter, it's high quality anyway. He taunted the dragon who glared at him hatefully. Charging with reckless abandon, it wants to trample the enemy. But Lars charged head on as well. With his lithe body, he attacked. HNGH. A heavy thud resounded as he kneed its chin. Its jaw shattered into pieces and was concussed to oblivion. Lars pointed his palm on its head and a spike appeared out of it. I can use the tusks of needle rabbits as pile drivers at least. Lars looked at the dragon that struggled a bit before dying. Let's see if you're a bit more filling than the others. He started eating it and it was more delicious than the previous ones. He reached the middle floors and the minotaurs interested him. I wonder if you taste like steaks. A pack of them roared at him and they charged at him. Lars caught the first one by the horns and he slammed it on the ground. He breathed in deeply and he roared as well. Oscillatory waves that the bad bats use in the upper floors was released. 
a sonic wave ruptured the eardrums of the minotaurs and they were stunned. Lars then tore off the horn of the concussed minotaur on the ground and he stabbed it right in the eye with it. I hope these guys don't have mad cow disease. Lars started eating its head and it had exquisite brains. Ooh. I like that. He eyed the others and he grinned. Minotaur steak hoy? Too bad I can't cook you medium rare. Lars charged at them and he started hacking them to pieces with his crystal scythes. Grabbing their eyes with his black, bladed claws. And stabbing them with tusks that spawned from his palms. I'll eat you until nothing is left, aren't I a respectful person? Lars began his feast. Sounds of flesh tearing and bones being crunched resounded as the other monsters around looked at him warily. Chapter 20, Interest In a manner that is only slightly smaller than Demeter's familia home, a red-haired goddess had her eyes open in shock. Loki? Loki? Are you okay? Riveria tried to get her back from La La Land. Let her digest the information Riveria. It must be shocking. I was shocked to the bone too. Finn smiled wryly. Yet. Yeah. The fastest level up in history, past, future, and present. Gareth couldn't believe it either. And everything started a little bit earlier. Finn who was trying to get information in the guild about Evil Us was about to return to their familiar home, the Twilight Manor. He was also hoping to get any information about the palum that decimated the parade pass in the 27th floor. As someone who wanted to be the symbol of hope for the palum race who was seen as weak, he wanted to thank them. It was really good PR. Because if it wasn't for him, dozens upon dozens more of adventurers would have died. Did you hear? It's crazy the Demeter Familia must be creating an expedition group. An adventurer started to partake in gossip. Yeah man, insane. A freshly minted level 1? Reaching level 2 in just 2 months. The man shook his head in disbelief. 2 months. Finn strained his ear to listen to them. I heard it's a silver-haired warrior princess on the rise. One of the adventurers were spreading false information. And if Ermid was to hear it, she would die of embarrassment. Um, excuse me. Is this perhaps true? Finn asked a guild employee. Eh, uh, Mr. Braver. Yes, this has been confirmed. A new adventurer that hasn't received a previous fauna leveled up. She's in the Demeter Familia. And it only took her two months, amazing right? The woman was awestruck. And her appearance won't lose to the sword princess too. The people are even starting to call them the silver and gold princesses. Is that so, thank you for the information. Finn quickly went back to the twilight manor to report this. A new variable just appeared. Everyone should know this. Finn hurried. Arriving at the familia home, he called Riveria and Gareth. What's the matter Finn? You look rattled. Gareth was worried for his friend. Did something happen, Finn? Riveria raised a brow and Finn who is normally calm doesn't get like that often. It's about an adventurer. Someone from the Demeter Familia broke ace record by ten months. Finn revealed. T ten months? Are you sure you aren't doped as hell right now? Gareth didn't believe him at all. Are you sure about that, Finn? We all know how ace got to level two. She was like a girl possessed, killing anything in the dungeon. Riveria furrowed her brows. If that was true, then a monster just appeared. And they were in the Demeter Familia. An agricultural familia. And their little sword princess was trained by the warriors of the Loki Familia. It's true. A guild employee confirmed it. Finn nodded at them. What a damned monster. Who is she? What's her name? Gareth imagined someone like that growing with proper guidance. And due to Ermid having been a new arrival in Orario. Coupled with the fact that they don't really talk with their familia members. She boasted that all her stats were at S rank. And it was confirmed by the guild. All at S rank? In two months? Are you trying to prank me, Finn? Ace leveled up when her Agi got to D, immediately. That's how she broke the record. Riveria was doubtful. Everything was confirmed true by the guild. There's a monster in the Demeter Familia that's going to take Orario by storm. And she's just 13 years old right now. Not to mention that she has magic, but she didn't share it. Finn frowned. Watcha talking about? Loki saw their glum faces and she thought they lost a bet or something. Loki, Finn just learned that there's an adventurer in the Demeter Familia that broke a level up record. Gareth informed her. What? Demeter? How can she have someone that talented? Loki's closed eyes suddenly opened. 
Guess how fast she did it too. Riveria was amused by Loki's reaction. It shouldn't be too far right? About ten or eleven months. Loki guessed. Correct, she did it ten months faster. Finn revealed and Loki bugged out. Now, we return to the present. I need to meet up with Demeter. She must be planning something. Loki gritted her teeth. She's an agricultural goddess, Loki. Finn deadpanned at her. I don't care. With boobs like that, she's not trustworthy. Just like that lowly cow. Loki stormed out of the place. Oh boy, we better think of an apology now or we'll be eating rotten vegetables for a year. Gareth shook his head helplessly. Demeter Sama won't do that, but we must apologize. Riveria frowned at Loki's antics. Ha! Huh. Come on, let's follow her. Finn rolled his eyes and they followed their whimsical goddess. Underscore underscore wheat manor underscore underscore. You didn't gain much exilia, Lars. Demeter handed him his status sheet. Lars Johansson, level 1. STR, I0I87, 1534, 1786. AGI, I0I78, 1489, 1677. Dex, I0I53, 1732, 1792. VIT, I0I37, 1684, 1843. Mag, I0H105, 1943, 2345. Lars checked his stats and they didn't grow much for a level 1 adventurer. Which was to be expected. Cursed EXP gains, this Exilia crap is pure ass. Though my hidden stats are growing nicely. Lars rubbed his chin. All in all, his stats were approximately as high as a fully maxed out level 2. Which was unrealistic, because people don't max their stats before leveling up. Except a single person. A complete noob mistake, he thought. So in his current state, he could beat up weaker level 3s by pure specs alone. Demeter. Explain yourself. Loki was making a commotion in the front gates of the Wheat Manor. Ha, I knew that some troublemakers would arrive. But Loki hey? I guess that's par for the course. Demeter sighed. Hmm? Loki? Why is she here to cause trouble, Demeter? Lars raised a brow. If they were going to bully his goddess, then two can play at that game. He's got a bomb waiting to explode and he wasn't afraid to sick it on them. Come, walk with me and let's talk about it. Demeter chuckled. It's actually because of Ermid, she broke a record by hitting level 2 the fastest. And Loki has a child that was the previous holder of it. Demeter explained. Ah, uh -huh, then that person must be impressive. After all, to be compared with Ermid that used my superpower leveling strat. Lars nodded sagely. Demeter chortled. Ace Wallenstein, she broke the record for leveling up to two in a year. That's why Loki is suspicious. Demeter looked at the gates. And her executives looked at the farmers of the Demeter Familia with apologetic expressions as they tried to stop her. Wait, what? A year? If that's the fastest, then aren't the adventurers in this city a bunch of hopeless noobs? Lars was shocked for a different reason. Noobs, hey? I guess if compared to Ermid's feet, it was really slow. Demeter shrugged. But she looked at him, he was the one who power leveled Ermid in the dungeon. Just what did you put her through to beat the Sword Princess record by miles? Demeter almost shuddered at the thought. Aero Loki? It seems that you are quite distressed. Demeter smiled at her demurely. Mew. What are you planning, Demeter? Those with huge tits like you can't be trusted at all. Loki stared at her in suspicion. Mah, I don't think your children are appreciating your actions, Loki. Demeter pointed at her executives. Oi. Let go of me, you hear me. Loki was struggling like a kid that was having a tantrum. Loki, you better stop this nonsense. Or I won't let you drink for a year. Riveria glared at her. The goddess gasped immediately. You wouldn't. Loki's closed eyes opened up. Try me. Riveria stared right at her and Loki started coughing. Hello, my fellow goddess Demeter. Can you explain why your new adventurer hit level 2 so fast? Loki's tune changed so fast. Ha 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 ha. She's funny as hell, isn't she? Lars pointed at Loki and the orange-haired goddess snapped her neck towards him. Who? 
Loki raised a brow at him. The kid was a little too fearless. This is Lars, one of my new adventurers. Demeter gestured for him to introduce himself. Yo, I'm Lars. He had a confident smile on his face and the Loki familia actually thought he was the one who leveled up. But Riveria checked him out, he was too small for a 13-year-old. And it was also established that the adventurer has silver hair. Not to mention that it was supposed to be a she. Hello, Lars. Sorry for the behavior of our goddess, her antics can get a little. Finn apologized. It's fine, Loki hey. Lars' eyes suddenly went towards the goddess and he observed her with a critical eye. For a split second, his pupils turned to slits and his golden eyes glowed. With her divinity, she must be holding back a lot of her impulses to trick people and kill them for fun. Lars squinted his eyes. Loki wasn't just a playful god. Loki was malicious and an agent of chaos. So he was surprised that she could even form a familia. Their divinities must be really suppressed here in Gakai. It's nice to see you, goddess Loki. Lars bowed and the others saw the blatant change in his behavior. Why so formal, kid? Loki tried to play it off, but his words shook them. It's simple, I don't trust you at all. A god that plays around with human lives, you think all of this is a game, don't you? The tension increased suddenly. They could feel his hostility. And the executive started sweating at the otherworldly pressure he was starting to emit. If you were serious in trying to close the dungeon, then why did you exile Zeus? Their familias finished two of the three great quests. Lars was getting heated. Lars, how about you go and play outside for a bit? Demeter was panicking inside. The malice coming from him started to make her nervous. His skill is starting to activate. That kind of hatred can only be matched by the dungeon. We're not finished here, Loki. Lars looked at her like she was a heinous criminal and he went to the dungeon. Who? Who is that, Demeter? Loki furrowed her brows. Ermit's partner, don't take it against him Loki. He has a bad experience with gods. Demeter explained and Loki nodded. It was all directed at you Loki, that malice and hatred. It felt like the dungeon was walking around. Riveria who was sensitive to things like that furrowed her brows. My thumb's hurting, we need to look out for him. Finn was worried. He could feel it in his bones, he wasn't normal at all. The lad's just a wee boy, what are you so worried about? He most likely has a past trauma. Gareth reasoned. He moves like her, Gareth. I will never forget the sheer confidence and movements of that person. Riveria furrowed her brows. Who? Gareth couldn't remember, but then. Someone suddenly entered his mind. They were but level 5 then. The monster of calamitous talent? But how? Gareth shuddered when he remembered that woman. I don't know. But I don't want to know. If he's the next incarnation of her. Riveria was scared. He definitely didn't like Loki. And when they fought Alfia a year ago, she was obviously holding back against them, by miles. And here he was, walking around in broad daylight, someone like her. Wait, is he perhaps the reason why Demeter's adventurer leveled up to two? Finn wondered. I think you've overstayed your welcome, Loki Demeter didn't want them there for a single more second. Why yet? Loki hasn't seen someone look at her with such cold eyes before. Chapter 21, Sword Princess Lars was currently in front of a challenge. A gigantic humanoid monster, the Goliath. Using the least amount of augments possible, he was basically naked. The fur of the barbarian was his only protection. And it was for ricochets and pebbles that will be flying around. The scythes on his arms were longer, for the larger monster in front of him. And that was about it. Sporting the stats of an average level 3, he was going to fight a floor boss, a monster Rex. It's said to be level 4 in strength, let's see how this guy holds up to the green dragon. Lars looked at it coldly. The Goliath roared as it sprinted at him. It was definitely fast due to its size. But it had a trade-off. And it wasn't as agile or dexterous as a normal level 4 adventurer. Lars rolled to the side and the ground cratered as the Goliath's fist crashed at his previous location. What a dangerous guy you are. Too bad I don't have a sling. Lars snorted and he used the opening it gave. He went between its legs and the monster raised its foot, intent on stomping him into a paste. Lars clung to its other foot and he used the husk of the needle rabbits as pile drivers on the back of its heel. The Goliath roared in pain, having a stick pierce through your heel hurts like a bitch. And he left it there, 
inhibiting the mobility of the Goliath. Its left feet was definitely hurting. Did you like it? Lars backed off and he smirked at the Goliath. It glared at him hatefully. Its red eyes glowed brightly and it released a roar that shook the whole seventeenth floor. Monsters also started to trickle in from the entrances that leads to the Wall of Sorrow. The place where the monster Rex spawns. Guhahaha. Yes. Call more EXP. Lars charged at the hordes of Liger Fangs and Minotaurs. With his scythes, he felt like a monster hunter as he swung them around like dual blades. Lars turned into a meat grinder as he waited for the monsters to come at him. The light scythes on his arms made of hard crystal basically weighed like nothing to him. Lars then looked above as a shadow loomed over him. A boulder? What are you? A tank. Lars rolled to the side and he dodged the boulder that the Goliath threw. Come and have it you prick. Lars sprinted towards the monster Rex and it stomped on the ground in frustration and fury. Like someone trying to kill a cockroach, it rampaged around and the whole floor was trembling. Lars used the clouds of dust as cover and he waited for a chance. An opening. He suddenly appeared behind the Goliath. The little adventurer sliced its Achilles tendon with a precision strike and the Goliath kneeled down due to its calf muscle suddenly getting pulled. He wasn't done though, he cocked his arm back as he stabbed another tusk on its left Achilles heel with his completely natural pile bunker. Unable to stand up, the Goliath roared and it tried to strike him with its fists. Creating craters all around the perimeter. Now, to do this Resident Evil 4 style. He jumped on its back and he ran towards its neck. Lars stabbed it with a tusk and he used them as handles to hold on. But he didn't expect it to lift itself with its muscular arms and used its momentum to crash down on its back. Shit. Lars was in midair and he couldn't change his trajectory. A breath attack would take too long. He turned around and poisonous spines appeared on his back. With a resounding boom, he was flattened to the ground. The Goliath slowly lifted itself with its arms, but it suddenly felt a stabbing pain inside of it. The pain was too much and it started thrashing around. It even began to punch its midsection. And after a few seconds, a hole opened up on its abdomen. Lars burrowed through its back and he wreaked havoc inside of it. He was chewing some chunks of meat and he had a wide smile on his face. You taste like black pork, exquisite. Lars gulped and the Goliath was bleeding out due to the immense internal hemorrhage. Let's test this out, ahem. Lars combined the ability of the bad bats and the Goliath's intimidating roar that was its ability. The whole floor shook from the vibrations and it was like a roar of victory of another predator who prevailed. Lars then ran at it like a savage beast and cut off all of its tendons and ligaments. The weakened Goliath yelped as the damage accumulated on it. Let me savor you well, thanks for the food. He went ham on the monster Rex as he began to pick it clean, even crunching on its hard bones. And when he finished with one of its legs, the Goliath couldn't take it anymore as it died. Hmm, at least it isn't wiggling around anymore. Lars feasted like a starving beast. He ate the Goliath deliciously until nothing but its hair was left. And it took him a solid hour of doing so. Storing the large magic stone it had, Lars had a satisfied expression on his face as his muscles started bulge a bit. He just had a quality meal, and his body responded in kind. Making his skin harder, his muscles stronger, bigger. Lars' skeleton turned metallic and his sinew were like steel wires. His bulging muscles compacted and his weight skyrocketed as he put on more dense muscle. The weight of his whole body doubling after his changes finished. Phew that was nice Lars finally found the best way to exploit his skill, Gula. And it isn't by eating magic stones and drop items. It's by devouring them whole in their peak. I feel like a physical cultivator. Lars shuddered as he thought about the murder hobos. And as he slicked back his hair that was covered with blood, he suddenly met eyes with a more yellowish gold. Pick. Ah, hi. Lars waved awkwardly as he started sweating, thinking if the girl saw him remold his body as he evolved. Hello. She said with a blank face and they stared at each other. Underscore underscore earlier underscore underscore. A girl was killing time in the dungeon and she killed any monster that was in her way. Too weak. Not enough. When will be the next expedition? She frowned. I will never grow strong in these floors, we need to go deeper. But Riveria told me not to dive deeper than the 17th floor. The girl frowned. She had yellowish, gold hair and her eyes were dark gold. Hmm. She suddenly felt tremors. A party is fighting the Goliath. She tilted her head. I should call the monsters here then. She wanted to help them a bit. 
because the parties mostly died due to the minotaurs and liger fangs appearing as they fought the goliath. Getting rid of them, she let the first wave in because they were too fast. But the others didn't made it past her as she swung her sword around with amazing speed. Phew it's been quiet there for some time now. She headed towards the wall of sorrow and what she saw was a boy. Oozing with confidence and arrogance, he slicked his hair and he had an eerie smile on his face. His golden eyes that were brighter than hers locked onto her own. Ah. So. What's your name? He asked her to break the ice. Ace. Ace Wallenstein. She introduced herself succinctly. Hmm, you can call me Lars. You must be strong to be here. He asked with curiosity. Un, I'm level three. She said with her blank tone and expression. And he was surprised by that. Level three? Then you must be really amazing. And he meant it. She must be a kindred soul, a fellow grinder. Lars nodded at her in satisfaction. Ace then tilted her head in confusion at his gestures. But you must be a level five. How can you defeat the Goliath on your own? It might be said to be a level four, but it's a monster Rex. So its difficulty is about level five. Ace suddenly talked in long sentences. Ah, you see. I'm not level five, at all. Lars scratched his head sheepishly. He then bathed himself on his own flame to burn off the blood off of him. Fixing his hair, Ace saw his face. Un, you are handsome. She nodded at him and she has never seen such a beautiful boy before. Uh, thanks. He didn't know what to say to that. You're welcome, then perhaps. Are you a palom who is level six? Ace tilted her head in confusion. I'm human, at least that's what I like to believe. I don't even know myself. He shrugged with a snort. Then what level are you? Her head was about to start smoking due to the mental gymnastics happening in her head. Hmm, it's a secret. Lars put a finger on his lips and Ace pouted at him. Just say you don't want to tell me. Ace got a bit angry and he chuckled. Well, everyone has secrets, Ace. How about you? What if I asked why you grew so strong, will you tell me? He gave her a perspective. And someone around his age reaching level 3? There's a certain motivation around that. It's impossible for a kid to get to that level without a burning desire for something. Lars squinted his eyes. I... I understand, sorry for pushing. Ace bowed and he patted her head softly. It's fine, how about you make it up to me later? I'm from the Demeter Familia, a meal at the Hostess of Fertility will be good enough. Lars smiled at her. Ace put a hand on her head. Hmm. That felt nice. She then nodded at him. I'll go ask for you in the wheat manor. Ace then continued farming monsters. Hmm, what drives her? A question for another time. Lars went back to the surface. Underscore underscore twilight manor underscore underscore. Ace returned to her home and she was staring right at her reflection on a mirror. She patted her head and she wanted to experience it again, it was. Warm. Ace, what's got you thinking so deeply? Riveria, who was kind of her like foster mother put a hand on her shoulder. I met someone who killed the Goliath on his own. He was. Nice I guess. She tilted her head. She wasn't sure how to describe Lars. Nice? Wow, you don't warm up to strangers that easily. Un, he was covered in blood. Then when he cleaned himself by bathing in fire, his golden eyes locked onto mine. Ace described their meeting. Riveria then thought about it and there were no first-class adventurers that matched his description at all. But I offended him, I tried to ask what level he was. But he explained that everyone has secrets. Ace looked down in shame. Did he now? Riveria raised a brow. Nobody ever hides their level. It was a badge of honor. Un, he then patted my head. It was nice. So I owe him and I'll go to the Wheat Manor to treat him to the Hostess of Fertility. Ace was determined to pay him back. Alarm bells started ringing inside of Riveria's mind. H how old was he? I actually thought he was a palom, but he said he was human. And we were the same age. Ace looked at Riveria with confusion. A.N. What's his name? She gulped heavily. Lars. Ace said and Riveria broke into a cold sweat. A bead of it formed on her brow. I see, then I hope you get along with him. Riveria's smile was strained, but Ace was too socially inept to notice her stress. Un, I want to know how he got so strong. 
Ace had a smidgen of a smile on her face. This is bad. Ace is warming up to that dangerous kid. Riveria frowned as she turned around. And isn't he supposed to be level 1? Finn already checked his profile. Demeter Sama isn't the type to scheme. Something isn't adding up here. Riveria was getting paranoid. Chapter 22, Twin Troublemakers Lars was once again, roaming around Orario. Sampling the myriad of foods. Because there were tons of them. And he couldn't get a taste of all of it in just one day. Hmm, a map? Now that I think about it, I don't know the geography of the world at all. Lars took a look at it. Mountains hey. I should probably make a fortress in the mountains. Lars thought of a place where they couldn't be sieged. Melon is a good choice. Lars thought of an island. With aquatic monsters, those with the diver do won't be able to get in stealthily. Harpies and flying monsters can bomb ships from high up in the sky. And they can barricade the island, booby trap the shores with a shit ton of mines. Nations will be met with D-Day and the survivors will smell diesel for their whole lives. But how can we move so many Xenos outside Orario like that? Lars frowned at the difficulty of that endeavor. Fells might be able to help, but smuggling that many monsters would be a pain in the ass. I have to find another way. Lars furrowed his brows. Here, here. We'll join any familia that can defeat us. Lars heard a girl shout and he craned his neck to the side. There was a stand where two Amazons were finessing people for money. Picks. The one with longer hair held a sign saying 10k Valis a try. And the winner will win 100k. Along with them joining their familia. Amazons sure try crazy things. Lars remembered them and they deserved their race name. Ten ladies that are bred for battle. And the two of them were what? Ten or eleven. And they have a pile of adventurers around. A lot of them definitely tried. Hmm. I do need more people. Ermid might be doing fine as an up-and-coming paladin, but I need others to join me in diving. Lars squinted his eyes. He can't level up in the middle floors at all. No matter how much he beats up the Goliath. It was too slow, too dumb and the shitty high-quality Exilia he needs won't be found there. So he has to go deeper. And the Amazons looked like they were high-level threes. Because there was one bastard that boasted he was his familia's captain and he was level three. And the one with short hair beat the ever-living shit out of him. They're used to fighting humans. He shook his head at the adventurers. Fighting monsters is definitely different to battling with humans. And their technique wasn't half-baked too. It was something that they used frequently against others. Damn, they're practicing cannibalism in their homeland. Lars frowned heavily as he thought about their goddess, Kali. That kind of anti-personnel martial arts can't grow if it isn't tried and tested against other people. And that only means one thing. They were having death matches with each other. And the loser is cannibalized. There are no strong monsters in Tel Skyra. So they use each other to gain Exilia. Lars gritted his teeth. Hey, I would like to try. Lars tossed the longer-haired girl a bag of valis. Are you sure? You don't look like much. The long-haired Amazon raised a brow at him. Bring it, or are you scared? Lars taunted her and she glared at him. Ah, uh -huh, Tioni. Are you gonna take that lying down? Her sister goaded her on. I'll make you regret that, I won't be holding back. And shut up Tiona. Tioni charged at Lars. She tried to slug him on the face but she definitely did hold back. He was just a kid after all. But she was surprised when his cloak flew away from him and he caught her fist with one hand. Wah! I put enough force into that to knock out a level two. Tioni was shocked and she couldn't get her hand back. Let's dance, shall we? Lars suddenly jumped in the air and he spun. Tioni was suddenly smacked right on the temple with a spinning heel kick and her eyes turned hollow. Lars had the strength of an average level three and his agility wasn't lagging behind. Mass X velocity is equal to force. And Tioni crashed on the ground face first. His boots hit the ground and the tapping sounds resounded. Everybody went quiet and mouths were gaping. Why you? I'll beat the shit out of you. Tiona went berserk and she charged at him. Lars observed her movements and he compared her to Alfia. So slow. He parried all of her blows and due to their strength, air pressure was coming off of the clashes. He didn't know how, but Alfia knew Wing Chun and he used it against her. With quick movements of his hands, her punches were redirected and Lars chopped her on the neck. 
she was broken out of her rage and Lars went ham on her. Lars threw a flurry of punches on her body and his right hand slapped her on the face. He then followed it up with a spinning roundhouse. Sending her spiraling into the ground. HNGH. He received a sucker punch from behind and Tioni who recovered ambushed him. Hey. That was dirty. The adventurers started jeering at them. T there's no such thing in a fight. Tioni blushed in shame and she protested. Then I can do this, right? Lars appeared behind her and he did a German suplex on her. Ack. Tioni felt her world get rocked as the impact created a crater on the ground. Lars then lifted her up in the air and he started a wombo combo on her. An onslaught of punches and hand chops hit her torso, neck, and face. He then ended it with a spinning back kick on her right side. Ugh. Tioni dropped as she tried to breathe in air. But it felt like the whole world was shutting down as he gave her a liver shot. Lars wiped his nose that bled a bit and he went wide-eyed. Bending backwards, he saw a tanned girl lunge at empty space right above him. He then planted his hand on the ground and kicked Diona upwards. She was sent to the air and he jumped after her. I always wanted to try this. Primary Lotus. He grabbed her after spinning and Lars let go of Tiona before they hit the ground. Tiona's head was buried into the ground and her body went limp. My prize please. Lars smiled at Tioni as he pulled Tiona out of the ground so she could breathe. T that kid is crazy. The ones watching started to cheer. Shit, the police are here. Lars could see guild members pushing the crowd away. Follow me. Lars carried Tiona and Tioni ran after him as they escaped towards the Wheat Manor. That was close. Lars put down Tiona softly and he wiped his sweat. Who are you? Tioni looked at him curiously. Me? I'm Lars, nice to meet ya. My new subordinates Lars grinned at Tioni. Subordinates hey? I guess the weak does have to follow the strong. What level are you anyways? Tioni wondered. He looked a bit younger than them. About the same age really, yet they couldn't do anything to him. And the Amazon twins were from Telskyra. The Amazons are known for their martial prowess. Well, I'm level 1. I just registered a couple of months ago you know. Lars shrugged. He can't really hide it. They were going to be a part of the Demeter Familia. And the twins will know from either her or Ermid. Hmm, though it is fortunate that they are from Telskyra. They don't exactly have a bitter and hateful relationship with monsters. Lars decided to wait first. Monsters and people have been fighting for millennia. And before Babel, the tower above the dungeon was made a thousand years ago. The monsters were able to roam around. But no god wants to tell any mortal about the true history of the dungeon and how monsters came about. Filthy gods. Selfish bastards as expected. Lars clicked his tongue and Tioni who was shocked at Lars' level shuddered. Ah, you don't believe me then. He noticed Tioni's disbelief. Why yet? Yeah. How can a level beat the crap out of us? Who would believe that? Tioni huffed at him. Well, my goddess can prove it. Come on, let's go to Demeter. Lars pulled her and they went to the honey-haired goddess. Demeter I caught. I mean, I recruited two more members. Lars pointed at Tioni and Tioni who was on his shoulder. Aira you do know that kidnapping people is illegal, Lars she teased him. Lars sweated a bit as they did kidnap Ermit and basically threatened her. Of course I know that. Ahem, they lost a bet against me you see. Lars explained. Amazons, then you fought against him. Demeter concluded and Tioni nodded. Goddess, is he really a level one? Tioni didn't believe him one bit. Yes, yes he is. Demeter confirmed and Lars had a smug look on his face. What? But we're high level threes. How can he beat us? Tioni shouted in surprise. Wazut. Tiona stirred and Lars put her down softly. Tiona. We've been beaten to a pulp by a level one. Tioni shook her and Tiona sobered up at that. What? Let me at M. There you are. We demand a rematch. Tiona thought he was cheating or something. Now, now, children. You lost to him fair and square. Demeter scolded them and they whimpered. Gods have a divine aura after all. It is the reason why the executives of the Loki Familia couldn't really stop Loki except with words. Yes goddess. They looked down on the ground in frustration. Demeter, convert them please. Tioni, Tiona, I'm Lars. Welcome to the Demeter Familia, the exploration group to be exact. 
Lars smiled at them. Tione blushed at his kind smile and Tione returned his gesture. So you're like the leader of the exploration squad. Tiona was excited. Umu, we will be diving deep into the dungeon with our resident doctor, Ermid. Lars told them that he'll introduce her later. After that, they were conv by Demeter without much problem. Let's go to the dungeon. Dungeon Tiona was really excited to dive. Okay, I guess we can do that. Lars sighed, he did also want to see how they'll fare. Are you sure about this Lars? I mean, we're not prepared at all. Tione fidgeted around. Oi! Why are you acting weird? Tiona looked at her with a raised brow. W what do you mean? I have always been like this. Tione gave her a meaningful look. But their twin telepathy didn't seem to work and Tiona just snickered at her. What? You're a violent and stiff girl. Tiona laughed at her and Tione sucker punched her. Hey, easy there. Lars smiled wryly. Amazons really do communicate with their fists. Ah. Please don't think I'm a violent woman, Lars. Tione looked like she just saw a ghost. Don't worry, Tiona was teasing you. Just a little sibling bonding is what happened. Lars chuckled. Tione sighed in relief and Tiona rubbed her jaw as she glared at Tione. That hurt. Humph, that's what you get for insulting a lady, Tiona. Tione huffed at her. They then went to the dungeon. Speed running to the middle floors. So Tione is more versatile and roguelike. While Tiona is the berserker type. Lars observed them. The two were also intelligent. They knew that Lars wanted to know how they fought against monsters. So they didn't mind him just observing from a distance. Tione wielded two kukris and she had a couple of throwing knives on her holsters. Her sister meanwhile, wielded a double-bladed sword. Though she had a backup short sword which was smart. Lars clapped in that for their attention. What is it Lars? They both asked. This is too routine, too easy. I'm going to do something different. He started to release pheromones. And it was proven and tested, the Xenos loved his scent when he released it. Why are we just standing around? Tiona was confused. Shut up Tiona, Lars obviously knows what he's doing. Tione glared at her. Don't worry, just wait for it. Lars smirked. He then also opened his mouth. No sound was coming from his mouth, but the twins could feel it with their keen senses. They could feel the vibrations coming from his throat. He was doing something. And after a few minutes, a stampede of minotaurs, liger fangs, hellhounds, and wyverns appeared. Uh huh. Isn't this really bad? Tione gulped as she saw the monster parade. Do you want to know my secret to become strong? Lars put out his hand to the side and a massive hunk of metal appeared. It was in the shape of a sword, but its edges were blunt. It's basically a steel club. I'm a farmer of the Demeter Familia, so I do what we do best. Farm these experience points. Lars charged and the stunned twins gawked at him. Boys grow slower than girls, so he was shorter than them. And seeing him swing that ridiculous sword, fighting hordes of monsters on his lonesome awed them. Hey, Tione. Doesn't he look like a hero? Tiona asked with shining eyes. He does. And what do heroes need? A worthy companion. Tione charged as well at the horde of monsters. Hey. Not fair. Tiona grinned as she also went in, swinging her weapon that could rival his in weight. Chapter 23, Modern Warfare After running Tione and Tiona ragged, Lars dropped them at the Wheat Manor. Lars, you're crazy. The twins dropped down in front of the manor and he was wiping some sweat. That was a good run girls. He looked like and sounded like he just went for a jog. Ha, ha, how are you not level 2? Tione asked incredulously. Well, it's because I'm too awesome. So I need to go deeper in the dungeon first. Lars shrugged. But he suddenly got an idea. Wait. Shouldn't I just make things harder? Lars thought of buying some tools. He remembered Alfia's disease and Lars wondered if it was a contributor for her quick growth. I should have some weights made, buy some poisons, or even better, curses. Lars had a grin on his face. Alfia was like a leaky pipe back then. She was leaking mana while she fought. Her body was in agony while in combat. Paralysis took hold of her body, and her muscles felt sluggish as she moved. Her disease was fucking ridiculous. And now, she was waiting around to be unleashed all over the world. We'll be doing it again and again, 
prepare yourselves girls. And I also remembered a procedure to make us grow faster. He grinned at them. I don't even want to know what it is. Tiona shuddered. You really have something like that. Tioni was instead excited. Yeah. And we'll really start when our doctor's vacation finishes. Lars had a bright smile on his face. Ermid right? I've heard rumors about her. It's said that she leveled up to two in a few months. Tiona was flabbergasted. Eh, that's due to our hard work and dedication to the grind. Lars nodded sagely. Say. Do you think we'll grow really strong too? Tioni wondered. And when I get enough stats to overpower him. Tioni started to giggle with a sleazy smile on her face. Why yet? What are you going to do when you level up though? He raised a brow. And nothing. Tioni sobered up and she started muttering again. Bah. Leave her be, so? Isn't this like the start of a new legend? Tiona was excited. She has admired the stories of Hero ever since they were children. It was one of the things that kept her going. Despite the cruelty of their home, tell Skyra. Now rest for now, you're going to need it tomorrow. He grinned at them and the twins gulped. When Lars left, the twins looked at each other. You think we'll survive? Tiona asked. I hope so. I can't make babies with him otherwise. Tioni smiled wryly. Hey. That's not fair. He'll definitely prefer me. Just wait when we grow up. Tiona believed she would have a dynamite body. Humph, my longer hair attracts boys better. Tioni huffed at her and they started arguing. Aira Lars sure is popular. Demeter chuckled as she watched the twins fight each other. Underscore underscore Goibnia Familia underscore underscore. Lars went to the Goibnia Familia, a smaller smith-type familia than the Hephaestus Familia. But their skill was roughly the same. Because he doesn't want to risk Hephaestus learning that he was commissioning weights. And based on Demeter's interaction with her, it was a no-brainer that they were good friends. I can't be having Demeter asking me questions. Lars thanked Ermid's magic that healed them good as new. Due to that, Demeter didn't really see them having wounds. A dwarf greeted Lars when he entered. Watch I need kid. He was a bit short. But he didn't have a massive head like Gareth, though he does have a nice beard. Hi, I need weighted clothes. As heavy as you can make them. And ones that are lined with lead. Lars requested. Weighted clothes. The dwarf was confused. It's for training. Lars looked at him seriously. Oh, okay. But the heaviest material besides lead is gold and adamantite you know. The smith thought that would cost a fortune. How much do you need? It doesn't matter. Lars tapped on the floor with his heel. H.O.H. You some kind of rich, young master? Then, we will need to basically make weighted armor. The smith started calculating. And due to Lars wanting as much material to weigh him down, it was going to be extremely expensive. Because it was going to use as much metal as weapons the size of Tiona's double-bladed sword. The heaviest adamantite in the deeper floors is going to cost you about 100 mvalis. The smith gave his price. Lars rubbed his chin and he thought about it. That's a pretty good price. But I refuse. The smith sighed and he thought that would be par for the course. The lead ones. He was about to offer the lead lined ones, but his eyes bugged out when Lars dropped something on the counter. This luster. This weight. This is adamantite. And it's practically pure. The smith was shocked. Hey kid, can you sell some to us? I'm Wilhelm, this is some high quality stuff. He was overwhelmed. Well, I don't really need money right now. But I guess I can spare an ingot's worth. Lars shrugged. And that would be 50 million valis. Know what? I'll make your training clothes for free. Ha 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 ha. He laughed. Wilhelm didn't really finesse him, so Lars nodded. My citizens sure do pay their taxes well. He had a sleazy smile on his face. Make another two sets for me, and one made with gold. Lars took out ingots of adamantite and gold. The lead ones would be for newbies. They had to progress with their training equipment. You got it kid. Wilhelm nodded at him. Adamantite of that quality was really low in supply due to evil us. So he was happy to make some more sets for it. Nice doing business with you. Make them skin tight. Making them loose would be detrimental for their development. I'll pick them up later, Will. Lars waved as he exited the smithy. What a rich kid, 
how the hell could he get that much adamantite? Wilhelm thought about it for a moment. He then shrugged, it was time to make equipment. And he never thought that he'll be making training clothes with pure adamantite. Lars then called for the Alfia Express. We really need to have a tunnel system for you guys. Alfia was annoyed. But she was more willing to do it for him. There won't be problems if it was just Lars, but she didn't like carrying Ermid. When he got back to Monstro, he noticed that there were more clutter on his shed. FIA, what's Ermid doing? Lars asked and Alfia raised a brow at him. Don't call me that, and she has been making all kinds of potions non-stop. Alfia was satisfied at Ermid's hobby. The Xenos were now all carrying a couple of elixirs on them. High-class potions, antidotes, and nutritional potions too. Wow, Ermid has been busy. Let me go check if she's fine. He went to his shack. And when he opened it, he saw Ermid stirring something inside of a pretty large flask. Hey! Is that? Don't be startled, don't do that. Or we'll have a nasty explosion here. Lars looked at his stock of nitrocellulose. Oh? This? I saw you do this one time here. And when I did the same, it created that fluffy cotton. Ermid pointed at the product. Yeah, and it's pretty explosive. Not really kaboom explosive, but I've got a bit stocked up. Lars sighed. Ah, oh, I already know. I tried to light some on fire a while ago for a fire starter. Ermid shrugged. I guess humans can't escape their primal instinct of lighting things on fire. Lars smiled wryly. I'm not a pyromaniac. So, what are you making these for anyways? Ermid thought they were really good fire starters. But that's about it. She just continued making them because she was bored. And she didn't have the courage to ask Alfia to ferry her. The woman is absolutely terrifying. Well, I'm going to make a weapon you see. Lars started to explain it. It's called a gun, these will be explosives that will propel bullets. Lars made a replica with his ability from the obsidian soldiers. Ah, oh, it's bigger and pointy. Not like the balls that muskets use. Though nobles only collect them. Ermit shrugged. They were highly unreliable after all. Yeah, this baby can make armies of normal people that can mow down minotaurs. Lars smirked. Really? You're serious? She was gobsmacked. Though. I'm not a chemist. I already want to give up too. Lars was frustrated, it would take years upon years of research to make a modern gun. That's a shame, imagine our goblins wielding these with their lithe frames. Ermid looked at the replica of bullets and guns. Yeah, that's why I was thinking of making the entrance of the 39th floor a choke point. Making it a narrow passage would still be beneficial even if we don't have these, but it would be devastating for enemies. Lars sighed. Hmm. Can you explain to me the process on how these things work? Ermid was thinking seriously. Yeah, see these casings? They're supposed to contain propellants. The back of it has a detonator. Boom, then air pushes the bullet. Lars demonstrated. Domu, Domu, I see. Can you fetch me a little bit of mithril and auric alum? Ermid asked of him. Wait, you're not saying. Lars raised a brow at her. It really interested me. And my Mysterita can definitely replace the propellant and casings. Ermid smiled at him. I have some here. Lars took out the magical metals from his inventory. Though the two is much rarer than adamantite. Beautiful. I guess I should be able to do it. Ermid thought of an enclosed space. Wait, I'm going to specify the round it will shoot. Lars made a replica of a 308 round. I heard that snipers like this round better. Lars remembered something. They had sufficiently strong ballistic power to be accurate still at 800m away. And it was large enough to be able to take down stronger and tougher adventurers and monsters alike. Though for the home defense system, he'll definitely be thinking of machine guns that are mounted. Ermit started desigening it and she created a chamber that was lined with auric alum. Adamantite might be the metal used for weapons with the Durandal trait, indestructibility. But auric alum is called divine metal. And it was resistant to magic while being as strong or even stronger than adamantite. The barrel was then lined with adamantite. As it didn't need magic resistance. For the propellant, instead of a primer and this so-called gunpowder. Mithril will be put in the back of the chamber and connected to a treant handle. Ermid was in a creator's high. She quickly drew a design that was more efficient than normal guns. Because you just load it and shoot. And with her mystery day, 
she was going to put automatic spells in the chamber that would act as propellants. You're a genius Ermid. This won't even need to use a lot of mind. Lars checked out the design. Due to the Ulrich Alum chamber, it won't even overheat because of its magic resistance. The barrel is indestructible and won't need maintenance. It doesn't use gunpowder after all, so unless dirt comes in. It didn't need cleaning. All that's left is a spring-loaded magazine and a mechanism under the chamber is needed so it won't misfeed rounds inside. FIA. Alfia. Lars shouted at the top of his lungs outside his window. What? Are there intruders? She quickly appeared. No. But I know what we're gonna do today. He grinned widely at her. He showed Alfia Ermid's design. What's this? A magical artifact. Yup. And we'll be bringing modern warfare into this world. But with how rare mystery is? We'll be the only ones with this weapon. Lars grinned at her. Chapter 24, Large Tree Labyrinth So? You want to commission the whole Hephaestus Familia? And you're paying with goods? The red-haired goddess asked Lars. Umu, that's the case. Lars nodded at her and Demeter who he asked for a favor to set up a meeting with Hephaestus shrugged. Well, if Demeter thinks you can pay for it, why not? Hephaestus accepted. But what are you going to pay with, Lars? She was a bit strict and Hephaestus squinted her eyes. Ha, don't he doubting me too much, goddess. Lars put down a bar of adamantite in front of her. Take that, my loyal minions have been mining that for me. He cackled inside of his mind. Adamantite? How in the world did you get your hands on this? Hephaestus didn't exactly know him. And that means he was just a new adventurer. Trade secret, but Demeter here knows why. Lars winked at his goddess. Demeter thought about how he could get adamantite for a quick second. Ah, they must have found a vein while expanding their farm or something. Demeter nodded and Hephaestus sighed. Okay, you got me. What do you want made? Hephaestus asked. I want your familia, even the newbie smiths to make these. Lars gave her a piece of paper. And it was a 308, along with 50 BMGs. What is this weird metal thingy? Hephaestus looked at it with squinted eyes. It's new aridips that we will use. For home defense. Lars said seriously. And surprisingly, Demeter didn't sense a lie. Weird arrow tips. Hephaestus thought it would definitely be worse than current ones. But hey, she won't judge. It will be great practice for the new smiths. And it's pretty difficult to make too. Because everything needs to be consistent. Please check the dimensions of every arrowhead. Our bows are extremely special, it's a matter of life and death. Lars squinted his eyes. And once again, the two goddesses felt that was completely true. Surprising them a bit. Okay. Hephaestus nodded and Lars added a clause to their contract that nothing will get out of their smithies without being perfect. Glad to do business with you ma'am. Lars smiled as he shook her hand. Thanks, are you really sure you want to pay with adamantite? Hephaestus was thankful. But he could definitely do it with Valis instead. Yes, you're my goddess friend after all. Lars gave her a thumbs up. Demeter chuckled at him and she stood up. Then, it's time for us to go Hephaestus, it was nice to see you. The red-haired goddess nodded as they were both as busy as a bee. I'll have it delivered to the Wheat Manor, thank you for the medal, Lars. Hephaestus gave him a small smile. While they were walking back towards the Wheat Manor, Demeter couldn't help, but ask. Is it really for a defense system? What kind of arrow uses that arrowhead? Demeter tilted her head. Well, it's a weird crossbow you can say. And Ermit is making it for us. I'll even give you a few so the farmers can get rid of pests that roam around. Lars smiled at her. And I'd have no worries of it being taken. Just let Demeter bestow it a fauna. Lars found another exploit. And that is, objects can be given a god's blessing. Meaning, every gun blessed by Demeter will only be accessible by the familia. A gun blessed by a goddess, gun nuts would go crazy over that crap. Lars thought he could sell that for billions back on Earth. Really? You'll make something that precious with Ermid? Come here you. Demeter hugged him and he was again in bliss. As the twin mountains of Demeter tried to drown him in their voluptuousness. H-N-G-H. Humph. Pwa, I'm starting to think that you're doing this on purpose, Demeter. Lars deadpanned at her. Era? Is it not okay for a goddess to show her child her love? 
Demeter went fu 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 and he feared for his chastity. At least, his new body's chastity. You better prepare yourself when I'm like 14 or 15. You're lucky I don't have a libido yet. He huffed at her and Demeter laughed. They then returned after Lars gave the familia the new shipment of dungeon veggies. Which was super popular to the Germans of Orario. Hey are we going to the dungeon again? Tiona called out to Lars. And he saw a surprising scene, the twins were wearing straw hats and their hands had dirt on them. They were farming. As I expected, you girls are perfect. He gave them a thumbs up and the two were confused. Maha, they've been very good help Lars. Demeter smiled at the level threes. Demeter Sama, where should I put these? A blonde woman was carrying a crate. Lunoir. Lars was surprised at the sight of her. Lars? You're a part of my familia. Lunoir blinked. Ah, so you two have met? Lunoir here helps from time to time. Demeter explained. You haven't been to the hostess for some time now. Lunoir smiled at him. Well, been busy. You know? Getting new friends and leveling up Ermid. Lars shrugged. So you're the reason for the Silver Princess level up? Ermid blinked in surprise. Well, it was also thanks to her perseverance mind you. Lars thought that she was a hard worker. Then at least go to the hostess to eat sometimes. Chloe would like to apologize to you. Lunoir had a wry expression. Sure, but if she touches me. She'll be behind bars. He huffed and Lunoir chuckled. Demeter, who is she? Tioni asked as Lunoir walked away with her crate. She's our strongest member, a level 4. Demeter shrugged. Ah. Uh -huh. Then we'll quickly catch up to her then. Tiona had a wide smile on her face. Well, she doesn't do dungeon dives anymore. So you probably will. Demeter chortled at the Amazons. They were really lively. Then, let's go. We'll be going to the lower floors today. Lars now knows how they cooperate. And the twins were definitely going to be good at the lower floors. Besides, the deeper they go. The better the EXP. Be careful you three. Demeter put a hand on her cheek as she worried about them. They sounded like newbies, even though they would be fine. And that worried her. Don't worry goddess, we'll kick the monsters. Tiona grinned. Underscore underscore 19 th floor underscore underscore. Ah. You shitty ass bear. Tiona wrestled with a bugbear. A monster that was pretty much on par with a minotaur, but faster. And she was currently wearing a skin-tight suit that was lined with lead. Making her weight essentially triple. Lars. Is this really necessary? Tioni was sweating bullets. She was poisoned, not accidentally. But purposefully, Tiona was too. It was the poison of a spider monster called Dream Spider. Its effects are pretty obvious. There's also a weak paralysis poison in their system that Lars diluted. And that means, their bodies were sluggish. Their minds were drifting. And they were weighed down by their training clothes. I'm wearing adamantite lined clothes, want to use that instead. Lars was having a fist fight against a troll. And being the instigator of this, he of course was poisoned to the maximum. Panting heavily while sweating bullets, Lars is being poisoned to oblivion. You won't need to worry about poison if you're already poisoned. Lars ripped off the troll's arm and whacked its head with it. He then tapped on his temple. His idea was truly a big brain moment. Just because there are a lot of poisonous plants here. Doesn't mean we should poison ourselves beforehand. Tiona complained as she suplexed the bugbear. A boar then charged at Tioni and she stopped it through its tusk. Raya. She held onto its tusks and kicked it right on the face, caving in its face in. Ha, ha, good job ladies. Lars was panting heavily. But he had a smile on his face. It seems that he would be gaining a lot of EXP in the lower floors. And that made him ecstatic. You. You're crazy. Tiona gave him an exasperated look. I if this is what it takes to be a budding hero's companion. Then so be it. Tioni had fire in her eyes. Ugh, this place is relentless. Ermid who came with them was practically spotless. They don't know how, but even without the mage day. She could use a diamond-shaped magic circle that boosts her magic and her wounds were practically non-existent after using it. Though her armor took a beating. Lars then gave them another set of armor to get rid of their ruined ones. Ermid who was of course, a masochist now. Fighting monsters alone in the lower floors. 
she used her magic on them to top them all off. Phew, good as new. Lars smiled and Ermid sighed at him. I didn't know that you can make things more intense. What's next? You take off our limbs and reattach it later with mermaid's blood. Ermid snorted. Hey. That's a pretty good idea. Lars rubbed his chin and the trio paled. Please don't. They immediately prostrated and he laughed. Just kidding, I won't do that to you beautiful, budding ladies. He smiled at them. Or would I? He suddenly turned serious and they thought that they were done for. Seriously though, why would I take off your limbs or something? Just incapacitate it with cuffs or ball weights, that will do fine. Lars shrugged. He then thought about it and when they reached the second line. The water city. He'll shackle their legs with adamantite weights and make them swim. The three girls in his team shuddered as they saw his twisted grin. But that's a story for another time. I told you, Ermit here is my lucky star. Lars put an arm on her shoulder and she huffed at him. Your training booster, you mean? Ermit rolled her eyes. Well, we didn't believe you at first. After all, who would? You said that with Ermit around, we'll be able to dive for days on end. Tioni explained. Yeah, we're just a small group. We don't even have a supporter. Tiona added. Praise me then. Guhahaha. Lars took out some burgers and the twins drooled. Yeah, yeah, you're the ultimate supporter. Ermit snorted. She tried to take a plate of food, but he was offended. You don't appreciate me, Ermit. Tell everyone I'm the greatest supporter ever first. He huffed at her. Can I have seconds? Oh almighty Lars Sama, the best supporter ever. Tiona begged. Guhahaha. Very well, mongrel. He gave her another burger and fries set. Okay, Lars Sama. Please forgive this lowly one. Ermit frowned. He had their supply of food and drinks. Why would she bring any if he was there? She could also purify any poison. Anything in the dungeon could be eaten safely by her. Good, here you go. They messed around and were having a great time in the dungeon. Something that is practically suicide for other adventurers. Not to mention, they were still young. With Ermit being the eldest among them. Hey boss, did you just see what I saw? Someone asked a cat-eared man. Yeah, Ermit Tzainare can use wide-range healing magic. And it's so strong that she could practically ignore moderate wounds. The cat man grinned. And the Rudra Familia can use someone like that really well. That accursed Astria Familia. He gritted his teeth. Jurasama, with that girl on our side. We'll be able to destroy the Astria Familia. His lackey was sure about it. The Amazons and that kid are level 2 as well. A perfect group indeed, thank you very much for the offering. Jura thought they were easy pickings. Kill the others with fire stones. They're not necessary for us. The cat man ordered and they started setting up a trap. And the merry party of four didn't know that they were about to step into a field of landmines. Chapter 25, Evil Us Lars and the gang continued on their slaughter. Beating the ever-living hell of any monster they went against. Why aren't we using our weapons, ha? Huh? Tioni slugged a charging boar. It's so we can gain more Exilia. Tiona boxed against a troll and a small girl beating the shit out of a 3M tall monster was ridiculous. He adjusts the difficulty depending on the situation. Ermid was calm and cool, refreshing her magic when it expired. And Lars continued to micromanage the monsters trickling in. He was luring them in with pheromones and taking them on for himself. Shitty monsters. Come get some. Lars absolutely used Ermid's magic to the limit. He was receiving blows from monsters at all sides to raise his VIT. The stat that he thought was the hardest to increase. Because if you get injured, you were practically dead in the dungeon. My dex will also increase nicely. Lars used Alfia's teachings well. And due to the amount of monsters. His usage of martial arts to deal with them is necessary. In his opinion, it was the second most hardest stat to raise. Thankfully, he had Alfia so there would be no problems on both accounts anyways. The twins also now understood why Ermid could level up so fast. This is crazy, I feel like I could fight forever with Ermid here. Tiona's fatigue and wounds disappeared. Tioni looked at her limbs and was gobsmacked towards what was happening. After exhausting themselves in fighting monsters non-stop, they would rest for 30 minutes. Ermit will heal them and she'll top up her mind with potions. Rinse and repeat. 
The cycle continued on and on and the twins felt that Lars Axelia farming strat was insane. Hmm? Are you amazed by my leveling strat? He smiled at them and they shuddered. Amazed? More like terrified. We Amazons like fighting, but even we think it's too much. Tiona commented. Lars laughed at that. Then it's perfect, because people won't be able to copy us then. I doubt anybody would want to. Tioni chimed in. Even I was forced into this, not that I mind now. Ermit shrugged and he pouted at her. Look at you now though. The fastest level up, aren't I amazing? Lars puffed his chest in pride. They then continued their dungeon dive. Hmm? It's quiet. Tiona squinted her eyes. Yes, it's too quiet. Tioni looked at the ground and she saw some traces of ash. Isn't that because there was a battle here earlier? Ermit also saw the ash. A typical phenomena when monsters die and disappear. Well, if this is recent. Then we should have heard their battle. Lars squinted his eyes. His pupils turned into slits and he sniffed the air. He was trying to feel for sense and how faint they are. But while he was focusing, the ground started to lit up. Run to the sides. Tiona who noticed it sooner tackled Ermid with all her might. Tiona who grabbed Ermid didn't suffer much as the firestones that were on top of Lars and Tioni were detonated specifically. Tioni. Lars. Tiona shouted out after recovering from rolling around. Ermid's ears were still ringing and she was still shell-shocked by the explosions. Get rid of the Amazon, TCH. She got too close to the target. Jura clicked his tongue. You. You're the cause of this. Tiona's vision went red with rage as she used one of her DAWs, Berserk. Come on, she's injured. Let's get this over with and extract the target. One of the mooks started to walk towards them. He was a level 3, so he arrogantly thought that they were done for. But Tiona suddenly lunged at him with her double-sided sword. And he was bisected in two. I'll kill you. Tiona ran at them and Jura walked backwards in shock. No. Get away from me. Jura looked terrified at Tiona's glare that promised death. Just kidding bang. He shouted and Tiona who was in a beeline towards him was hit by a firestone mine. Gah. She ragdolled into the air and the blast hit her right on. Ermid who sobered up after seeing Tiona fly into the air began casting her magic. But another level 3 who she still can't oppose, gagged her with a cloth and her magic died down. We can't be having you heal your friend over there. The man grinned. Well done boys, let's get this show on the road. Jura smiled and he nodded at one of his lackeys. A man raised his sword and was going to stab Tiona. But he suddenly stopped. Oi, don't go soft on me. Jura snorted. Be boss. L look. Jura took a look and his lackey had a throwing knife in his forehead, hilt deep. You've got some nerve, ambushing us. You pieces of garbage. Tioni was ready to kill them all. And her grip on her cookies were like hydraulics. Looky what we have here. Wait, why isn't she that injured? Jura raised a brow. Ugh. He suddenly felt a searing pain behind him and he looked downwards. There was an arm coming out of his midsection. And the arm slowly slid off of him with a wet squelch. So you're trying to ambush us to kidnap Ermid, hey? Too bad, I kidnapped her first. And that's not going to change soon. Lars looked at them coldly. Puh. H. How? Jura thought that it would be impossible to sneak up on him. Especially if it was a measly level 2. Lars took out something from his inventory. A long sword materialized out of thin air and he went into a stance. I've always wondered how people felt like when you cut them in half. Lars suddenly disappeared as his muscles ballooned. Jura's squad started dropping like flies and screams resounded in the area. L. Lars. Tiona who got healed by Ermid, looked at him cut them down in horror. SHHH, don't look. Ermid covered her eyes. Ermid saw her expression. She didn't expect it at all. Soon though, monsters were attracted by the prior explosions and they began hounding them. Hmm, this will be a pretty good end for you. Being monster chow sounds great, doesn't it? Lars carried Ermid and he looked at Tioni. She nodded and carried her sister as they made a run for it. Leaving the remnants to the horde of monsters. Lars. Ermid gripped on his clothes and she was shaken. It's okay, they're gone now. Lars patted her head and she nodded slowly. Lars, was it really necessary? To show that much brutality. Tiona couldn't help but ask. 
she viewed him with rose-tinted glasses ever since they started dungeon diving. And in her opinion, heroes shouldn't be like that. Well, what do you pick? Die, or live? Lars looked at her with a glare and Tiona whimpered. That's right, you choose the latter. You even split one of them in half Tiona. The world isn't that kind. You twins must know this already. Being Amazons and all, not to mention so strong at that age. Lars squinted his eyes. The twins winced and they slowly nodded. Remembering unscrupulous things. Why would you even ask me that question? Lars sighed and he decided to dig deeper. Well. I thought you were a budding hero. And heroes are supposed to be you know. Heroic. Tiona had a wry expression. Ah. Do you know the familias that cleared two of the great quests? Lars asked them and they nodded. Un, those guys were heroes for sure. Tioni replied. Then what if I told you, that they would definitely kill those guys? Lars remembered Alfia. And based on her stories, one of her only friends, Zalt. Would even eat those guys with his skill, Dias Ambrosia. That's. Ermit could definitely see it. Alfia looks and feels like a person who would kill you if you look at her wrong. How can you say that? Tiona didn't quite believe him and that made him sigh. Ha, huh, if I show you why. You won't freak out. Lars asked them and Ermid looked at him anxiously. Are you sure? Ermid mouthed out to him. I have a good feeling for them. Lars whispered to her. Well, what are you going to show us anyways? Tiona raised a brow. Ermid, can you keep them busy for a moment? Lars asked of her and she nodded. He then called for the kidnapper extraordinaire, Alfia. After a minute, Tiona and Tioni suddenly felt a breeze behind them. But before they could look back, Alfia chopped them on the neck. Really? A new pair of subordinates again. Alfia didn't understand why he would risk their cover. They hit level 3 at that age, Alfia. Without the help of the dungeon. And they could definitely hit level 4 soon. Lars calculated their stats. They most likely had level DS or Cs on physical stats. As Amazons, those are their primary stats. They weren't even teenagers yet, and they could already level up to four. That's talent that could be said to be first class. Without being an Orario. Alfia raised a brow. If they really were that strong already, then they'll definitely be first class adventurers. I see, you have found good members for our group. It would be a shame if we need to get rid of them though. Alfia looked at the twins. Ermid then gulped and she thought that what Lars said was true. Let's go. Lars urged Alfia to ferry them over to home base. Not knowing that someone from the group they thought was going to be ripped apart by monsters had an elixir in hand. Underscore underscore monstro underscore underscore. Tiona was the first one to wake up and she groaned. She was tied up to a chair. Tiona then thought she could just power through it. But when she pulled on her bindings, she couldn't use her strength at all. Her joints were locked down and she couldn't produce any torque. Heavy footsteps then resounded and what she saw made her sweat bullets. An arachne appeared. I'm wrapped in webs from an arachne. So that's why I can't move. Tiona thought they were going to be monster chow. But something was wrong. Why are we on chairs inside the dungeon? And where's Ermit and Lars? Tiona's mind was running a mile a minute. Ugh, my head hurts. Tioni groaned and she woke up as well. W what? Tiona almost rolled her eyes as Tioni screamed upon seeing the arachne. They're awake. Ronyi spoke and that made the twins bug out. A. A monster just talked. It just talked, Tioni. Tiona was shocked to the core. Am I hallucinating? Tioni blinked dumbly and Ronyi rolled her eyes. She's not a normal monster by the way, thanks Ronyi. Lars appeared and she nodded at him. I don't want to talk to adventurers. Lars. They're all yours. Ronyi walked out and the twins focused on him. If stairs could bore holes, he would definitely have holes on him. What are you looking at me like that for? He chuckled and they glared at him. Are you? Perhaps an ally of the dungeon. Tiona accused him. Ha, well what if we are? Lars smirked at them and two more people arrived. Are you in on this too? Ermid. Tioni glared at her not having it in her to get furious on Lars. Well, if you're asking. I wasn't a willing participant at first. I got kidnapped here. Ermit shrugged. Anno who are you supposed to be? 
Tiona shouted at Althea and her mismatched eyes looked at her coldly. Noisy, be silent. Gospel. Althea raised her hand and she shot a block of air right beside her. Everything got destroyed at Tiona's side and she froze. This here's the almighty plane, Althea Sama. An executive of the Hera Familia. The one who killed the Leviathan and fought the one-eyed black dragon. Lars introduced her. And when they heard that, the twins were flabbergasted. Way out. Tioni and Tiona's soul almost left their bodies. She's the best fairy too, pretty efficient. Lars patted Alfia on the butt and she froze. Alfia smacked him and Ermit squinted her eyes. You deserved that. Thanks for listening. <laughs>